Kelly Clayton had everything going for her. First and foremost, she was very intelligent and bright. Since high school, she has been a role model for other students who are active in school, excel at tests, and pass exams. At the same time, she never appeared to be a girl who spent days and nights sitting over textbooks, cramming lessons and writing down something from extra reading. No, her appearance was considered model-like, and if her grades had been subpar, she could have pursued a modeling career. She could have, but she did not. After high school, she attended teacher training university to become a chemistry teacher. Her parents' insane pride lasted only for the first few years of university. It is unknown what triggered her decision, but one day Kelly took her documents from the institution and called her parents, telling them that she no longer wanted to study and that she was too young to spend the rest of her life checking notebooks and raising ungrateful children. If she wants to, she will undoubtedly return to her educational pursuits. In the meantime, she wants to travel and live her life to the fullest. Her parents were so upset that they did not communicate with their daughter for six months. But if it hadn't been for this desperate act, Kelly might never have met Tom Clayton. They met at a party for mutual friends and the young man adored the girl. First, he began courting Kelly and showing signs of interest within minutes of meeting her. Second, Tom had a stunning appearance and athletic build, thanks to his status as a hockey star. He played for the semi-professional team Jackals for four seasons in a row and he was regarded as a strong man, a player capable of breaking the opponent's ribs only if he did not approach the gate, but only a sports career, particularly one built on strength and aggression, will eventually fail, and Tom was forced to put the stick in the far corner and enjoy hockey only from the stands or the couch. Watching his favorite team on television, the couple had to move on with their lives, first returning to New York to marry, then to North Carolina, and finally to the tiny town of Cato, which has a population of only a few thousand people. Tom franchised a company that rebuilt houses after fires or disasters, while also working in a related field for a friend's company. Kelly, after dropping out of university, worked as a waitress, only changing jobs, and now has two children. However, Tom was earning enough money, and Kelly could leave her job at any time to care for her lovely daughters but she was still convinced that extra money would never be unnecessary. Furthermore, she could use it to buy toys for her children and spoil them in every way. On September 28, 2015, Tom went to play poker with his friends the Millers, as he always did. He never accompanied his wife to such events. Playing for money required specific skills and experience in the game. Furthermore, someone had to stay at home with the children, and a family trip would have turned such gatherings into raucous buffoonery removing any enjoyment from gambling that evening. Tom was unlucky in the game, but he did not get up from the table, instead attempting to win back and offering anyone who wanted to stay to play until morning, but no one supported him, so he went home. At home, however, a dreadful picture appeared before him. His beloved wife was lying in her own pool of blood, badly beaten, and appeared to be dead. Tom panicked and ran through the rooms looking for his children, who were thankfully unharmed but very scared. He grabbed his daughters and went to his neighbor Derek's house, trying not to let them see their mother's mutilated body, and he dialed the police number right away. The officer who arrived on the scene discovered Tom sitting on his knees in front of his wife's body, attempting to give her artificial respiration. Only the MPs were able to extract the man, who revealed the terrible and unpleasant information. Kelly had been dead for some time, and neither they nor he could do anything to help her. All two floors of the house were soaked in blood. There was a huge mess in the bedroom. Despite the fact that there were children in the house at the time, Kelly and the perpetrator who committed the atrocity appeared to have fought. Kelly was pushed down the stairs, as evidenced by the knockdown banister, and then beaten on the head with a blunt object until she was dead. There was no evidence of knife or gunshot wounds. The police officer who filmed the crime scene noted that Tom appeared stunned and disoriented. He walked from one corner of the room to another, entered for a split second, and immediately exited, and he was unable to direct the police officer to the children's room or the emergency exit from the house. When asked where Tom was at the time of the murder, he calmly replied that he had spent the evening at a friend's house playing poker. The policeman then went to the neighbors to ask the children some questions, as he had not received any clear information from Tom. Tom's eldest daughter, Charlie, 
described the perpetrator as a robber. According to the eldest daughter, she and her sister were almost asleep when they heard their mother screaming loudly from the next room. Charlie, run. Run away from here. And then the entire place shook like an earthquake. After listening to their mother, the girls cautiously exited their room, only to see the criminal leaning over their mother and beating her with what appeared to be a hammer. The girls dashed back into the nursery, closing the door with a small nightstand and hiding beneath the bed. It was a good thing the criminal wasn't looking for them because, as the police officer pointed out, that nightstand was so small that it couldn't have caught a burglar. So what did this burglar look like? He was a huge one, like a bear. That's big. Wow. What did he wear? Blue denim and a black shirt. He was also wearing a mask, similar to the one daddy wears when he hunts ducks with Mr. Bourne. So your father wears a mask like that too. Will you show me? I'd have to ask him where it is. I'm not sure. What else did you notice when you spotted the robber? He had eyes like my father's, and I can't remember anything else. I saw him briefly. We got scared and ran back inside. Police officers who investigated the house were unable to confirm the girl's claim that the perpetrator was a burglar. There were no signs of forced entry at either the front or back doors, but the garage gate was open, allowing the perpetrator to enter the house through it. Another thing the police discovered was that nothing was stolen from the house. Jewelry was left untouched in a jewelry box, and Tom's safe, which held the cash, was not even opened. All of the cabinet doors in the house were closed. Usually burglars check every cabinet and shelf. But here, the entire mess was the result of a fight. Experienced officers, it appears, understood everything at once. Tom pretends to be a heartbroken husband, and he murdered his beloved wife and the mother of his children in order to continue receiving insurance payments. If Kelly's life was insured, and husband's murderers always make sure their wives' lives are protected, he could receive up to $1 million in the event she died. All that is required is to gather evidence, and the case will be resolved. Especially since her own daughter said the robber's mask and eyes resembled her father's. However, when the police discovered Tom's whereabouts that night, they did not find the hunting mask in the house. The police questioned the other poker players. Is Tom the murderer? Do you truly suspect him? One of his friends inquired. That poor man had his wife murdered for crying out loud. And instead of looking for the bastard, you want to blame everything on him? How could you have thought of something like that? No, Tom could not have done it. Another less emotional friend responded. I've known him a long time. He worked two jobs around the clock because he adored Kelly and his children. That simply cannot happen. Plus, he stayed with us all night. We played poker, and even when everyone was exhausted, he insisted on continuing to play. During a game break, Tom's friend Laura mentioned that he was very suspicious that evening. He led me into the next room and asked me to give him my phone so he could call his wife. He claimed he forgot his phone in the car and did not want to go get it. I was surprised to find the car 10 meters from the house. Go get the phone but still give him a call. He took a step back and made the call from outside. I didn't hear who or what he was talking to, but when I checked the outgoing calls, there were no numbers in the call history, implying he simply deleted the call. Would you agree? That is odd. I told my husband about it, and he was just as surprised as I was. My husband was sitting at the table next to Tom when he noticed that Tom was not paying attention to the process of dealing cards or the people around him, which is critical in poker, but was sitting with his head bowed over the surface of the table where the cards were hiding the screen of his phone. He was carrying his phone. Why did he trick me? So where was he calling? Who couldn't he call with his phone? Who couldn't he call with his phone? Following Laura's testimony, the police questioned Charlie, Tom's daughter, and she repeated what she had previously told the officer. The robber resembled her father. The murder victim's niece provided the next testimony. Already after Tom was imprisoned, I did not tell Aunt Kelly. I didn't want to upset her. She was very fond of Tom. She genuinely loved him. Besides, she has two children with him. They're my sisters. Who needs my truth? Tom was not who he appeared to be at first glance. Yes, he occasionally showered my aunt with attention and flowers. He could easily babysit, something other fathers rarely do, but that was only at home and work. He was an entirely different person. Aunt Kelly decided to help me one day by arranging for Tom to drive me to work for him. She was too young to be on her own, so she knew me better than anyone and wanted the best for me. Last summer, I worked for Tom on correspondence, registration, and document management. I didn't know him very well prior to that, 
so our relationship was strictly professional at first. Then he got drunk somewhere and came to the office in that state. There was only me and him, and for some reason, he began telling me that his family was fictitious. He adores his daughters, but he doesn't care about his wife, and he hasn't had feelings for her in a long time. Throughout their marriage, he has had a few extramarital affairs and has considered leaving Aunt Kelly. But he didn't, because he was afraid of losing his home and money as a result of the divorce. Looking ahead, it is important to note that some of the interviewed female poker players confirmed Kelly's niece's claim that Tom was not a faithful husband and had a sexual relationship with two other women who were playing poker that night. In addition to information about Tom's promiscuous life, Kelly's 16-year-old niece mentioned another employee of Tom's firm, Michael Beard. Michael was doing a good job repairing houses after the fires. But there was one time when Bird worked in those houses and kept missing things, and Tom didn't believe his customers the first few times, referring to the possibility that the owners would lose something during the fire. Then, when the theft accusations were repeated for the third and fourth time, it was clear that Michael Bird not only restores the floor and walls, but also steals. In addition to stealing, there were complaints that Michael allowed himself to arrive at work drunk. I was in the office when Michael's theft was discovered. Tom could yell at his employee and kick him out onto the street. He was upset by his subordinate's behavior. He kept asking him, how could you or haven't you considered your family? Where are you planning to work now? Following the incident, Tom fired Bird but continued to call companies he knew and offered to hire his former employee. Tom recommended Michael, and when all other options were exhausted, Tom hired Bird to help with the household chores, such as cutting the grass, watering the plants, and performing minor repairs around the house. The detective then summoned Michael Beard for questioning. He claimed he only stole because he and his family needed money. Tom was very nice to me and defended me until the end, but I knew it was my fault. He has an excellent wife. She fed me while I worked for them, even though she shouldn't have. She also gave my children clothes her daughters had outgrown. I am extremely grateful for everything they have done for me. I feel so sorry for Kelly. When I found out about her death, I couldn't believe my ears. I really felt bad. I even went to church and prayed that she would go to the best of all worlds. The police did not find anything unusual in Michael's story and released him, but the interrogation of his wife, Mrs. Bird, made them doubt his words. According to his wife, Holly, Tom promised Michael $10,000 for unspecified work. That was interesting. Michael was summoned back to the station and had a lie detector attached to him. All of the questions failed. Bird lied and thus failed the test. Realizing he couldn't get away with it, he started testifying. Indeed, Tom promised Bird $10,000 if Michael sneaked into his house on the day Tom was supposed to play poker, killed his wife, and set fire to it. The plan was to strangle Kelly before making it appear that she died in an accidental fire. Furthermore, the family home was insured for a significant sum of money. The police confirmed that it was true. Kelly's home and life were insured at the highest level. Two cans of gasoline awaited Michael in the garage, through which he would enter the house. Everything was fine here. Bird entered the house while everyone was already asleep. He began quietly climbing the stairs to the bedroom where Kelly was supposed to be sleeping, but the young woman was either awake or awakened by the sound of the open door, and when she saw a strange man in the doorway, she screamed in terror. Michael was just as terrified and pounced on Kelly, attempting to wrap his massive hands around her neck. But it wasn't so simple. Kelly started to fight back. Michael is surprised that Kelly, who appears to be fragile, has such strength. A fierce fight broke out spilling over from the second floor bedroom to the first floor kitchen. Michael, in shock and panic, was unable to concentrate on the fight and instead waved his arms in all directions or grabbed Kelly's clothes while Kelly, defending her life, aimed very accurately at Michael's face. And if the cops had arrived earlier, they would have noticed the bruises from the beatings on Bird. But everything ended up as it did. After a long struggle, Michael smashed Kelly's head into the wall with all his might. She fell and struggled to get back up for a while. Michael took out a hammer and started hitting the young woman's head with it until she stopped moving. Michael, enraged by what had happened, simply ran out of the house, forgetting that Tom had asked him not only to kill Kelly, but also to set the house on fire to conceal the crime. Michael had an accomplice, Mark Blanford, who served only as a driver the day before the incident. Michael called me. 
I had worked with him on a construction site for a long time and spent a few weeks with him last year, so I was familiar with him. I knew Michael was into petty theft, so I wasn't surprised when he called and asked me to drive while he broke into someone's home. I wanted to decline, but he offered me $500. At first I hesitated, but he persuaded me to go ahead. He said he just wanted to rob a businessman and needed assistance getting out of there before the cops arrived. He offered to help with the car. I gave in to his requests, but only on the condition that I park far away from the house. He agreed. That evening, I waited for him in that car in a dark alley, and he returned quickly enough, breathing heavily and instructing me to move as quickly as possible. He wasn't carrying a bag or sack, so it didn't look like a robbery. I didn't ask him any questions along the way because I didn't want to learn anything. I just wanted my $500, which I didn't receive. On my way out, he asked me to stop at a bridge over a creek a few blocks south of here. I paused there, and he quickly stripped off his outer garments and threw them off the bridge. If you need to see the place, I'll show you. Police officers who arrived on the scene at Mark's request discovered pieces of Michael's outer clothing near the creek, as well as the hammer used to kill Kelly. Michael, who was already in custody on suspicion of first-degree murder, began to change his testimony. According to him, he was hired by Tom for $10,000 to commit arson at the house and nothing else. There was no question of murder when he entered the house, but Kelly had already died. And who killed her? The detective inquired. I believe it was Tom. He initially offered me money for murder and arson, but I declined. I am not willing to kill a man for money, he stated. I had nothing to fear, but he could never persuade me. You may not believe me, but I nearly passed out when I saw Kelly's body. I knew right away that he was setting me up, so I ran out of the house. Michael insisted, he's the killer. Michael spent a long time assuring the police of his innocence, all because he was unaware that Mark had shown the location where Beard had thrown out his belongings and that his clothes, as well as the murder weapon, had already been examined by experts who discovered Kelly Clayton's blood on both his clothes and the hammer, and that was the most direct proof that he, not someone else, had killed Kelly. In turn, Tom refused to admit that he ordered the murder of his wife from a former problem employee at his company. According to him, Michael knew he had money. He knew he wasn't poor, and he decided to rob Beard's house because he had lost his job and was resentful of the dismissal. But Kelly was at home that night, and he paid with his life. It would have been more difficult to prove Tom's guilt in conspiracy with Michael if Laura, the woman who had been playing poker that night, had not told the cops that Tom had called from her cell phone. The detective requested a transcript of her calls, and her expectations were met. Then, on the night of September 28, Tom Clayton called Michael Beard. Michael was the first to go on trial. He continued to claim that he had been hired to set fire to the house in order to collect the insurance money. He did not kill Kelly, and the blood on his clothes was simply from touching a dead and mutilated body. That is why he became dirty. He had thrown away his belongings so that no one would suspect he had been at Clayton's house that night. His speech seemed convincing. The jury had deliberated for seven hours. In the end, they concluded that Michael Beard was guilty of all charges. He faced life in prison. Tom's lawyers were able to obtain records of conversations and correspondence between him and Michael, and none of them specifically discussed their devious plan. The prosecutor, questions, Requests for billing transcripts of his movements produced no concrete results either. All evidence was circumstantial. If it weren't for one detail, the car in which Mark had given Michael a ride was registered to Tom's company and Tom, arriving at the office in his personal Toyota, left it in the parking lot where it was moved to the company pickup truck, which later drove to Michael's house and left there before being taken back the day after the tragedy. In fact, he gave Michael the car in which he and Mark drove to the crime. The jury testified to this fact during the trial. The trial lasted six days, and the jury ultimately determined that Tom had hired Michael to commit this heinous crime. Michael, in turn, made an appeal. In his defense, he quoted Little Charlie, who stated that the eyes and slit of the mask belonged to her father. However, the court denied the appeal because the description of the clothes matched the one discovered beneath the bridge. As a result, Tom Clayton and Michael Beard were given life sentences. Mark was charged with manslaughter and received four years in prison. Kim, Kelly's sister, received custody of Tom and Kelly's children. Charlie has finally moved on from the tragedy. She occasionally remembers her mother, but she refuses to talk about her father, whom she will never see again.
Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Donna Ellen Brown was born November 10, 1963, in Florida. Donna was the eldest of three girls. She was attractive, intelligent, and successful in her job as an operating room technician. She met nuclear engineer Mark Winger, and the two married in a traditional Jewish ceremony in 1989. Donna and Mark appear to be the picture, perfect couple. They were successful and had a nice house in a nice neighborhood. However, not every story ends perfectly from the start. On Tuesday, August 29, 1995, at 4.27 p.m., Mark Winger called 911 to report that a man was harming his wife, Mark, who lived in Springfield, Illinois. His 31-year-old wife, Donna Winger, called the dispatcher to report that he had shot the man. When the cops arrived, Donna was in critical condition after being hit in the head with a hammer seven times. A 27-year-old man named Roger Harrington was found beside Donna in critical condition, having sustained two gunshot wounds to the head. Both victims were immediately transported to the hospital, where Roger died shortly after arrival and Darla died a few minutes later without regaining consciousness. The police secured the residence and discovered no evidence of forced entry. Mark, visibly distressed, told the police that he shot the man after witnessing the attack on his wife. Mark described how he was in the basement on the treadmill when he heard noises upstairs, prompting him to investigate. He found their adopted baby Bailey on the bed in the master bedroom, but no sign of Donna. When Mark heard more noises downstairs, he grabbed his handgun from the bedroom nightstand and headed for the dining room. Mark saw a man in the hallway wielding a hammer and assaulting Donna. Mark shot the man, and as he attempted to rise, he fired a second shot. The police discovered the bloodied hammer used in the assault which belonged to both Donna and Mark. The house also contained a .45 caliber semi-automatic handgun, which Mark confirmed was the weapon used. When Mark asked about the identity of the man who had attacked his wife, the police confirmed that it was Roger. Mark then said, that's the man who has been harassing my wife this week. According to Mark, Donna had traveled to Florida to visit her parents six days before. Her mother dropped her off at the airport and a driver named Roger hired through a limousine company in St. Louis, Missouri, drove her back to Springfield. According to Mark Donna, Roger was excessively talking and flirtatious during the two-hour drive, expressing a preference for older women and inviting them to intimate parties. The conversation took a dark turn when he revealed hearing a disturbing voice named Dom instructing him to harm others. Mark called the cops, saying the guy scared her. She stated that he was extremely frightening he threatened to kill people, set car bombs, and mutilate them. Dawn has returned to Springfield. She informed her family about the unsettling encounter, expressing fear and discomfort as a result of the disturbing conversation and erratic driving. Mark told the police that, despite safely returning home, the situation persisted. Donna received several strange phone calls, and based on the timing, she suspected Roger was the caller. The police found a note in the house that described Donna's unsettling car ride. Mark also told the police that he reported the incident to Roger's employer, which resulted in Roger's suspension, which Mark believed could have exacerbated the situation. The police discovered Roger's car parked outside the Winger house, facing the wrong direction. They discovered various weapons inside, including a knife and a tire iron. Authorities concluded that Mark acted in self-defense and they chose not to press charges due to the traumatic circumstances. The case was closed with an acknowledgement that Mark had already experienced significant distress. Mark appeared deeply affected by the events. Mark and Donna had moved to Springfield shortly after their wedding, where they discovered happiness. Donna worked as an operating room technician at Memorial Medical Center, and Mark was an engineer with the Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety. Despite facing challenges, such as Donna's initial distress at learning she couldn't conceive, their lives took a positive turn when a doctor informed them of a teenager willing to place her baby for adoption. On June 1, 1995, Donna and Mark happily welcomed Bailey, their adopted daughter. Following Donna's tragic death, Bailey, now responsible for the infant, chose to remain in the same house to help with childcare. 
he hired a nanny, Rebecca Simic. Rebecca unexpectedly became pregnant a few months into her job and gave birth to a daughter named Anna. Mark and Rebecca married just over a year after Donna died. Mark decided to sell the house and sever ties with Donna's family. The new family, Mark, Rebecca Bailey, and Anna, relocated to a different town. They gradually expanded their family by adding two more children, Maggie and Ben. Donna's close friend Donna Schultz told the police in 1999 that she had an affair with Mark while Donna was still alive, and that Mark made troubling statements that she remembered. Donna Mark believes it would be easier for us to be together if Don had just died. All you'd have to do is enter and find the body. Donna also provided disturbing information that raised concerns with the authorities. When Mark learned about Donna's unsettling experience during the car ride back to Springfield, he allegedly told her that he needed the driver in his home. This revelation prompted the police to reopen Donna's case. However, they were disappointed to find that some evidence had gone missing. Mark filed a civil lawsuit against BART Transportation, seeking accountability for Diana's death as a result of Roger's actions. Roger's attorney requested access to the civil suit's evidence and files because he worked for BART Transportation at the time Diana died. Despite this, the police were able to save some files and access photos taken on the day of the incident. Donna and Roger are shown on the ground before being transported to the hospital. However, the positions of the bodies appeared to contradict Mark's earlier account, given to the police years ago. Mark told the police that he saw Roger kneeling beside Donna's head, assaulting her with a hammer, which prompted him to open fire. Mark claimed Roger fell backward, and in an attempt to get up, Mark shot him again. According to Mark's description, Roger's feet should have been near Donna's head facing the opposite direction. However, after reviewing the photos taken by the police upon their arrival, it appeared that Roger and Donna were both on the ground facing the same direction. This inconsistency prompted the police, for the first time, to suspect Mark of being involved in his wife's murder. The question of why Roger was at their house that day remained unanswered. Simultaneously, during the civil suit involving Mark, a possible explanation emerged. Bar Transportation hired a blood spatter expert who concluded that the blood spatter expert who concluded that the blood spatter patterns indicated Marx's involvement in the deaths of Donna and Roger. As the police dug deeper into the case, they discovered more incriminating evidence. Susan Collins, Roger's roommate, informed law enforcement that she overheard Roger arranging a meeting with someone on the day he was killed. Furthermore, a note written on a bank deposit slip inside Roger's car was discarded, which contained Marx's name, address, and a time. Susan informed the police that Roger had mentioned agreeing to meet with Mark to resolve issues raised by Marx's complaints about Roger's driving and the concerning conversation he had with Donna. Roger left the house around 3.30 p.m. And the note indicated a meeting time of 4.30 p.m., which corresponded to the prosecution's belief that Mark had asked him to come to the house at that time. On August 23, 2001, Mark was arrested and charged with two counts of murder. The prosecution claimed that Mark was responsible for Donna and Roger's deaths. They claimed that Mark wanted to remove Donna from his life, but did not want to risk losing custody of their adopted daughter Bailey, so he avoided divorce. Mark allegedly saw an opportunity when he learned about Donna's problems with Roger, seeing it as an ideal opportunity to eliminate Donna and frame an innocent man. The prosecution proposed that Mark contact Roger, whom he had never met before that day, and invite him to the house. When Roger arrived, Mark allegedly led him inside and fatally shot him. This narrative was supported by the fact that there was no forced entry at the residence. The prosecution also claimed that Donna, who was in the master bedroom with Bailey when she heard the gunshot, went downstairs and was beaten to death with a hammer by Mark before dialing 911. The prosecution used a note found in Roger's car, which contained Mark's name and address, to prove that Mark had lured Roger to the house. The jury discovered that despite having weapons in his car, Roger did not bring them into the house and instead used Donna's hammer to attack. This raised questions about Roger's intentions, assuming he had gone there with the intent of assaulting Donna. The court was also made aware of inconsistencies between the location Mark claimed Roger was in when he shot him and photos taken on the same day, which contradicted Mark's account. Dean's testimony was crucial in shedding light on Mark's alleged statements, expressing a desire for Donna's death. The court learned that on August 25, 1995, four days before the murders, 
Mark inquired with his co-worker Candace Bolden about the fate of his adopted daughter if Donna died. Later that day, Mark complained to Ray Duffy, the president of the transportation company where Roger worked, about Donna's ride. Mark called back a few days later, asking for the driver's full name and expressing a desire to speak with him directly about the situation. During the trial, the court was informed of Donna and Roger's severe injuries. When the cops arrived at the house, Donna was found face down on the floor with Roger on his back. Donna died from brain trauma caused by multiple blunt force injuries to the head, consistent with hammer strikes. Roger died from brain trauma caused by gunshot wounds to the top left side of his head and above his left eyebrow, as well as contusions on his chest from hammer strikes. The defense argued that Roger's erratic decisions that day, such as his weapon choice and unusual parking, demonstrated mental instability. His behavior during the car ride with Donna supported the claim they made. Concerning the position of the bodies in the photos, the defense argued that while Donna and Roger were critical when paramedics arrived, they were not dead and they may have moved in an attempt to save their lives. However, the paramedics denied moving them before the photographs were taken and Mark did not testify at the trial. Regarding Deanne's testimony, the defense claimed she was motivated by personal feelings of rejection. While Mark admitted to having an affair with Donna, he married the nanny he hired shortly after Donna died. The defense claimed Donna harbored resentment for not being chosen by Mark to marry. Despite the defense's arguments, the jury convicted Mark of two counts of first-degree murder and sentenced him to life without the possibility of parole. While still serving time for his first-degree murder convictions, Mark became involved in a failed murder for hire plot in 2005. He allegedly attempted to orchestrate attacks on Deanne for testifying against him, as well as on Jeffrey Gilman, a childhood friend for failing to post his $1 million bail. Investigators discovered 19 handwritten pages that detailed Mark's desires for Donna. He allegedly wanted her kidnapped and forced to write a statement recounting her testimony, claiming Mark's innocence before plotting her death. Mark claimed in court that these notes were simply a fantasy he never intended to carry out. Despite Marx's assertion, he was found guilty of soliciting murder and sentenced to an additional 35 years in prison. Donna's mother, Sarah Jane, and stepfather, Ira Drescher, responded strongly to the evidence against Mark, emphasizing the brutality of Donna's murder. What makes it difficult to understand is how he murdered Donna in such a vicious and violent manner. Throughout the legal proceedings, Mark has maintained his innocence. Donna, who testified against him, was granted immunity and received no charges as a result. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On the evening of August 29, 2014, a Friday, Christina Morris, a 23-year-old, planned to spend the night in Plano, Texas, USA, despite growing up in Plano and maintaining friendships there. Despite growing up in Plano and maintaining friendships there, she had moved to Fort Worth, Texas, with her boyfriend, Hunter Foster. Following up on his job opportunity, Christina had settled into her new life in Fort Worth and was working at a dating service over Labor Day weekend. On Friday night, Christina Morris returned to Plano to reunite with her high school friend, Paulina Petrosky. The two had met at Allen High School. Paulina lived in the shops at Legacy, and Plano hosted Christina and a few Allen High School friends at her apartment. The group, mostly Allen High School acquaintances, gathered at Paulina's apartment at 9 p.m. After some drinks, around 11 p.m., a portion of the group went to Harry's Tavern for 30 minutes before reconvening at Scruffy Duffy's. As the night progressed, the bar closed at 2 a.m., causing some of the group to leave. However, Christina Sabrina, Enrique, and Steven decided to return to Paulina's apartment. On their way back, Sabrina, Enrique, and Paulina, Enrique, and Paulina stopped at Whataburger to eat through the drive, through. Back in Pauline's apartment, the group enjoyed the food from the drive, through. However, Paulina and Steven noticed that Christina appeared distressed. She revealed that she had been texting her boyfriend Hunter all night, hoping he would join the party, but then discovering he had gone out with friends. Despite her request that he pick her up, Hunter stopped responding to her text messages. It was now 12 a.m., and Christina sent Hunter numerous messages for the next 90 minutes without receiving a single response. Christina's texts began by asking the Hunter to come get her, 
followed by questions about what was going on. She pleaded with him via multiple messages, informing him of her work obligations the following day and even informing him that she had misplaced her car keys. By 3, 1 am, frustration set in as Hunter remained unresponsive. Christina texted him, expressing her disappointment, wishing him good night, and conveying the sentiment that you had lost the best thing that could have happened to you. Christina then sent Hunter additional text messages informing him that she was taking a taxi home and saying, see you one day between 3.20 a.m. and 3.48 a.m. and 3.48 a.m. She kept sending messages, letting Hunter know she wasn't angry. Her phone had died and she had found her car keys, so she decided to drive home. Christina's final text to Hunter was sent at 3.48 a.m. Christina's emotional state worsened as she messaged Hunter, Stephen, and Paulina, who all tried to console her. Initially, he considered spending the night in Pauline's apartment. Christina eventually changed her mind and expressed a desire to return to Fort Worth. Despite Stephen's offer to drive her home the next morning, Christina insisted on going home that night. Given that she had not consumed much alcohol and had done so earlier in the evening, the others did not consider her intoxicated enough to drive. At the same time, Christina decided to leave. Enrique also decided to go home, expressing his intention to walk Christina to her car while en route to see his girlfriend. As they left Pauline's apartment, Stephen called Christina to see how she was doing, as she had been crying just before leaving. She assured him she was fine and was almost to her car. However, when the 30th of August arrived, Christina did not show up for work, causing concern among her colleagues. Despite multiple attempts to contact her via text messages, phone calls, and social media, Christina remained unresponsive. This behavior was unusual for her, given her responsible work ethic. Her colleagues saw a Facebook post from a friend urging Christina to call them, expressing deep concern. Fearing that something may be wrong, Christina's colleagues contacted her friend, who then contacted Christina's family, only to find out that they had no idea where she was. Christina's parents and stepmother contacted her friends to find out where she was, and they discovered that the last known location was when Pauline was in his apartment. When they contacted Enrique, he informed them that he had left with Christina, but they went their separate ways down the sidewalk. Enrique mentioned that Christina was on the phone when he parted ways with her, but he had no idea who she was talking to. Christina's parents reported her missing due to concerns for her well-being. During the investigation, the police interviewed Hunter. Hunter was initially uncooperative with the police, but eventually agreed to hand over his cell phone. He did so reluctantly. After deleting several text messages, Hunter informed the police that he was not home on the specified Friday night. Instead, he claimed to have been at Concrete Cowboy in Dallas, admitting that he had received multiple text messages from Christina that evening. He claimed that he hadn't read them and wasn't actively checking his phone. Hunter stated that he only returned home on Saturday morning around 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. or 11 a.m. to discover Christina absent, assuming she was upset and staying with friends. He did not express any concern. On Saturday night, still without hearing from Christina, he went out with friends again. Hunter stated that he only became concerned when Christina's father contacted him on Sunday to inquire about her whereabout. Despite Hunter's claims, some of Christina's friends and her father suggested to the police that Hunter was involved in illegal substance use or distribution. Hunter admitted to the police that on the night of August 29, he was selling and using prohibited substances as well as drinking alcohol. When the bar closed at 2 a.m., Hunter explained that he had gone to the W Hotel with friends. When asked if he followed the plan that night, Hunter denied it but admitted that the events were somewhat hazy. Despite the suspicions surrounding the hunter's account of the Friday night, the police had to carefully verify and corroborate the information provided. Despite suspicions about the hunter and a possible connection to Christina's disappearance, there was no concrete evidence that he had harmed her or was involved as part of the investigation. The police went to the parking garage where Christina had left her car on that Friday night. Christina and the group from Pauline's apartment had all parked in the Harry's Tavern parking garage. There, they discovered Christina's Toyota Celica was still securely locked. There were no signs of a struggle or evidence of foul play discovered in the parking garage. In order to piece together the events, police obtained surveillance footage from the area. Christina and Enrique entered the parking garage together at 3.55 a.m. 
according to security camera footage, on August 30. However, only two minutes later, Enrique's car was seen bapping out of its parking space, leaving the garage at 3.58 a. Unfortunately, the footage did not show Christina or her car leaving the parking garage. During their conversation with Enrique, he told the police that he left Pauline's apartment with Christina and that they parted ways at the end of the apartment complex because their cars were parked in different parking garages. Rene told the cops that the last time he saw Christina, she was on the phone with someone. However, Enrique Clay claimed that he had no further information because he had called his girlfriend at the time. When the police asked to see his phone log to confirm the timeline, Enrique stated that he was texting his girlfriend rather than speaking to her on the phone. When the police asked to review these text messages, Enrique explained that it was not possible because his phone was set to automatically delete older messages. The police discovered that Enrique sent a text message to his girlfriend on the night of August 29 at 8.2 p.m., followed by a brief exchange at 10.38 p.m., followed by a brief exchange at 10.38 p.m. When his girlfriend requested a call, Enrique responded at 10.41 p.m., stating that he was sleepy. Despite his girlfriend's belief that he was at home in bed, Enrique was actually at Pauline's apartment at the time. Enrique's next text to his girlfriend came the next morning at 10. 52 a.m. During further questioning, he claimed he didn't know where Christina had parked her car. However, surveillance footage contradicted his statement, revealing that he entered the parking garage at the start of the night, with his car one space across and one space over Christina's. When asked if Christina had been in his car, Enrique claimed she had never been there. He claimed he left the shops and drove home on Highway 75 which contradicted toll road and cell phone records, indicating he took the Dallas North Tollway to Highway 120-121, passing through the Highway 120, one toll garage at 4, 8 a.m. When confronted with video footage of him entering the same parking garage as Christina, Ricky claimed his intoxication was so severe that he couldn't remember where he had parked his car that night. In the absence of information about Christina's whereabouts, the police concluded their investigation and believed they had enough evidence to charge Enrique with aggravated kidnapping. Christina remained missing throughout his arrest and trial, and Enrique pleaded not guilty. The prosecution based their case on five key elements. First, Enrique was the last person to see Christina that night. Second, Enrique's car was damaged in the front, and it had been thoroughly cleaned. Third, in any case, injuries. Fourth, Cell phone data. Their sales phones communicated with the same cell towers. Fifth, Christina's DNA was discovered on Matt in the trunk of Enrique's car. The jury was told that Enrique and Christina walked to the parking garage together after leaving Pauline's apartment around 3.55 a.m. Their cars were parked next to each other, and the prosecution speculated that the kidnapping happened inside the garage or at a later time. The prosecution suggested that Enrique may have intentionally or unintentionally injured Christina in the garage, possibly by placing her in the trunk. They suggested that Enrique drive out of the parking garage with Christina in the trunk, or that she accept a ride, but later decides against it. Later, surveillance footage from the parking garage was presented as evidence, contradicting Ricky's initial statement to the police that they had parted ways. The recorded footage showed that a single car left the parking garage a few minutes later, and no other people were seen leaving for the next 20 or 30 minutes. During the trial, it was revealed that Enrique was set to start work at 8 a.m. On that Saturday morning, however, he only arrived at 10, 51 a.m. According to a colleague, he appeared to be hungover from the night before and disheveled. The co-worker described Enrique as having bruises and scratches on his arm, as well as a noticeable limp. Furthermore, the co-worker noticed what he thought was a bite mark on the inner part of Enrique's forearm. Enrique claimed to have been involved in a fight at Legacy Shops, claiming that the person he was fighting with bit him while in a chokehold. However, Enrique later changed his story, telling his co-worker later that week that a tire rim had fallen on his hand while attempting to rotate his car's tires, resulting in the marks. Enrique's girlfriend testified, saying she saw him on Saturday evening and noticed an injury on his right hand, as well as cuts on his hand and knuckles. During the court proceedings, Sabrina Boss testified that she believed Enrique was romantically interested in her that night. He appeared upset when she chose to lie down on a bed rather than sit beside him on the couch. In response, he said, 
Fine, I'll just go home and she took his tone at that point as angry. Enrique left and as Christina was leaving, he offered to walk her to her car. Stephen Nickerson testified that he called Christina after she left the apartment. She told him she was almost to her car and sounded fine. She promised to text him once she arrived at her car, but she did not follow through. He texted her a few minutes later to see if she had made it to her car, but received no response. Despite calling her several times, all calls went to voicemail. The following day, it was called again, but went unanswered. The prosecution used security camera footage from the Kroger gas station as evidence. On September 3, the footage showed Enrique cleaning the passenger side of the car with a rag before cleaning the trunk and washing the car. Police found an odor remover bottle, a multi-purpose cleaner, an all-purpose cleaner, paper towels, and rags in his trash. The prosecution presented evidence about the cell phones, claiming that Christina's and Enrique's devices were connected to the same cell towers when Enrique left the parking garage. Christina's phone pinged off the Spring Creek Boulevard cell tower at 3.46 a.m., according to court documents. On August 30, at 3.00 a.m., Enrique's phone pinged from the same tower. Both phones also received signals from the 5,800 Granite Parkway cell tower within a few minutes of each other. Later, they pinged off a tower on East Bethany Drive near Enrique's home on Harvard Lane in Allen. Details about the Armry case car, a 2010 gray Camaro, were revealed in court. A dent was found on the front passenger side, specifically on the right front fender. When the police searched the car, they discovered that the interior, particularly the front passenger side floorboard, had recently been vacuumed and cleaned. However, what drew the most attention was the remarkably clean condition underneath the car. An accident investigator testified that the car's damage appeared to be the result of a soft impact, possibly involving the body, buttocks, and hips. Natsky provided the jury with DNA evidence, and DNA analyst Christina continued to swab areas of Enrique's car's trunk mat that reacted with blue stars until DNA profiles could be extracted. Both matching Christina's DNA profiles confirmed that the DNA discovered was more likely from a significant source, such as bodily fluid. The defense presented its case, focusing on four main arguments to counter the prosecution's perceived weakness. First, consider injuries. The defense called forensic dentist Dr. Paula to testify about the prosecution's assertion of a bite mark on Enrique's arm after Christina went missing, as well as third and fourth cell phone data. After reviewing photos of Enrique's injuries, Dr. Broom concluded that the marks and scratches did not indicate bite marks. Christy Wilson, the Plano Police Department's evidence supervisor, testified that the trunk mat was removed from Enrique's car and placed in a box. However, the box was too large for the evidence locker, so it was closed as best as possible, but left unsealed for three days, which was recognized as a violation of protocol. The defense attempted to cast doubt on the DNA evidence's reliability, claiming that the trunk mat's unsealed condition compromised its integrity. They also suggested that the person who examined Christina's car prior to the Marie may have transferred DNA. To back up their claim that there were alternative lines of inquiry, the defense called lateral Rince Dunbar to testify. He was a private security contractor who claimed to have met Christina at a nightclub in Uptown on August 22, or 23rd, when she became quiet in front of Hunter Foster. Hunter Foster, who was serving a 33-month sentence for conspiring to distribute Mia, testified during the trial. It was discovered that he sold prohibited substances to an undercover federal officer on the night of August 29, 2014. His cell phone records showed a call from Enrique at 3.50 a.m. on August 30, with a message requesting an ounce of a substance known as that good rock. Detective Robin Busby suspected that the conversation was about illegal substances. However, it is unclear whether Enrique or Christina were using the phone at the time. Witnesses at Pauline's apartment confirmed that Christina's phone had a low battery when she left that night. The defense argued to the jury that, despite the lack of surveillance footage showing Christina leaving the parking garage, it was possible that she left by another means. The police acknowledged that someone could leave on foot without being recorded, Regarding cell phone data, the defense presented a cell phone forensics and cell tower data analyst. He testified that records from both Regays and Christina's phones showed that after 4 a.m., 
they were only making data connections to cell towers. He emphasized that data connections were the least reliable method for determining a cell phone's location and that it was impossible to predict the phone's likely location based on this data. Despite the defense's arguments, Enrique was convicted of aggravated kidnapping and sentenced to life in prison with parole eligibility in 2046. Almost two years after the Enrique case, conviction remains were discovered in a wooded area of Anna, Texas, and identified as Christina's. Excavators and construction workers working to clear the air discovered the remains. To date, no murder charges have been filed. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Blessy Goninko, a 56-year-old woman finished her work day on Saturday, May 24, 2014, and was on her way home. She lived in North Shore, Auckland, New Zealand with her husband of 30 years, Antonio Goding. Their relationship can be traced back to their childhood in Cebu City, Philippines, where they both attended the same school. They dated, married, and raised three children, B, Vincent, and John. In 2004, the family of five moved to New Zealand. Blessy grew to love Auckland because it allowed her to indulge in her favorite activities, such as exploration, walking, and discovering new places. She worked at a job she enjoyed and had formed strong bonds with local friends. The Godinko family embraced life in Auckland, as evidenced by their shared experiences and joys. Just a few days before May 20, Blessy spent her birthday with her children, having lunch at a pub in Green Hive and a family dinner at Urban Turbine in Winyard Quarter. Unfortunately, Antonio was unable to join them because he was on a work trip abroad. Returning on June 15, Blessy could not wait to see him again. They were a close-knit family who were happiest when they were together. On May 24, Blessy Godinko completed her work at Tower Insurance at 7 p.m. Despite her regular working hours until 5 p.m., she willingly took on a few extra hours of overtime without prearranged transportation because her co-worker, Bahula Shah, who usually gave her a ride, had left earlier. Blessy chose to take the Birkenhead Transport 973 bus from Lower Albert Street to Birkdale Road. The bus stop was about 700 meters from her house, and the short walk should have taken her only five minutes. However, Blessing was unable to arrive at her destination that evening. Blessy's daughter noticed her absence when she returned home from work at 3.15 a.m. The following day, Concerned B contacted her two brothers to inquire about their mother's whereabouts, but both were unaware. At 6 a.m., I used my iPhone app to find Blessy's phone on a grass verge in Salisbury Road, just 100 yards from their house. Blessy's shoes and the Tupperware container she used for her daily lunch at work were also found near the verge. When the police arrived, they initially suspected a hit and run. The scattered nature of Blessing's belongings on the verge raised the possibility that she had been struck by a vehicle and was now disoriented and lost. However, it became clear that something more sinister had occurred. A young girl living on the same street reported hearing the woman's scream at the time. Blessy alighted from the bus closest to her home. Witnesses saw a BMW overtake the bus carrying Blessy, prompting police to investigate 28-year-old Tony Douglas Robertson. When questioned, Robertson claimed ignorance of Blessy and the events surrounding her disappearance. Notably, the police were already familiar with Robertson, who had previously been convicted of sex offenses and abductions. He had been released from prison five months prior and was subject to an extended supervision order that included 24-hour GPS tracking. Robertson's movements were tracked using the ankle bracelet GPS tracking device, which revealed his presence on the street where blessings vanished around the same time. Investigations also revealed that he spent time on May 24th at Escale Cemetery before returning the next day. This prompted the police to conduct a search of the cemetery, where Blessy's body was discovered two days later with the help of a police dog. Her remains were hidden under pine scrub surrounded by foliage and debris and wrapped in a sheet. Tragically, Blessy had been raped and fatally stabbed. Following the discovery, police arrested Tony Robertson and charged him with rape and murder. Despite the evidence, he pleaded not guilty. The prosecution claimed that Tony, a stranger to Blessy, saw her walking home as he drove down Burkdale Street. According to their case, he intentionally struck her with his vehicle, causing her leg to break into pieces. 
Tony allegedly picked up Blessy, put her in the back of his car, and drove to his Burkdale apartment shortly before 8 p.m. to avoid setting off any alarms, impose a curfew. The witness testimony is intended to support this narrative. One witness stated that they saw Blessy alight from the bus at Brookdale and walk away quickly. They also saw a white sedan-like vehicle overtake the bus and speed down Sales Bar Road. The court heard from an 11-year-old girl who lived on Salisbury Road. She stated that, on the night of May 24, while cooking dumplings with her sister, she heard the sound of a car and a high-pitched scream around 7, 30 p.m. Her testimony described how she was driving up the hill from Eskdale when it came to a stop. Then I heard a high-pitched scream from a lady, followed by silence. The girl went on to say that the car then drove off towards Brookdale Road. Inside the courtroom, the prosecution claimed that when Tony returned to his apartment, he parked his car in the garage beneath it and proceeded to commit heinous acts against Blessy. According to their case, Tony raped Blessy, strangled her and brutally stabbed her in a frenzied and violent manner before striking her in the throat. The prosecution also claimed that early the next morning, Tony wrapped Blessy's lifeless body in a bedsheet, placed it back in his car, and drove to Eskdale Cemetery to bury her. They speculated that the timing was deliberate, allowing Tony to avoid violating his curfew. A forensic scientist testified that luminol testing conducted in the area where Blessy's body was discovered revealed a blue path, indicating that a blood-stained object was most likely dragged through the grass. The evidence suggested that Blessy's body had been transported through different parts of the cemetery before being placed on the ground and dragged to the spot where it was discovered. Dr. Carl Y. Grin, a pathologist, presented details about the injuries in court. He testified that Blessy had multiple deep stab wounds, one of which was so violent that it embedded links from her necklace. Dr. A. Grin also stated that when Blessy was stabbed in the throat, her windpipe was damaged. He emphasized that all of Blessy's injuries occurred while she was alive, as evidenced by the blood in her lungs. Pathologist Dr. Carl Walgren testified that Blessy suffered numerous injuries, making it difficult to pinpoint a single cause of death. He suggested that her death was caused by a combination of factors, including strangling blunt force trauma from being hit by a car, stab wounds, and incised wounds. Dr. Walgren expressed difficulty attributing death to a single injury, but believed that the stabbing hastened her death. Blessy was found to have suffered a variety of blunt force trauma injuries, including broken ribs, legs, teeth, and abrasions consistent with postmortem dragging. Dr. Walgren proposed that Blessy was strangled first to subdue her, followed by stabbings and incised wounds. Evidence of manual strangulation was found, including bruising on her neck, a fractured thyroid, and broken capillaries in her eyes. According to Dr. Y, a grin blessing could have survived being hit by a car with prompt medical attention. However, she sustained additional injuries, including sharp force injuries that resulted in significant bleeding. When asked about defensive wounds, Dr. Wagner stated that there did not appear to be any explanation to the jury that such an absence is not uncommon in cases where the victim succumbs to violence. Dr. Walgren also informed the court that DNA tests on Blessy's body revealed the presence of Tony's seminal fluid. This testimony provided critical forensic evidence for the prosecution's case. The court was informed that Tony, who was wearing a GPS anklet at the time, had visited Eskdale Cemetery hours before the murder. The prosecution claimed that Tony was scouting for a location to hide a body, which indicated premeditation. They claimed that he planned the murder in advance, choosing the burial site before deciding on his victim. The DP's data also revealed Tony returning to the cemetery early the following morning, leading the prosecution to believe he dumped Blessy's body at that time. Crown Prosecutor Michael Walker emphasized the significance of these visits claiming that they demonstrated the defendant's intent to kill someone and that the trip to the cemetery was to determine where to dispose of the body. The court heard that blood was found in Tony's car and a knife and some of Blessy's belongings were discovered buried in the back of his property. The knife contained traces of Blessy's blood. Tony's BMU was damaged and evidence of this was presented in court. Detective Constable Shane Page testified that the vehicle had recently sustained damage. The majority of the rear passenger seatbelt was missing. When I dismantled the seatbelt as the anchorage point, I discovered that about a meter, or 940 mm, was missing. It'd been cut. 
The detective also testified about additional damage inside Tony's car, such as cuts and scratches on the leather seats in the back. He discovered a significant amount of replaced foam in the back seat, as well as blood on the passenger seat and in the trunk. The autoglazer told the court that, on May 26, he was summoned to Tony's home to repair a broken BMW windshield. He found it strange that the windscreen had already been removed from the car and he discovered blood inside. When asked about the cause of the damage, Tony claimed it occurred while he was joking with friends. According to Tony, a friend slipped on the bonnet and crashed through the window. A sergeant from the serious crash unit testified that he thought Blessy was intentionally struck. He speculated that she was struck while walking on the pavement, citing the discovery of a tire imprint on the verge near where her belongings were discovered. In the defense's case, Tony admitted to causing Blessy's death, but claimed it was unintentional and not planned. According to his defense, Tony claimed that he panicked after accidentally hitting Blessy and then inflicted the injuries on her body to make the incident appear random. He claimed that all injuries were inflicted post-mortem. During the trial, Tony fired his legal team and decided to defend himself. Tony told the court that he denied the prosecution's version of events and stated that he panicked following the accidental collision. He claimed that putting Blessy in his car and driving home was only to comply with his curfew. I put a strain on my car to meet my curfew of 8 p.m. and remained there until 6 a.m. Tony contended that the prosecution was incorrect and claimed premeditation, citing the lack of witnesses to the car accident. He explained his presence at the cemetery on May 24 and 25 by claiming he was attempting to purchase illegal substances. Tony argued that the DNA evidence was microscopic, making it difficult for scientists to isolate and test. The defense presented opposing views on Bless's injuries from another pathologist, Dr. Chapman, who disagreed with Dr. Wagner's findings. Dr. Chapman's report read in court suggested that Blessed's neck injuries, particularly the fractured thyroid, could have been caused by another blow to the area. The report stated that the bruising on Blessy's neck did not appear to be caused by her fingertips. Dr. Chapman's differing views, particularly on the likelihood of Blessing, inhaling her own blood, supported Tony's claim that he caused the stab wounds post-mortem to simulate a random attack. During his testimony, Tony stated that when he placed Blessy in his car, he assumed she was already dead. He claimed that he staged the scene to appear like a random attack because he was under the influence of methamphetamine at the time. Tony also denied the rape allegations, claiming that the DNA evidence found on Blessy's body, specifically his seminal fluid, was contaminated and caused by police malpractice. However, the jury rejected Tony's version of events and found him guilty of rape and murder. Tony was sentenced to life in prison with a 24-year minimum non-parole period and preventive detention for the rape. In New Zealand, preventive detention is an open-ended detention, is an open-ended jail term that can be extended indefinitely or recalled at any time. Tony appealed the verdict, claiming that Blessy's death was an accident and that the jury should have been given the option of convicting him of manslaughter. The appeal was denied, and a subsequent Supreme Court attempt was also unsuccessful, as it was determined that Tony had not presented any evidence during the trial to suggest that a charge of manslaughter could be considered. He was denied further leave to appeal Tony's criminal history, which was revealed after his sentencing, providing a stark context for his actions. Tony was granted name suppression during the trial, which concealed his previous convictions for child sexual offenses. The details of his criminal history were kept from the jury. In 2005, when Tony was only 18, he committed a heinous crime. Tonga kidnapped and molested a five-year-old girl. Local officers suspected Tony's involvement and tracked him down with the girl, where they discovered the distressing scene with the child's pants down. Tony was convicted of seven charges, including indecent assault and attempting to abduct two other children. He was sentenced to eight years in prison for these offenses. Tony was released in December 2013, just five months before Blessy's tragic murder, and he violated his release conditions twice in a short period. As a result, he was deemed a danger, prompting an extended supervision order that required a decade of monitoring and a 24-hour GP's tracking system. The judge overseeing this case, Cleet Justice Edwin Wiley, expressed serious concerns about Tony's proclivity for violence. I'm satisfied that Mr. Robertson poses a significant risk. I believe he will commit indecency against a child under the age of 12 and abduct a child for sexual purposes. The evidence leads to the conclusion that he is impulsive and unable to control his anger and aggressions. 
Mr. Robertson has a preference for, and proclivity for, sexual offenses. He has expressed no remorse. Indeed, he still denies it. The tragic circumstances surrounding Tony's release from the monitoring order, as well as the subsequent violent attack on Blessy Goding Cack on Blessy Goding, caused her family great pain and anger. The fact that Tony, despite being monitored with a GPS anklet, was able to commit such a heinous crime exacerbated Blessy's family's grief, as they believed the system had failed them. A government report was conducted to look into how the police and corrections departments handled Tony's case. However, the report found no fault with their actions and concluded that Tony was solely responsible for the blessing. Despite the lack of blame placed on the authorities, the report made 27 recommendations to improve the management of high-risk offenders. Blessy's husband, Antonio, expressed disappointment and devastation with the inquiry's findings, claiming that corrections lacked the capacity to manage high-risk sex offenders and that, in his opinion, the offenders controlled the system. The Minister of Corrections stated that Tony had served his full eight-year prison sentence for the previous offense and had been denied parole several times due to his lack of remorse. Residents of Birkdale, Auckland, were not notified of his release into their community. In a statement released by New Zealand police, Antonio expressed his family's profound loss. Blessy is the light of our home, and without her, we would be lost in the dark. Right now, we're just trying to pretend everything is fine. But deep down, we are heartbroken. We've been robbed. She has left too soon. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Our story begins with Annie, a beautiful girl. Annie's family and friends described her as a bright, beautiful, and sociable girl. Vinod Hindosha, Annie's father and the son of a successful merchant, left the Indian state of Gujarat as a young man for Europe. The family settled in Mariestad, a small town in Sweden. Vinod started his own business, and the family became wealthy. After graduating from college, Annie moved to Stockholm and worked in the marketing department of Ericsson's, a mobile phone manufacturer. Annie's father gave her a new car and an apartment in a prestigious neighborhood of the city. After 25 years, Annie started looking for a husband. She frequently flew to London and stayed at the homes of wealthy relatives. Her maternal uncles owned the British pharmacy chain, and she spent her weekends communicating with her extended family. She decided that her husband would be Hindu. One of Annie's relatives met Shireen Dewaney at a party in London and admired his background, social standing, upbringing, and manners. She then set up an informal meeting between Sherwin and Annie at a cafe. The young people liked each other, so they went on their first date in September 2009 with C.N. Duaney. His family, like Annie's, were Gujarati and had moved to Europe and England. Syed's father established a pharmacy in Bristol as well as a nursing home. Sai graduated from an elite school in Bristol, studied accounting at Manchester University, and then relocated to London to work for the accounting firm De La Suite. After a year, he left his job to help run the family business. At the age of 33, he was already a millionaire. Following their dating, they decided to move in together and share a home in Bristol, United Kingdom. Sheen elaborated on the instant allure he felt for Annie, emphasizing her ambitions while mirroring his own, fostering eager anticipation for the collaborative construction of their future life together. Their relationship was not without challenges, necessitating collaborative efforts to overcome obstacles that occasionally led to disagreements. Sheeran revealed that he had abnormally low hormone levels, which reduced his chances of having children and prompted his decision to undergo testosterone replacement therapy. Despite the difficult challenges they faced during this time, Sheen believes their bond grew stronger, culminating in his decision to propose to Annie a little more than a year after their first meeting. Shane arranged for Annie to travel to the romantic city of Paris via Paris via private aircraft, where he proposed marriage. Following her affirmative response, he planned an elaborate stag party in the vibrant city of Las Vegas, located in the United States. The matrimonial union was celebrated in the opulent city of Mumbai, India, with an extravagant wedding, costing an estimated $250,000. As a result, the newlyweds planned and postponed their honeymoon, instead choosing to spend several weeks in the picturesque setting of Cape Town, South Africa, 
indulging in the luxury and opulence of a five-star resort. Sheeran and Annie went out to dinner on November 13th at a hotel in Cape Town. Others noticed them posing for pictures at their hotel. They seemed like any other couple on their honeymoon. They held hands, kissed, and laughed. But their joy would not last. They waited for their cab at their hotel and then used Google Maps to navigate through a township near Countship near Cape Town. At midnight that night, a distressed shepherd requested assistance. He was apprehended in Harare, and he told police that the taxi they were riding in had been hijacked. The driver was removed from the vehicle, and two men entered Sri Lanka. An army was detained at gunpoint. The men were released on treason charges, but they still had Annie, and he had no idea where they were during the police interrogation. Soren recounted his encounter with Zola Tongo, a taxi driver. Zola allegedly claimed to be an executive tour guide, prompting Sharon to seek his assistance with currency exchange and the arrangement of a private helicopter flight. Sherwin also requested Zola's services as a local tour guide. According to the Sheeran statement, the trio decided to take an impromptu tour of the area after dinner with Annie, with no firm plans for the rest of the evening, expressing a desire to discover what Africa is truly like. According to Sharon's account, the pivotal moment occurred when they deviated from a motorway. The next thing I remember is banging noises coming from the front and right sides of the car. There was a cacophony of shouting in a language I was unfamiliar with. As a result, I recall the presence of someone next to me instructing me to lie down. This person wielded a firearm. However, the specific hand that held the weapon escapes my memory. The gun was raised in the air, accompanied by fervent shouts, look down, lie down. I was overcome with terror. Annie and I promptly followed these instructions. Annie, I found myself partially reclined at the top while another person took control behind the wheel. Sheeran told authorities that one of the individuals confiscated his mobile device and brandished a firearm near his head. The assailant sternly warned him against falsehoods and threatened to use the weapon. Simultaneously, pedestrians continued their journey in the car, coming to a halt at a narrow thoroughfare. The perpetrators instructed me to exit the vehicle. Shane requested that Annie also be allowed to leave. However, the response indicated that they intended to accompany her to a law enforcement facility. Shane was clearly warned that non-compliance would result in gunshots, forcing him to disembark. He described the incident to the police as follows. I attempted to open the door, but it would not open. Keep track of when the window opens. I remember hitting the ground and the car speeding away. The last thing I told Annie was to be quiet and not say anything. I told her this in Gujarati after he left. Sheeran stated that he was unaware of the car's subsequent trajectory other than the presence of two people retaining Annie inside. His testimony informed the authorities that he requested assistance by knocking on doors. As a result, law enforcement officers were summoned and he was taken to a police station. A day after these events, the vehicle was discovered, with Annie's lifeless body found in the back seat of the cab. She had received a gunshot wound to the neck. Subsequent police investigations revealed that Annie's Giovanni Armani wristwatch, a white gold and diamond bracelet, her handbag, and her BlackBerry mobile phone were missing, leading authorities to believe that they were stolen during the incident. The stolen items, which included a wristwatch, bracelet, handbag, and mobile phone, were estimated to be worth approximately 90,000 South African Rand, or $6,089. The investigation, then shifted to understanding the rationale behind the captor's decision to release Sheeran while retaining and eventually killing Annie, actually killing Annie. Sheeran returned to the United Kingdom not long after his death. The investigation moved quickly at first, with Annie's lifeless body discovered only three days later. Zalil Mangini, 26, was apprehended and formally charged with murder, aggravated robbery, and kidnapping. The discovery of his palm print on the vehicle served as a critical lead that led law enforcement to his arrest. In the following days, more arrests were made, including 31-year-old Zola Tonga, the cab driver, and 26-year-old M. Z. Wamadota Quabe, both charged with murder, aggravated robbery, and kidnapping. An informant's tip helped locate M. Z. Wamadota. Zola initially denied any involvement, claiming that he was ambushed and forced out of the vehicle. However, when confronted with incriminating evidence, he eventually admitted his involvement in the criminal activities. The trio, which included Zola and Mangini, initially provided an account to law enforcement, 
claiming that the intended plan was a robbery that had gotten out of control. According to their story, Ani was shot accidentally during a struggle over her handbag. Later, a fourth person, Monde Mbalambo, was apprehended for his role in orchestrating the robbery. The men later revealed to the police that Sharon Duaney was also involved in the crime. Zola told police that he met Sharon, who allegedly offered him 15,000 Rand 20, $100, to orchestrate Annie's death. According to Zola, he then approached a friend about hiring a hitman and was put in touch with his allele and MZ Wamadota. The statement astounded Shireen's family. However, further investigation revealed that, while the couple appeared to be happy on their honeymoon, this was not the whole story. Annie's emails to Shane revealed frequent disagreements with her, expressing her dissatisfaction and desire to end the relationship. A perplexing question emerged. What drove Shen to seek Annie's demise? Further investigation, he discovered Sheeran's lifestyle, which revealed his involvement with male prostitutes via gay websites. Shane admitted to these activities while asserting his bisexuality, expressing love for his wife and denying any involvement in Annie's murder. Sheeran was arrested in the United Kingdom on suspicion of a murder conspiracy as requested by South African authorities. Sheeran vehemently denied involvement and fought extradition, resulting in protracted legal proceedings. Before Shane was extradited to South Africa, the other men were sentenced for their roles in the crime. Zola was sentenced to 18 years in prison. Mzi Wamadota received a 25-year sentence, while Exalil was sentenced to life in prison. It was determined that Exalil fired the fatal shot at Annie. And during his sentencing hearing, the judge referred to him as an evil person. Extradition proceedings in the United Kingdom took four years to complete. Sheeran's lawyers argued that he couldn't travel to South Africa because he was suffering from acute stress disorder. The court heard that he had consumed a cocktail of 46 pills, including diazepam. The extradition was finally completed after the court determined that his depression had subsided. He was extradited to South Africa, where his trial began. The prosecution claimed that Sheeran lived a secret life with other men in order to avoid his marriage. According to their case, he orchestrated a contract killing and enlisted Zola to plan a hijacking with the intention of freeing himself and killing Annie. During the trial, the court was shown surveillance footage of Sheeran handing money to Zola. Sheeran looked up at a security camera in a hotel before leaving the frame. Additional footage showed him carrying a bag containing money as he approached a small room with Zola. Later footage showed them conversing at the opulent Cape Grace Hotel where Sheeran requested privacy from a window cleaner. The prosecution's argument was based primarily on the testimony of two of the three men who were already serving prison sentences. Mziwama Dota claimed that he was instructed to stage the incident as a hijacking. The court learned that these individuals provided evidence as part of plea bargain agreements, which resulted in reduced sentences for them. The pathologist, Dr. Jeanette Verster, testified about Annie's post-mortem examination. The court was informed that Annie had gunshot wounds in her left hand and neck, resulting in significant blood loss. Dr. Verster emphasized that Annie could have passed away in a matter of heartbeats. She also stated that the fatal shot was fired at close range, acknowledging that Annie may have been holding on to someone or something when shot. In response, the defense argued for the case's dismissal and formally requested it. Sharon didn't take the stand. However, a statement was presented in court revealing his admission to being bisexual and engaging with male prostitutes. He expressed his deep love for Annie and spoke about the profound impact his wife's tragic murder had on his life. Sheeran's attorney presented two scenarios that could have resulted in Annie's death. To begin, he suggested that it was a botched robbery, supported by forensic evidence indicating that Annie was accidentally shot during an attempt to snatch her handbag by one of the hijackers, bruising on her inner leg indicating a struggle, and the defense argued that the bullets passed through her left hand into her chest, with the neck wound implying an exit in unintentional shooting. The second scenario proposed was a failed kidnapping and ransom attempt. Bernard Mitchell, a criminal, claimed that Zola later told him about the plan while in prison. According to Mitchell, the intention was to kidnap Annie for ransom, but the plan failed. The court learned about that tree and did give Zola 15,000 rand in cash, but the defense claimed it was for a helicopter ride, not payment for orchestrating his wife's death. The defense requested that the case against Soren be dismissed due to a lack of substantial evidence linking him to the crime. The judge agreed with the defense's arguments. 
The judge stated that it was the prosecution's responsibility to prove that Sharon conspired with the three other men to murder Annie, and they fell short of meeting the required level of evidence in such a case. The judge emphasized that Zola, as the sole accomplice witness, had agreed to a plea deal, making his testimony suspect and requiring corroboration. The judge noted Zola's details, such as the locations where he picked up and dropped off Sharon, but Annie did not provide the necessary corroboration. Furthermore, the judge criticized the three men's testimony, describing it as riddled with inconsistencies and so improbable that distinguishing between lies and truth became difficult. The judge informed the court that the evidence linking Sheeran to Annie's murder was of such poor quality that only Sheeran's confession would have resulted in a conviction. As a result, the judge ruled that he was not required to provide evidence and could be discharged if there was no chance of conviction unless he incriminated himself on the witness stand. Following this ruling, he left South Africa and returned to the United Kingdom as a free man, with the murder charge against him dropped. According to Annie's family, Sherwin has never contacted them to tell them everything he knows about what happened to her. They have many unanswered questions. And his father said, We still don't know the whole story of how it happened. We wanted Soren to tell the court, in his own words, that he was her husband and was present. His lawyers repeated the words my client will tell the court during his trial, like a mantra, but the judge dismissed the case without Sharon testifying. We never had the opportunity to hear what he had to say. My family would like to talk with him. If he has any respect for us, he should come to see us and speak with us. After all, I'm still his father-in-law, and I gave him my daughter. He needs to help us. According to the information available, Shireen Duwaney is still living in the United Kingdom. Zalil Manjini, one of the individuals involved in the case, died in prison in South Africa in 2014. His cause of death was a rare brain tumor. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. The tragic story of Lacey Peterson, a young school teacher, not only shocked the public with its unimaginable cruelty and inhumanity, but it also set the stage for the passage of the Lacey and Connor Act. Connor was the name of her unborn son, who died alongside his mother, and the law was intended to protect children from violence before birth and punish those who endanger their lives and health. The case is far from unique, but the fact that a pregnant woman was abused by someone close to her, who was supposed to protect and care for her, is shocking and puzzling. Several television documentaries have been produced about the case, Despite circumstantial and controversial evidence, no one questioned the defendant's guilt. And he, in all of his appearances, demonstrated that he is not sorry or repentant for what he did. This is one of those stories that gives you chills all over. But let's try to figure out how the guy who was considered a model family man decided to commit such an atrocity. Who was Lacey Peterson. Lacey Denise Peterson, maiden name Rosha, was born in May 1975 in Modesto, a small town in the central part of California. Dennis Rocha and Sharon Anderson had known each other since high school, and their teenage romance resulted in marriage and the birth of two children, Brandon, the eldest, and Lacey, the daughter. Curiously, the mother named her daughter after a local beauty queen that she admired. The family owned their own farm, so the children learned to work in the fields and care for animals from a young age. The girl was extremely close to her mother. They worked together to create a beautiful garden filled with flowers and fruit trees. Then Lacey considered connecting her future life to this occupation and pursuing a specialized profession. When the kids were still small, the family faced a crisis, and no matter how hard the spouse tried, they were unable to save the marriage and soon divorced. By mutual agreement, the children continued to live with their mother in their hometown. Two years later, Sharon remarried. Her chosen one was a childhood friend named Ron Grant Ski. Ron treated his wife's children as his own, and in fact replaced their birth father, who was uninterested in the heir's lives following the divorce. The girl even started calling him daddy. A few years later, the couple had a daughter named Emily Lacey, who grew up to be a kind, sociable, and open girl. She always had a large group of friends. She always had a large group of friends. She did well in school and was a member of the cheerleading team. After graduating from high school, 
the dark-haired beauty passed her exams and was accepted into the prestigious California State University. She decided to pursue her childhood dream of becoming a landscape designer. Lacey has always been a creative person who enjoys drawing, so she found her chosen profession, which is Scott Peterson. Scott Lee Peterson is also a California native, but he was born on October 24, 1972, in the large metropolis of San Diego, in the southwest of the state, to Jacqueline Helen Latham and Arthur Lee Peterson. The boy grew up in a fairly well-to-do family, and from a young age, he knew nothing to refuse. His father owned a business that produced packaging materials, and his mother ran a designer clothing store. By the way, her boutique was located in Hollywood. Among the regular customers were several celebrities. Scott's difficult personality began to emerge in childhood. He enjoyed being the center of attention, did not tolerate bans or refusals, and was described as a spoiled, capricious, and even arrogant child in school. The boy began playing golf at a young age and considered pursuing a professional career in the sport. He was friends with Philip Mickelson, also known as Lefty, the future professional golfer who was ranked second in the world in 2012. As a teenager, Scott was one of San Diego's best athletes. Following graduation, the young man enrolled in one of Arizona's universities, where a promising athlete paid for half of his education. However, Peterson was unable to receive a diploma because he was expelled for inappropriate behavior following a raucous potluck, already consuming strong alcohol in the presence of other students. After months of deliberation and searching for a suitable location, the young man applied to the University of California, where he initially intended to study economics but later changed his mind and transferred to the Faculty of Agriculture. By the way, Scott took the educational process very seriously and responsibly this time, becoming an exemplary student because his parents threatened to leave him without a job if he was expelled again. Scott and Lacey, a love story. Young people met while studying at university. Scott began working part-time in one of the local coffee shops, where he also worked as a waitress alongside a former classmate and close friend of Lacey. Lacey frequently stopped by to eat and see her friend, and when she noticed the handsome young man, Scott noticed the smiling petite brunette and began to give her his full attention. One day, Lacey went to the coffee shop but didn't see her friend. She decided to ask Scott what was wrong. They quickly started talking. However, because Scott had to work, Lacey wrote her phone number on a napkin so they could contact each other later. Scott called her back that evening, and Lacey was thrilled. After speaking with him, he informed her mother that she had contacted her future husband. A few days later, he asked his new acquaintance out on a first date, and Lacey readily agreed. It's worth noting that Peterson had another passion besides golf, fishing, so he invited Lacey to go deep sea fishing in an open body of water. She accepted the offer, but she became seasick on the boat, forcing the couple to quickly return to shore and family life. Nonetheless, after that not so great first date, the couple began to meet, and a few years later, they decided to move in together. Scott had finally abandoned his dreams of a professional sports career and decided to start his own small business. In the summer of 1997, he used the startup capital to help his parents. After Lacey received her diploma, the couple held a traditional wedding with a white dress veil and vows at the altar. They only invited family and close friends to the celebration. And as a venue, they chose the popular Sycamore Mineral Springs Resort, which is located on the ocean in Western California. Following their wedding, the couple moved to San Luis Obispo, a small resort town between Los Angeles and San Francisco. They decided to open their own sports bar, but the idea was doomed from the beginning. There were rumors that Scott's parents once again assisted with the execution of the business plan. However, they later denied it, claiming that their son was a poor businessman who they discovered while he was still attending university. Anyway, the couple's business was not very successful. They initially had constant problems, first with the institution itself, then with the management, but they eventually managed to spin the number of visitors up over time, and by 2000, when the Petersons decided to sell the institution, it was already a well-known and popular destination. The couple decided to settle in Lacey, their hometown, and start a family. They bought a small, cozy house in a good neighborhood, a car, and a dog. And about a year later, the young woman told her husband the happy news that they would soon be parents. 
Lacey had already decided to change her career path and accepted a position as an art teacher at a local school. Her husband was having difficulty finding work and was forced to accept a position with a fertilizer and organic fertilizer company. Lacey tried to be the perfect wife in order to bring comfort and peace into her and her husband's new home. She kept everything in perfect order, loved cooking, entertaining guests, and had a lovely flower garden on the lawn. Scott appeared to be supportive of his wife in all aspects, and from the outside they appeared to be the perfect couple. He accepted the news of the upcoming addition to the family with joy. When the couple discovered they would have a boy, they actively began to choose a name for him. The future parents chose the name Connor for their son, and everyone was sure that they were looking forward to the child's birth as a pregnant teacher. Lacey, who was eight months pregnant at the time, mysteriously disappeared on December 24, 2002. Lacey's mother and stepfather, who had been unable to contact her throughout the day, raised the first alarms. She did not answer the phone or return calls, which was unusual for her. As it turned out, the husband had been unaware of his wife's whereabouts the day before. She had visited her parents as well as the beauty salon where her sister Amelia worked. She was cheerful as she prepared for the Christmas and New Year's Eve celebrations. Lacey allegedly went for a morning walk with her dog, but a few hours later, neighbors discovered the Peterson's dog wandering down the street, dragging a dirty leash behind him. At the time, no one suspected anything wrong. The neighbor, he said, simply thought the dog had escaped, so we took him to the owner's backyard. For the evening, the concerned parents called the police and reported him missing, requesting that they begin searching immediately because Lacey was pregnant, and if she was in trouble, she required assistance as soon as possible. However, she was never found that day or the next. A day later, word of the missing teacher spread throughout town prompting hundreds of volunteers to join the search. People combed the area, pasting flyers with portraits of the girl and organizing search pages and social networks where they posted detailed information about the missing mother and stepfather. The older brother and younger sister appealed to all concerned on television, requesting assistance in the search and sharing any useful information for which a reward was even announced, except that Scott behaved strangely and even suspiciously refusing to participate in press conferences, showing little interest in the search results and appearing unconcerned. Mr. Peterson's behavior, according to the investigator in charge of the case, raised suspicions from the start. He was frighteningly calm and the police officer's questions annoyed him. He asked no questions, acted arrogantly, and most interestingly confused his statements by changing them multiple times. Scott was the last person to see his spouse on the day she went missing. He went to the golf course in the morning to get some exercise and play while his wife stayed at home, intending to walk the dog and do some cleaning later. When he got home, he found the dog in the backyard, but Lacey was nowhere to be found. Scott did not go to the police because he believed his wife was visiting her parents. However, when she still did not show up, he became concerned and called his mother-in-law's house, where he was informed that Lacey had not arrived. And that's when the first inconsistencies in Scott's testimony became apparent. First, no one could confirm his alibi because he hadn't been seen on the golf course. Second, the father-in-law claimed, as confirmed by the taped conversations, that he had called Scott himself while looking for his stepdaughter. But he replied that he had no idea where she could be. Peterson then abruptly changed tactics, stating that he had changed his mind about playing golf and instead planned to go fishing at a secluded location in Berkeley Harbor. He explained the confusion over the phone calls by stating that all of the relatives were on edge and couldn't remember who had called whom or when during the inspection of the couple's home. A strange and frightening detail was discovered. Lacey's purse, which contained her house keys, phone, and some cash had gone missing. She wouldn't have left the house without at least taking her dog for a walk to the nearby park. How would she lock the front door? This nuance was alarming, raising suspicions that Lacey had not vanished on the street but rather from her own home. A grisly discovery. On April 13, nearly four months after the pregnant teacher went missing, local fishermen noticed something strange on the rocky shores of San Francisco Bay and decided to investigate further. As it turned out, their attention was drawn to the body of an infant that had washed up on shore. The boy's body had hardly decomposed, but it was severely disfigured, apparently as a result of the body being battered by the waves against the rocks for quite some time. His umbilical cord appeared to have been torn rather than cut. A day later, 
in a different part of the bay, a few kilometers from where the infant was discovered. A severely decomposed body of a young woman was discovered. The corpse was so disfigured that it wasn't immediately identifiable as human remains. But the most gruesome aspect was that the body was missing its head and most of its limbs. There were only a few fragments of clothing left on the body, including a special maternity bra. It was simply impossible to identify the body, so only DNA testing could determine that it belonged to the missing teacher. According to criminalists, the baby was well-preserved because he was in the womb the entire time, but the body rejected the fetus during the decomposition process. According to eyewitnesses who discovered the boy, something strange resembling a ribbon or rope was wrapped around his neck and he had a large cut on his body. Although the autopsy results were never officially released, the experts claimed that the cut was caused by a wave hitting the body against a sharp rock and that the noose around his neck was simply trash. Scott evaded capture during the investigation and search. Furthermore, Lacey's parents actively defended their son-in-law for the first few days, describing him as an ideal husband and their marriage as happy and built on love and trust. But the more the police learned about this man, the more suspicious he appeared to them. Peterson began cheating on his wife almost immediately after the wedding, even before the couple moved to Modesto. Later, he had numerous mistresses with whom he lied about not being married or recently widowed. Thus, in the fall of 2002, Scott went on a blind date with a lovely blonde named Amber Frey. The girl worked as a Seuss and raised her young daughter alone. She was looking for a life partner who would love and accept her and her child, and Scott was handsome and polite. She knew the feelings were mutual. Scott almost immediately admitted that he had recently been widowed and that the upcoming Christmas would be the first without his beloved deceased wife. Amber consoled him as best she could, and from that point forward, they communicated almost daily. Scott soon told his mistress that they could move in together after the holidays, and the couple began to plan their future together. True, Scott stated that he has never wanted to have his own children and plans to undergo a sterilization procedure known as a vasectomy, but he was also prepared to raise daughter Amber as his own. Everything was fine until Amber happened to see a TV report about the disappearance of a pregnant local teacher. Despite the fact that the missing woman's husband did not give an interview or appear in front of the cameras, the broadcast featured photos of her and Lacey together, and Amber recognized her lover. Another intriguing feature was Scott's drastic change in appearance following his wife's disappearance, which included growing a beard and bleaching his naturally dark hair on his head and face. Amber couldn't believe what she was seeing and hoped it was all a dream. However, she soon realized that she was dating the same guy. She went straight to the police and told them everything, even agreeing to record their phone conversations. Amber wondered why Scott had told her he was a widower a couple of weeks before his wife vanished, but he must have sensed something was wrong. Despite his evasiveness, as soon as the bodies of the deceased mother and child were found, the question of immediately arresting Scott as the main suspect arose. Despite the fact that the investigation lacked hard evidence, there was a good chance Scott would try to leave the country. In fact, that was exactly what he planned to do. But, fortunately, he did not have time. On April 18, 2003, the widower was taken into custody, but he refused to admit his guilt. Simultaneously, his house, garage, and car were thoroughly searched yielding frightening results. Microparticles of Lacey's dried blood were discovered on tools in the garage, the trunk of the car, and the bottom of the fishing boat. Experts discovered several hairs from the deceased woman. The clothes Scott was wearing on that fateful day had long since been discarded. The house had undergone several general cleanings with the assistance of cleaning services, and the building itself had already been listed for sale. But the most difficult aspect of the investigation was the inability to determine the exact date of Lacey's death, which made it impossible to verify the suspect's alibi. Traces of cement were discovered in the garage, trunk, and Peterson's boat, further complicating the investigation. The material was thought to be the foundation for a homemade anchor, with which he intended to dispose of the body so that it would never be discovered. However, there was no direct evidence against Scott. He was found guilty of two counts of first and second degree murder. Despite the lawyer's vigorous and confident defense, almost no one doubted Scott's guilt. His actions were the most obvious indication of this. He was neither excited nor upset. He took no part in the search. 
He was in a hurry to get rid of the evidence, selling his wife's house and car almost immediately after her disappearance, changing his image, and leaving the country with his mistress. Investigator Jonathan Bueller, who had been working on the case since Lacey's disappearance, stated in court that he had no doubts about Peterson's guilt from the beginning. He realized this after his initial conversation with him. The court first imposed the death penalty as a punishment. However, after an impressive number of appeals, the sentence was changed in 2021 to life in prison with no chance of parole. In addition, the court redirected the deceased's mother to receive a quarter of a million dollars in life insurance for Lacey, which was originally assigned to Scott. This high-profile case horrified the public and highlighted the importance of protecting unborn children from violence as they may become victims of similar crimes. Thus, in the spring of 2004, the Lacey and Connor Act was signed in the presence of the deceased woman's parents and sister. Three years after the tragedy, Sharon Rocha wrote a biographical book called In Memory of Lacey, A Mother's Story of Love, Loss and Justice, in honor of her daughter and grandson. All proceeds from the sale of the publication were donated to charity. The book was one of the top bestsellers in American nonfiction. Lacey Sharon's husband and stepfather died of a heart attack in the spring of 2018, just before another court hearing. He was buried next to his beloved stepdaughter and grandson. By the way, Lacey's father died in December of the same year. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On the evening of January 31, 2019, 21-year-old Libby Squire, a philosophy student at the University of Hull in East Yorkshire in England, reluctantly joined her friends for a night out at home. She didn't want to disappoint her friends, even though she had an early morning lecture the next day. Libby stayed in shared housing near the university. Libby spoke with her boyfriend James Pye throughout the evening. The last text message he received from her was at 10.30 p.m. The following day, February 1, James Libby's friends and family tried but failed to reach her. They went to her house only to find that she wasn't there. Law enforcement interviewed Libby's friends and discovered that she had not been with them when they left the club that night. According to her friends, Libby was turned away from the Welly nightclub in Hall because security suspected she was intoxicated. To ensure her safety, her friends called a cab to take her back to her Wellesley Avenue home. Following the investigation, police conducted a search of the area, which resulted in the discovery of Libby's house keys in a neighbor's garden. Authorities collected CCTV footage from the area and interviewed numerous witnesses. They determined that Libby had arrived home in the cab, but when she exited, she walked down the street without entering her house. Based on CTV footage and witness statements, the police were pursuing a specific lead in Libby's disappearance, and they were confident they had identified the person responsible. Despite their knowledge of the individual involved, they had no idea where Libby was. Seven weeks after her disappearance, 26-year-old Powell Relois discovered her body in the Humber estuary between Spurn Point and Grimsby and was later arrested. He was questioned a few days after Libby was reported missing, but was released. Powell, originally from Poland, lived in North Yorkshire with his wife and two young children and worked as a butcher for Caro Foods in Malt. He told police that he saw Libby crying in the street and offered to drive her home. He claimed to have dropped her off near some playing fields because she was ill. This was the last time he saw her. He told the cops I had nothing to hide. Just check the cameras. The police examined the surveillance footage and charged him with rape and murder. Powell pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. According to the prosecution, Libby arrived home that fateful night in a very vulnerable state. The weather was bitterly cold, and she found herself alone and intoxicated, having accidentally dropped her house keys in her neighbor's garden. The prosecutor emphasized to the court that Libby was most likely experiencing hypothermia and distress at the time. She was in tears after losing her house keys, and she kept falling to the ground while attempting to walk. Libby was confronted by several witnesses who saw her in distress that night. During the trial, jurors heard from several witnesses who saw or interacted with Libby after the cab dropped her off outside her home. The court was informed that a student named George Thompson saw Libby exit the cab and described how she fell flat on her face, remained on the ground for about 10 seconds, and struggled to walk, stumbling everywhere. Libby's neighboring students had a right, and Emma Hall Shaw encountered her after she exited the cab.
They heard her crying and sobbing outside her house and invited her to come inside. However, Libby chose not to testify against Roland Jacobs, and Alan Jones revealed that they stopped their car on their way home from a darts match when they noticed Libby on the ground. They approached her, concerned about her well-being, and offered to help. Roland mentioned that Libby mumbled, making it difficult to understand her words. She once asked him to lie down with her, and when she asked for a hug, he refused, prompting her to use offensive language. Despite spending about 10 minutes attempting to help her, they felt powerless and eventually left. Lorna Allen described seeing Libby lying on the floor, crying and screaming near a bus stop just before midnight on January 31. Lorna described Libby as slurring her words, talking to herself and appearing very intoxicated. During the trial, the court was told that while Libby was wandering the streets in distress, Powell was driving around the area looking for an opportunity. The prosecution claimed that Powell saw Libby just after midnight. The jury was shown CTV footage obtained by the police, which showed Powell's silver Vauxhall Astra driving around in circular patterns at times. The prosecution claimed Powell was driving around that night, looking for a victim to spy on and satisfy himself. The jury learned about Powell's history, which included several sexually motivated burglaries in the months preceding Libby's disappearance, during which he kept stolen items as trophies. When police arrested him for Libby's murder, they discovered underwear and intimate toys stolen from women. They discovered a bag in his car containing these items as well as photographs of young women. When questioned about the bag, Powell initially claimed ignorance before admitting that he had forgotten about it and had no idea where it came from or how long it had been there. According to court testimony, in the year leading up to Libby's disappearance, Powell exposed himself to women in public and peered through windows. The jury was told that a female student had a terrifying experience when she saw a man's face peering through her window while she was dressing. The man's face was only inches from the window, which terrified her. She recognized this individual as having power. Another woman said she saw Powell at her window, observing her during an intimate moment with her boyfriend. When her housemates returned later that night, they discovered a used contraceptive hanging on the front door, along with women's underwear in the letterbox. Another victim discovered an unwrapped contraceptive and a pair of women's underwear alongside her child's toy. During the trial, forensic scientist Nikolai Taylor testified that Powell's DNA and bodily fluids were found on the woman's underwear. She told the jury that this finding implied intimate contact with the underwear, possibly indicating that Powell had warned them. According to the prosecution's evidence, Libby entered Powell's car after midnight and was driven to the Oak Road playing fields. While CTV footage captured Libby getting into the car, no additional footage was available once she arrived at the playing fields. The prosecution claimed that Powell sexually assaulted Libby before either killing her or leaving her to die in the cold waters of the river hall. They believe that Libby's body then drifted out to sea from that location. To bolster their claim that Libby was sexually assaulted on the playing fields, the prosecution summoned Sam and offered him as a witness. Sam, who lives near the playing fields, testified that he heard a woman's desperate screams coming from the direction of the river. According to court documents, a man was later seen emerging from the darkness and fleeing the scene. The prosecution claimed that the woman screaming was Libby and the man running away was Power. Notably, Libby was not seen on any additional CTV footage after the playing fields. The prosecution also claimed that Powell had visible scratches on his face, which were inflicted by Libby while she fought for her life. The prosecution summarized their case, telling the jury that the evidence supported the conclusion that Libby was raped by a man whose sole motivation for coming into contact with her that night was to take her away from safety to a remote area well known to him and subject her to his uncontrollable sexual urges. The prosecution faces difficulties in ascertaining the exact cause of Libby's death, as emphasized during the trial. Dr. Matthew Lyle, the medical examiner, testified that the cause of Libby's death could not be determined conclusively. Her body had been submerged in water for nearly two months, making it impossible to tell whether she was still alive or dead when she entered the water due to decomposition. Notably, an obvious bruise was found on the inside of her right thigh. Further examination revealed lacerations inside her upper lip, indicating blunt trauma. Small hemorrhages were discovered around her mouth, which the court was told could indicate squeezing or compression of the neck or mouth cover. However, 
It was also stated that these lacerations could have occurred in the water or in life near the time of death. Dr. Lyle stated that there could have been additional injuries to her body, but we can't see them. The court heard testimony about three potential causes of death for Libby, hypothermia, drowning, and asphyxia. In terms of hypothermia, doctor, Lysel explained to the court that in a community setting, death by hyperthermia can occur if an individual is inadequately clothed, their clothing becomes wet, or they consume alcohol. Toxicology tests revealed that Libby had 198 drinks per 100 and may have been ill of blood, exceeding the legal driving limit of 80 mugging. Dr. Lyle was unable to definitively attribute Libby's death to hypothermia, but he could not rule it out. Dr. Liesel stated that establishing drowning as a cause of death can be difficult, especially in cases where it is not witnessed firsthand. The classic signs of drowning include froth or foam coming from the mouth, well-expanded lungs that obscure the heart, and a crackly quality to the lungs. Dr. Lyle described Libby's lungs as having a slightly crackly feel, but not being wet or very expanded. Furthermore, no froth appeared from the mouth. As a result, Dr. Lyle could not definitively state that drowning was the cause of Libby's death. Certain findings emerged from an examination of Libby's injuries in light of the possibility of asphyxia as the cause of death. There was no evidence of bleeding in the brain or skull, and the facial bones, including the horseshoe-shaped bone behind the tongue, were still intact. Injury, such as abrasions on Libby's forehead, nose, and eyelids, was determined to be consistent with post-mortem body movement and water. Doctor, Liesl testified that there were no tiny pinpricks of bleeding in the eyes or inner surface of the lips, which could indicate physical interruption such as asphyxiation or strangulation. However, their absence did not rule out asphyxiation because such indicators tend to fade quickly, particularly after death. In conclusion, hypothermia, drowning, and asphyxia were all considered possible causes of death, but the true cause remained unknown. Swabs from inside Libby's body also contained seminal fluid cells that matched Powell's DNA profile, according to the court. During the trial, the court heard testimony from individuals close to Powell, who provided potentially incriminating information. Powell's friends stated that Powell told him about offering a ride home to a girl at the bus stop who claimed to have made advances on him. Powell's colleague also testified that Powell offered to drive a girl home, but she began acting strangely and undressing in his car. Powell allegedly instructed her to leave. Another piece of evidence came from Paul's neighbor, who spoke on behalf of the prosecution. He claimed to have seen Powell cleaning the mouths of his car on the afternoon of February 1, describing it as unusual for such a cold day. Professor Charles Deacon provided expert testimony that night, stating that Libby's ability to defend herself would have been limited. He explained to the jury, that Libby's alcohol consumption would have caused numb hands and impaired coordination, making her unsteady on her feet and prone to fatigue. Furthermore, her judgment, balance, and ability to flee potential threats would have been severely hampered, leaving her vulnerable. During the closing arguments, the prosecutor urged the jury to consider Libby's state that night, intoxicated and cold, visibly distressed, and in need of assistance. Witnesses reported seeing her cry, lie on the ground, and shiver. The prosecutor asked the jury to consider what might have happened after Libby entered Powell's car. Was it plausible that, in her vulnerable state, she would willingly leave the warmth of the car to lie in the cold snow and engage in consensual activity with Powell? The prosecutor emphasized to the jury that we propose a nonsense proposition, which strengthened the case. The prosecutor reminded the jury of Powell's background, emphasizing that he was not a saint but rather a person seeking to satisfy his own sexual desires. The defense argued that Powell encountered Libby that night, offered her a ride home, and engaged in consensual activity with her. They claimed he stopped at the playing fields because she was feeling ill. As he left, she was still alive. The defense raised the possibility that Libby committed suicide. Powell testified during the trial. According to his account, he offered Libby a ride home after seeing her crying on the street out of compassion for her. Powell stated that he found her crying and shouting on Beverly Road's pavement and wanted to help her. He claimed that their sexual encounter was consensual. The jury was shown CTV footage of Libby and Powell walking along Beverly Road before driving to the Oak Road playing fields. Powell admitted to driving around that night, hoping to find a woman for her. 
He also confessed to stealing women's underwear and intimate toys, as well as spying on people through windows. Powell explained that he initially withheld this information because he was concerned it would cause problems in his marriage. According to Paul's testimony, Libby's behavior appeared unusual, and he suspected she had ingested something or had something put in her drink. When he offered her a ride home, she extended her hand, and they walked to the car. Powell noticed that she seemed more at ease inside the warm car. However, while driving, he claimed that Libby made gestures indicating her desire to vomit, prompting him to pull over near the Oak Road playing fields. Powell described how, when the car came to a stop, Libby attempted to exit but fell kneeling in the snow and cried. According to his testimony, when he drove away, Libby was walking on the sidewalk and he never saw her again. Powell returned home, took a bath, and then watched a movie, concerned for Libby's well-being. He returned to the playing fields to ensure she wasn't lying somewhere, but he discovered nothing. The court learned during the trial that Libby had previously struggled with mental illness. Lisa Squire, Libby's mother, read a statement in court detailing her daughter's history of mental health issues, including an eating disorder and depression. Lisa, on the other hand, stated that her daughter has been afraid of water since she was a child, avoiding swimming pools even on vacation, and is generally afraid of darkness. Lisa didn't believe her daughter would commit suicide. The court was shown excerpts from Libby's medical records that confirmed her depression and anxiety issues. It was also revealed that Libby had researched various methods of suicide and had considered suicide, including the possibility of throwing herself in a river. Even Powell's own legal team described his previous behavior as gross and terrifying. However, the defense claimed there was no evidence of a violent attack on Libby. Powell's attorney claimed that while Powell took advantage of Libby and engaged in deception, he did not commit rape or murder. The defense suggested that Libby could have committed suicide by falling into the river. In his closing statement, the attorney urged the jury to consider whether Powell's lies could have an innocent explanation, stating that even those who are not guilty may lie. He acknowledged that Powell should not have left Libby alone that night given her condition, but speculated that Powell may have lied about meeting her to protect his family. The attorney's closing argument sought to cast doubt on the prosecution's case emphasizing the lack of conclusive evidence linking Powell to the alleged crimes. The jury was asked to deliberate, but they were unable to reach a unanimous conclusion. So Judge Mrs. Justice Lambert informed the jury of seven women and five men that she would accept a majority verdict of 10 to 2 or 11 to 1. They unanimously convicted Powell of rape and later found him guilty of murder by a majority of 11 to 1. Lisa Squire, Libby's mother, said there are no words to describe the agony of living without her. Not only have I lost my firstborn child, with whom I shared a special bond, but I've also lost the opportunity to be a grandmother to her children. Knowing that in Libby's final hour, she needed me, and I wasn't there for her will haunt me for the rest of my life. Because of what happened to Libby that night, I now exist in two worlds. Lee, there is one world in which I am a mother, wife, and employee, but there is also a dark and lonely one, in this world, I wish to die so that I could be with my girl one more time. Russ Libby's father also testified in court, expressing his difficulty viewing photos of his daughter after her death. During the sentencing, the judge addressed Powell, emphasizing how, leading up to Libby's murder, his criminal actions grew in audacity and confidence that he would not be apprehended. The judge noted Powell's blatant staring at women, even after they had noticed it. The judge was certain that Powell's intention was to hide Libby's body, with the hope that it would be carried out to sea and never discovered. Powell received a minimum sentence of 27 years for murder, and an additional 18 years for rape. Share your opinion with us in the comments, and subscribe to the channel for more. The Vaughn Family Case what happened on a deserted road on June 14, 2007? Kimberly Vaughn, 34, and her three children, 12-year-old Abigail, 11-year-old Sandra, and 8-year-old Blake, were found dead on a highway near Bluff. Road Blake were found dead on a highway near Bluff Road. They all died as a result of close-range gunshot wounds. Christopher Vaughn, the family's head, was the only survivor and suffered only minor injuries. He claimed he was shot by his wife who he believes killed their children to settle the score. Christopher, on the other hand, was unable to provide specific information because he allegedly had a memory lapse. 
The case was investigated for five years before a final verdict was reached. However, some people continue to question the justice of the verdict. The story has remained a hot topic on popular television talk shows, prompting numerous questions. We'll try to get to the bottom of things from the start. Kimberly Phillips and Christopher Vaughn have been together for over a decade, have three children, and appear to be a happy and friendly family on the outside. Kimberly Vaughn, real name Phillips, was born in the small town of St. Charles, Missouri in December 1972. She grew up in a relatively affluent family with two daughters, Jennifer and Elizabeth. By the way, Jennifer was our heroine's twin sister. The Phillips did not take shortcuts when it came to their daughter's education and development. Kimberly, like her sisters, attended a prestigious school and participated in sports. She had many friends who described the girl as outgoing and friendly. Christopher Vaughn was born in September 1974 in St. Louis, Missouri, a nearby city. He was one of three sons in a modest yet welcoming family. During his school years, the young man was very interested in soccer and also enjoyed hiking, camping, and family vacations out of town. The couple met in the early 1990s. They quickly developed a romantic relationship. Kimberly's parents opposed the union from the beginning because the chosen daughter was a few years younger than her and did not yet have a stable job. Furthermore, as previously stated, I grew up in a modest, if not impoverished, household. However, the young people were so in love with one another that they refused to listen to anyone else. Kimberly soon became pregnant, and the couple got married in the summer of 1994. The groom was not yet 20 years old when the wedding took place, and the bride was only a few years older. They both seemed to be well prepared for family life, however. Their daughter Abigail was born four months after the wedding, in October of that year. Just a year later, the couple welcomed their second daughter, Cassandra. Three years later, their youngest son, Blake, was born. The spouse's early years of family life were peaceful and happy. Young people fell in love, made big plans for the future, raised their families, and organized their homes. All of their children were gifted, grew well, participated in a variety of sports, loved music, and performed in the school drama theater. Kimberly, a homemaker, was constantly raising her voice. She oversaw her school's PT. The young woman also led the scouting group, which included all of her children. In the meantime, the family patriarch founded and expanded his own small cybersecurity company. A few years after their wedding, the family moved to Washington State, and in early 2000, they settled in a small town in Illinois, where they could afford to buy their own large home. Kimberly then decided to pursue a law degree and enrolled in one of the local universities. She received her diploma just a month before the tragedy. At first glance, this family appears to be happy and strong. However, few people were aware that the couple's relationship deteriorated soon after the relocation. Christopher frequently traveled to another state for work, and he developed an affair with a woman named Jill. This relationship lasted approximately a year, and Kimberly eventually became aware of it. A serious scandal erupted within the family. The husband and wife had separated and were getting divorced. However, after weighing all of the pros and cons, the couple decided to stay married for the sake of their children. Husband and wife did their best to pretend that everything was fine, but the tension between them gradually grew. Kim lost trust in her chosen one because she was jealous of him and suspected him of cheating, which proved to be reasonable. On the nervous ground, the young woman began to have health problems. She suffered from anxiety, migraines, insomnia, and blood pressure problems. Kimberly was forced to seek medical attention and was given several medications to treat her condition. She took them for a year and also saw a psychologist with whom she discussed her family's issues. Despite this, Kimberly remained social, friendly, and energetic. Others described her husband as a withdrawn introvert who rarely showed emotion during a fateful trip in June 2007. On the eve of their 13th wedding anniversary, the couple planned a family trip to an amusement park in Springfield, Illinois. Christopher selected the location, and the rest of the family supported his decision. So, in the early hours of June 14, after settling into their SUV, the entire family set out. A few hours later, a passing vehicle picked up the Vaughn family's bloodied head as it drove down the highway. Christopher was wounded in the leg. He calmly reported that he had been shot by his wife, but he couldn't go any further because he allegedly had a sudden memory loss. 
The victim stated that he and his family were driving to an amusement park when his wife became car sick and asked him to pull over. He pulled over to the side of the road and exited the passenger seat to inspect the roof rack. Then he heard a gunshot. Following that, everything unfolded like a horror film. Christopher realized his wife had fired, saw blood running down his leg and fled, unconscious and unaware of the children in the cabin, only to be picked up by a random car. Christopher was unable to locate his SUV, but police discovered it almost immediately. They found four bodies in the car with gunshot wounds, except for Kimberly, who was killed with a single shot to the head. Everyone had been shot twice previously. Christopher admitted that he had a gun at home, which was probably loaded and carried by his wife. Christopher believes she murdered their children, shot him, and then took her own life. While telling this, he did not show much emotion, and even when the police showed him pictures of the deceased family members' bodies during the station interrogation, Bond remained remarkably calm, which could only raise suspicions. Kimberly's parents learned of their daughter and grandchildren's deaths from an impolite reporter who called them at home to inquire about their son-in-law and whether he had harmed their loved ones. During the initial interrogation, everyone insisted that Christopher could not have killed his own family and that the crime was most likely committed by someone else on the road. However, the police officers who witnessed the crime scene had a different perspective from the beginning. They stated that the crime was entirely domestic in nature, with only family members suspected of involvement. Initially, no specific suspect names were given. In subsequent interrogations, the family's surviving head could not recall any new information, but he was confident that his wife could have done it all, killing the children, wounding him, and then shooting herself. Christopher blamed the pills she'd been taking for a year, as well as the crisis in their relationship caused by his infidelity, which they couldn't overcome. Vaughn dismissed the loss of memory caused by being shot, and for the same reason, he did not immediately contact the police or emergency services, instead rushing away, oblivious to the pain in his injured leg. His words sounded unconvincing, but they were insufficient to get Christopher arrested. The family's home was searched, and a couple of laptop computers were taken for inspection. While the preliminary investigation was underway, Christopher remained at large, busy planning his wife's and children's funerals. The funeral was scheduled for June 23 and would take place at one of the city's funeral homes. A large crowd gathered to pay their final respects, and nearly everyone noticed the conflict between the Vaughn and Phillips families. Soon, a police car approached the building. Christopher was arrested shortly before the funeral service began, accused of murdering his family. He remained calm and walked silently with the police. However, his parents were furious about what was going on. They expressed disappointment that their son was not even allowed to say goodbye to his wife and children. While his guilt had yet to be proven, this difficult case had already received widespread media attention. Members of the Vaughn family speculated that Christopher's arrest at the funeral was intended to draw even more public attention. At the same time, the Phillips family was pleased with the results. In an interview, Kimberly's mother expressed relief that her daughter had been cleared of a crime against her children. The investigation questioned Christopher's words from the start, but he stubbornly blamed everything on a lapse in memory, claiming that he couldn't reconstruct the timeline, but he was certain his wife had committed this heinous crime. He was simply fortunate that the bullet struck only the thigh's soft tissues, avoiding the larger vessels. During the investigation, it was discovered that Christopher had his wife's insurance policy, which included a $1 million payout in the event of her death. As the investigation into this case progressed, the police became more convinced that the husband was the primary perpetrator of this terrible tragedy. The investigation lasted more than five years, and Christopher was held in custody throughout. Despite his continued efforts to prove his innocence, Vaughn was charged with several serious offenses, and if convicted, he faced death. As a result, under state law, he was entitled to attorneys paid for by a special fund established to protect people facing the death penalty. Christopher's defense attorneys were thorough in their efforts to shift blame for what happened to his late wife. They discovered that Kimberly had a number of mental disorders that she developed during the marital crisis caused by her husband's infidelity and the resulting health problems. And the drug she was taking allegedly worsened her condition rather than improving it. Lawyers nearly succeeded in proving that the wife took a loaded gun from home on a family vacation, massacred the children, injured her husband, and then shot herself in the head. The evidence and materials presented appeared to support this version, so the case was left to be decided. 
However, the state is currently implementing reforms to abolish the death penalty, and as a result, Chris has lost his lawyers whose work had been funded by the foundation. They requested a quarter million dollars to complete the case, but Vaughn didn't have much money. Christopher was assigned a public defender who had to handle the case from the start and devise a new line of defense. This time, the attempts to exonerate the defendant seemed far less credible. The defendant's personal laptop, which was seized during a home search, contained an unusual and lengthy correspondence with a Canadian resident named Steve Weiland. The two had met on a social networking site about 10 months prior to the tragedy and began corresponding almost daily. Christopher told his new friend that he was deeply unhappy and that his marriage and family life were dragging him down. The men talked about the advantages of living in the wilderness, away from civilization, like hiking, camping, and survival skills in the forest, deserts, and mountains. Vaughn eventually persuaded his new friend to help him fake his own death in order to flee his family. Steve, on the other hand, was opposed to the idea and declined to participate. Chris then stated that he would still abandon his family and city life to flee to a Canadian province where no one could find him. About a month before the tragedy, the accused started writing about a girl named Maya, who he planned to take with him and allegedly loved. The police were able to easily find and bring Maya in as a witness. She turned out to be a dancer at Christopher's favorite strip club, and the two dated for several months. Throughout this time, Christopher complained about his unhappy family life. He once offered to run away with her. But Maya saw this plan as a foolish adventure, so she refused. Vaughn also had an affair with another young dancer to whom he falsely claimed to be single and child-free. I want to impress the girl. He spent a lot of money on her in a short amount of time, and even offered to take her to another country with him. The two girls and their pen pal were called as witnesses at the trial. Their testimony revealed that the defendant intended to flee with one of his mistresses rather than preserving his marriage. Christopher Vaughn's trial began in the fall of 2012 and it received extensive media coverage. Evidence revealed that he had purchased a gun shortly before the tragedy and had gone to shooting ranges several times to practice using it. Notably, the last time he fired at targets was the evening before his family's trip. Experts also discovered that the shot in Christopher's thigh was fired almost at point-blank range, contradicting his claim that his wife shot him when he got out of the car while Kimberly remained inside. Furthermore, the bullet holes in Christopher's jacket prompted numerous questions. According to the prosecutors, such a trace could have been caused by a single bullet fired while he was wearing his jacket. However, this assumption could not be validated. One of the most significant pieces of evidence was Kimberly's bloodstains on her husband's clothing. If Christopher, as he claimed, left the car while his family was still alive, how did his wife's blood, which he claimed she shot herself after he ran for help, get on his clothes and shoes? Furthermore, Kimberly's blood was not found on the murder weapon or on her hands, which would be impossible if she had shot herself in the head with a gun to her chin. However, a drop of her husband's blood was found on her thumb, in addition, Christopher's work computer was used to perform several searches for detailed staging of the crime scene. Kimberly's doctor also testified at the trial, claiming that the young woman suffered from insomnia, headaches, and high blood pressure, for which she was given a variety of medications, but that she had no negative thoughts or intentions to harm herself or others. The defendant was found guilty of all counts associated with such a heinous crime. Christopher received four life sentences, one for each family member, with no chance of ever being released. Shortly after receiving such a harsh sentence, Vaughn unexpectedly stated that he remembered everything from that day in great detail and had not forgotten anything. According to him, shots rang out after he exited the vehicle, but he had no idea what was going on. He then noticed the children's bodies, and then his wife shot him in the leg. She shouted that it was all his fault before shooting him in the head. The convict's new testimony had no bearing on the verdict because it sounded so ridiculous. However, Christopher's parents have actively sought to defend their son in front of the public. For several years, they have appeared on various talk shows, given interviews and written blogs and social media posts about their dissatisfaction with life and how marriage has altered it. They also consistently blame all of the problems on the Phillips family, claiming that their members refused to accept their son-in-law from the start and did everything they could to make his life miserable. 
The Bond family had filed several clemency petitions, hoping that Chris would be acquitted or his sentence commuted. Several such petitions were delivered to the governor of the state. However, after reviewing the case file, he stated that he had no reason to question the court's decision. He advocated for the murder of a whole family. Furthermore, he committed the most heinous crime imaginable, leaving no room for leniency or justification in this case. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On Wednesday, September 14, 2016, a fire broke out early in the morning at a cornwoods near Grapevine Lake in Texas, United States. Firefighters successfully extinguished the fire, and during their investigation, they discovered what appeared to be a melted child's paddling pool with a charred body. The individual's gender could not be determined at that point. A subsequent fingerprint analysis identified the deceased as Jackie Vandergriff, a 24-year-old licensed esthetician studying nutrition at Texas Women's University in Denton. Because she had not been reported missing, law enforcement believes she died shortly after her last known sighting. Jackie was last seen on September 13, one night before her charred body was discovered. That evening, she went to two bars in Denton, Fry Street Public House and Shots and Crafts. Jackie had been mutilated as well as burned. She'd been dismembered. The need to apprehend the perpetrators of such brutality was paramount. Following numerous tips about a man seen near the fire, law enforcement obtained footage of Jackie on the night of September 13. The footage showed her interacting with a man. Further investigation revealed that this man had given his business card to one of the women in the bar that night, claiming to be a fitness instructor and offering his services as a personal trainer. His name was given as Charles Bryant. Jackie and Charles had only met on the night of September 13 through a chance encounter. According to police, Jackie had gone to the bar with the intention of looking for work and meeting someone from Tinder that night, but she changed her plans. While at the bar, she conversed with the bartender and Charles, a 31-year-old man. They eventually joined a group of women and spent time together. Jackie's friends described her as sociable, frequently interacting with people she met on a night out. Charles had been at the Fry Street public house since around 7 p.m., that evening, he had been with friends earlier, but he was alone in the bar when Jackie arrived around 8 p.m. She asked the bartender about job opportunities and lingered for a while, speaking with both him and Charles. The footage obtained by the police from inside the bar suggested that Jackie was having a good time. Surprisingly, just 45 minutes after her arrival, she tweeted, I'm glad I decided to leave Tinder and walk to a bar. Jackie, the bartender, and Charles left the original bar around 9 p.m and went to another nearby establishment. At the next bar, they met a group of women who stayed for about 45 minutes. As inclement weather, including heavy rain, set in, the patrons began making their way home. Jackie then left the bar with Charles and went to the store. This was Jackie's final appearance alive. Charles Bryant had a troubled past, which Jackie was unaware of on that fateful night. In the weeks before their meeting, Charles had been arrested three times. His only reason for being in the Denton area was Caitlin Mathis, his ex-girlfriend, despite living 20 miles away in Hazlet. Charles's ex, Caitlin, had recently moved to Denton to attend the University of North Texas and was living on campus. Caitlin had taken legal action, filing a restraining order against him. Caitlin ended the toxic relationship in August 2016, just a few months before the tragic events unfolded, citing Charles' manipulative behavior and narcissism. Even after Caitlin ended their relationship and relocated to Denton, Charles continued to disrupt her life. Police stopped him on campus, resulting in a ban. After yielding, he kept attempting to communicate with Caitlin. Despite the campus ban, he showed up at the restaurant where she worked on August 31 and at Caitlin's door on September 6. Caitlin refrained from answering, fearing for her safety, and immediately contacted the police. Charles left flowers and a letter on her doorstep prompting authorities to arrest him for trespassing. Charles posted a bond shortly after being arrested, which secured his release. Almost immediately, he contacted Caitlin via a newly created email address, writing, here I am, heartbroken, and with a criminal record for bringing the girl I love flowers. In response to these concerning developments, Caitlin obtained an emergency protective order to protect herself from further harassment and potential harm. Despite previous stalking arrests, Charles continued to attempt to contact Catlin after another stalking arrest. 
He was released on bond two days later. On September 13th, a week after his most recent release, Charles returned to Denton, specifically to the Frey Street public house, which Catelyn frequented. Although law enforcement was aware of Charles and Caitlin's troubled history, there was insufficient evidence linking him to Jackie's murder. While it was determined that he was with Jackie on the night of her death, more evidence was required. The opportunity to question him arose shortly after Jackie's body was discovered, when Charles attempted to contact Catelyn again, violating the restraining order. He was brought in for questioning on September 18, 2016. In the case of Jackie's death, the police had already gathered surveillance footage, interviewed people who were present at the bars, and tracked Charles' movements. Their investigation revealed that on September 14 at 4.41 a.m., Charles went to Walmart and bought a shovel. In addition, a children's paddling pool was discovered missing from his backyard, adding to the concerns surrounding the investigation. When questioned by the police, Charles initially claimed that he had only seen Jackie at the bar. However, as the detective presented a comprehensive and chronological overview of the evidence, it became clear that Charles understood he couldn't deny being with Jackie that night. Eventually, he admitted that Jackie died accidentally while they were together during a consensual but unconventional sexual encounter. Charles told the detective that after they left the bar, Jackie asked him to choke his car with a zip tie. Despite having a zip tie in his vehicle, the police questioned his story, leading to charges of murder and tampering with or fabricating physical evidence against him. The prosecution claimed that Charles and Jackie met that night, went to a second bar, and then returned to his home. During the trial, the medical examiner informed the jury that tests on Jackie's remains found no evidence of sexual assault. The prosecution claimed Jackie's death was not the result of a sexual encounter, but rather of a brutal assault that included strangulation with a zip tie, dismemberment with a knife, and subsequent incineration. According to the prosecution's narrative presented to the jury, the evidence would show that Charles and Jackie met at a bar on September 13th and left together in his car with no one else present. The prosecution emphasized that various pieces of evidence, such as items discovered and DNA testing, would confirm Jackie's presence inside Charles' home. The jury was shown surveillance footage from the bars, and testimonies from bar patrons and employees corroborated the claim that Charles and Jackie were together. The footage showed them leaving the bar at 9, 46 p.m., getting into Charles' car and remaining in the parking lot for another 30 minutes before leaving. Subsequent surveillance footage from a dented gas station showed Jackie inside Charles' car at 10.30 p.m., the last confirmed sighting of her alive. Furthermore, Jackie's phone activity indicated a connection to a cell tower in Hazlitt, Texas, at approximately 1.30 a.m. on September 14th, as well as the area surrounding Charles' residence. The jury learned that Jackie was carrying a Texas Woman's University bag at the bar, and a matching two bag was discovered at Charles' home. A hair-covered zip tie was also discovered in the trash can outside his home. Notably, in Charles' backyard, there was a blue children's paddling pool similar to the one found burned. A circular barren spot near the pool hinted at the presence of another pool. Police discovered a knife inside Charles' home, which they believe was used in Jackie's stabbing and dismemberment, as well as a stun gun in his car. Both items were officially recorded as evidence, during the court proceedings, the medical examiner stated that Jackie died as a result of homicidal violence. It was noted that there was no soot in her airways indicating that she had died, ceased before her body was set ablaze. The medical examiner also testified that Jackie's hyoid bone had fractures as a result of upper neck force. A forensic anthropologist explained to the court that the hyoid bone is a U-shaped bone deep in the throat that acts as an anchor for the tongue. The forensic anthropologist testified that Jackie had a broken hyoid bone and fractured ribs. The injuries were found to be more likely to occur near the time of death and were not related to dismemberment. The anthropologist determined that the hyoid bone injury was consistent with strangulation as it required direct pressure, which is typically caused by manual strangulation or the use of ligatures. However, because Jackie's soft tissue burned during the fire, it was impossible to say definitively whether the fracture was caused manually or by a ligature. The expert agreed that a zip tie could result in such an injury. Furthermore, Jackie sustained a head injury from blunt force trauma that was ruled unlikely to be post-mortem due to significant hemorrhaging stab wounds on her body that appeared unrelated to the dismemberment procedure.
and the state's expert claimed that the wounds appeared to have been inflicted while Jackie was still alive, the expert explained. The fact that there was some bleeding around those stab wounds indicates that she was alive when they were received, so they could have bled. The jury discovered that Jackie's body sustained injuries after her death, including the opening of her chest and the removal of her heart, as well as multiple rib fractures. A DNA profile extracted from the zip tie, stun gun, and knife made it nearly impossible that the sample came from anyone other than Jackie. The DNA analyst testified that DNA analyst testified that DNA was found on the stun gun, recovered from his car, and Jackie could not be ruled out as a major contributor. The defense presented its case, arguing that there was no evidence to support the claim that Jackie's death was caused by Charles' violent actions. Instead, they claimed Jackie died during a consensual sexual act. According to the defense, Charles, in a panic, attempted to dispose of Jackie's body. During the trial, defense witnesses discussed the concept of erotica asphyxiation, claiming that those who engage in such activities derive pleasure from depriving their brains of oxygen. The defense argued that a zip tie was used around Jackie's throat as part of a consensual sexual act, which led to her death. According to their account, Jackie's body went limp, which caused Charles to freak out. The defense argued that the subsequent dismemberment and burning of the body were impulsive and chaotic actions motivated by panic and intoxication. Joette Keen, Charles's attorney, acknowledged in her closing arguments that Charles made a terrible mistake, stating that he is guilty of making a horrible mistake when something goes wrong. There was no reason for a good-looking guy to kill that good-looking girl. In contrast, the prosecution's closing statements called into question the defense's narrative claiming that there was no evidence to support the claim that Charles and Jackie engaged in sexual activity. They dismissed the defense's argument that Charles' panic is illogical, emphasizing the gravity of his actions. The defense claims he freaked out, but their own experts determined it was homicidal violence. Why cut out the heart? What is the significance of body disposal? He slashed her heart out. I want that image to sink in. The jury had to decide whether Jackie was murdered, killed on purpose, or died as a result of a consensual sexual act. They convicted Charles of murder and tampering with evidence. He was sentenced to life in prison for murder and 20 years for tampering. The sentences will be served concurrently. Prior to the trial, there was much speculation as to the possible motive. Prosecutors are concerned if there is no clear motive as jurors prefer to hear a complete story and explanation of what occurred. They must be certain of their verdict before being convicted. And, in many cases, a motive strengthens the prosecution's case. In this case, the prosecution had no motivation. But does it matter? When does the evidence become clear? Do we require a motive? In cases like this, the motivation is usually sexual. However, the prosecution argued that there was no evidence of sexual activity. We don't need to know what went through Charles Bryant's mind that night. Did he want to do it? And he did. Jackie's parents have partnered with Texas Woman's University to establish an endowment in her memory. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Domestic violence was not uncommon at all times and victims frequently choose to silently tolerate this attitude toward themselves and the domestic tyrant, believing his impunity allows him to cross any boundaries. The worst thing about such situations is that children may become victims. The case of young T.L.A. Palmer made headlines across Australia a few years ago due to its extraordinary cruelty and monstrous coincidence of circumstances. When a child from one dysfunctional family moved to another, the situation became even more terrible and cruel. The girl's birth mother, in an effort to protect her only daughter from her tyrant husband, gave her to another family with the best intentions. However, as it turned out, she placed T.L.A. in the hands of death itself. The case in question is quite complex and ambiguous. There were several criminals, all from the same family. At the same time, the investigation determined that nearly all of them were victims of domestic tyranny. And now I'll tell you everything in order. T.L.A. Lissa, Rose Palmer, a girl from a dysfunctional family, was born in a small Australian town Logan City, Queensland, in April 2003. Unfortunately, the girl grew up in less than ideal conditions. The family's head abused hot drinks, and the man was hot-tempered and aggressive. 
He repeatedly beat his wife in front of the child and, on occasion, the daughter herself. The girl was constantly stressed and lived in a state of fear and depression. It is not surprising that she began to flee from home on a regular basis in order to avoid hearing the endless scandals of her parents and coming under the hot hand of the father. We can only speculate as to why the girl's mother, Cynthia Palmer, did not leave the man who abused her and her daughter. However, the young woman decided to give her only child to another family, believing that this would be better. Cynthia later stated that it was a forced measure and that she was deeply sorry for it. However, she was unable to do so at the time because she was held hostage by the circumstances. However, the dysfunctional family's neighbors have a different story. According to some reports, Cynthia is an alcoholic. She attempted treatment, but overcoming addiction was not easy. And after another escape from home, when she was discovered wandering the streets on the other side of the city, the Palmer family became very interested in child protection services. Representatives from the service came to the family home and offered assistance. And Cynthia did not refuse to have her daughter temporarily placed in a foster home given the environment in which the girl was raised. It's no surprise that she grew up to be a difficult teenager with a difficult personality. As a result, finding her a foster family proved difficult. She was always running away, loitering and begging on the streets. She disobeyed her guardians and did everything her own way. TLA did not stay with her first two families for long because her foster parents simply couldn't handle her. She didn't commit any serious crimes, but she was frequently accused of lying. The girl desired the comfort of home, but had no idea what it should be, and any disagreement with the household inevitably resulted in the child's escape from the Thorburn family in early 2015. Kylie appeared to have found her ideal foster family, who were eager to welcome her. Rick and Julia Thorburn, along with their spouses, made up the Thorburn family. We were raising two sons, Josh, who was 19 years old at the time, and Trent, who was barely 18. The family lived in a spacious two-story home with a swimming pool, located in a small country town in Brisbane suburbs. They had their own horse farm, and Julen started a private kindergarten at home that was very popular, and local parents trusted the Thorburns with their children. The family was considered well, off and prosperous, respected in their home state, and trustworthy. Furthermore, they had demonstrated a willingness to accept a troubled teenager into their care, which was unusual. Tiale was placed in a new home in January after Child Protective Services determined that this was the best option for her. At first, everything went as usual. The girl rebelled, refused to live with her guardians, and ran away several times. But each time, the Child Welfare Service found her and returned her. But as the months passed, Kylie appeared to calm down, accept her new family, and get along with them. In reality, however, the outward well-being was hit by a real drama that quickly turned tragic, Ty Lai's mysterious disappearance. The girl attended a local school, which was a few kilometers from her guardian's home, so Kylie's foster father drove her to school every day, and after school she made a lot of new friends who described her as a kind, cheerful, and happy girl. She continued to dream of returning home and maintained contact with her biological mother and grandmother. Tiali occasionally complained of discomfort and even fear without specifying what she was afraid of. On October 30, 2015, Rick drove to school as usual and then returned home to do chores. But he soon received a phone call informing him that his adopted daughter had not shown up for class. No one was particularly concerned because the girl had previously run away, but she usually returned in the evening or the next day. The guardians reported the incident to the police and the search for TLI began almost immediately. All members of the family willingly cooperated with the investigation and claimed that there had been no conflicts between them that could have resulted in a runaway for a long time. Instead, the girl was in good spirits and appeared to be quite happy. According to the family's head, he drove his daughter to school as usual, then returned home and cared for the horses until he received a call from a teacher reporting the girl's disappearance. His wife and sons confirmed these statements. The next day, the door burns set up a social media page dedicated to the search for TLA. They posted information about her photos, the time and circumstances of her disappearance, and a description of what she was wearing that day. The couple asked anyone with information about TLA's whereabouts to contact them or the police, but no one called. Police also searched the family's home in the state but discovered nothing suspicious. 
Although the foster parents' behavior appeared to be calm, they had essentially nothing to charge. Soon, many concerned people joined the search operation, genuinely concerned about the girl's fate. They combed the area using flyers with her photos and interviewed local residents in the hopes of gathering some useful information, a discovery on the riverbank. After a week of unsuccessful searches, the fishermen contact the police and report a terrible fine. According to the men, they went to the Pimpama River in the morning of November 5. However, after barely casting their fishing rods, they noticed something unusual in the swampy shallow water as they came closer. The fishermen were horrified when they realized their discovery was nothing but human remains. The police officers who responded to the call reported that the body was that of a short man, but it was so disfigured that it was impossible to determine the deceased's gender. He had no clothes on, and no personal belongings could be found nearby. The body had numerous injuries that were initially thought to be caused by wild animals in the area. Furthermore, it decomposed rapidly due to heat, moisture, and a large number of insects drawn to the distinctive odor. The gruesome discovery was sent for examination, and it was determined that it was a girl aged between 12 and 16 years old. The police then gathered information on all missing young people recently, and the corpse was quickly identified. It was Tyale Palmer, whom the entire city had been searching for for nearly a week. The cause of death was impossible to determine because the body had been in the water for so long. However, experts speculated that Tyale died from asphyxiation after discovering that her hyoid bone had been crushed. The most horrifying aspect, however, was that the injuries, which were initially thought to be animal bites, could have been caused by a person prior to Tyale's death. Tyale's death was clearly criminal in nature, so a criminal case was opened and a murder investigation was initiated. However, the investigation was moving very slowly because no serious leads have been found yet. This meant that the process could take months, if not years, and result in another unsolved crime. The case quickly became public and nearly a quarter of the city's population came to say goodbye to the deceased girl. People brought flowers, soft toys, and balloons to the memorial service. On November 14, young Tiale's body was cremated. Tiale's birth mother gave a series of interviews to reporters in which he openly accused Child Protective Services of criminal negligence that resulted in the tragic store fires. The Foster family willingly cooperated with the investigation from the start, but their behavior raised some concerns. Rick was supposedly the last person to see the girl alive, but no one could confirm that he actually drove his foster daughter to school on October 30. Spouse and sons claimed to have seen Tiale enter the car. Surveillance cameras along the school route also captured the car driving in that direction. However, no footage of Tiale leaving her guardian's car could be found anywhere. No teachers or classmates saw the girl that day, either at school or on the school grounds. Tiale appeared to have vanished, Investigators had growing doubts that Palmer was even in the car. Family members occasionally aired in their testimony about the events of that day, but insisted that everything was as it had always been, and there was nothing to suggest trouble with the children's secrets. As part of the investigation, dozens of children and teenagers were interviewed, including the deceased's classmates and friends. Everyone spoke highly of her, but they did mention the Tyalee of her. But they did mention that Tai Lai had recently been concerned about something but was unable or unwilling to discuss it. Tia Lai requested temporary shelter from a classmate a few days prior to the tragedy. She claimed she was in trouble and that the guardians would kill her. These statements were not taken seriously and, despite feeling sorry for her, the friend was unable to invite someone to her house for a sleepover without parental permission. The other girl mentioned that Palmer had told her her secret. Trent. The youngest of the Thorburn brothers was her 18-year-old love interest. Furthermore, she boasted that they were romantically involved and would be together in the future. The latter revelation sounded strange because Tia Le was only 12 years old and a relationship with an older brother, even an adopted one, seemed unlikely like a childhood fantasy. Nonetheless, the information she received was definitely something she needed to look into. The Thorburn family members categorically denied all suspicions. They referred to their deceased adopted daughter as a liar who wanted to draw attention to herself, and they suggested that the girl's school friends may have made up something or fantasized. There was no solid evidence to suggest that the Guardians had committed a crime against Hailey, so they remained at large and went about their business as usual. 
Their private kindergarten continued to accept children, the farm thrived, and they did not have to deal with the pain of loss. For several months, the investigation was essentially on the same ground. Local residents with prior convictions were questioned, and those suspected of crimes were investigated. However, the search returned no results, and no new leads appeared. Even the announced high reward for any information about the case did not expedite the process. A parallel search was carried out in the area where TLA's body was discovered. And a month later, under a layer of silt, a backpack and a shoe presumably belonging to the deceased were discovered 150 meters away from where the body was. These items were obviously intended to be discarded so that they would never be discovered. The entire story drew a large public response. The search and investigation results were broadcast on television and published in the press, and city residents organized pickets to demand that the killer or killers be found and punished. The biological mother of the deceased TLA organized some of the tickets. Eventually, the police appealed to potential accomplices of the perpetrator, promising them protection and immunity if they identified the perpetrator or provided any significant information. However, this appeal also went unanswered. In six months, no new clues or avenues of investigation have emerged, despite an anonymous call and a wiretap at the Thorburn residence. It wasn't until the summer of 2016 that police received an anonymous call that altered the course of the investigation. The anonymous caller claimed that the Thorburns were looking for a troubled teen for a reason. They were motivated by a mercantilist interest, as custody of troubled children is compensated with increased allowance. Anonymous also stated that their youngest son most likely had an intimate relationship with TLE, which he had mentioned in passing prior to the tragedy. Of course, this information could have been false. However, detectives remembered that they had previously heard from the deceased's high school friend that TLA and her named brother may have had an affair. The investigators decided not only to take a closer look at Trent, but also to examine him thoroughly. The interrogations yielded no results because the guy and his family members insisted on their nine involvement, claiming that the girl fled and then got into trouble. The family's social media pages were quietly examined and one of the chat rooms in trans profile revealed an unusual correspondence. Approximately a month and a half before the tragedy, he told his cousin that he had an intimate relationship with a girl much younger than him, but he did not reveal her name. Of course, the dialogue on social media could not become incontrovertible evidence, but it did allow the police to obtain permission to install listening devices in the Torburn house, albeit without their knowledge. The wiretaps yielded shocking results within the first few days, on the recordings, family members could be heard meticulously rehearsing their versions of events, ensuring that their stories matched in every detail. The family had taught his household what to say and how to behave, and from the mother's mouth came such phrases as dad made this decision to save, will have to live with it, never, ever tell anyone or anything, regardless of what happens. Rick threatened his family members several times, and while it was clear that they were afraid of him because they knew his father could turn words into action at any time, there was still insufficient direct evidence. However, the Thorburn Blue Card, which granted them permission to work with children, was revoked almost immediately, forcing the private kindergarten to close. The wiretap quickly confirmed that the youngest of the brothers had been intimate with Tiale. In fact, it had been happening on a regular basis for several months before he informed his mother in October that Tyle was pregnant. If Trent's suspicions had been correct, he would have been sentenced to prison for having an affair with Tyle. Julia told her husband everything, and Rick decided to take action. Julia and her sons arrived in Brisbane early on the day of the tragedy, ostensibly for business. It was supposed to serve as an alibi for them, so Rick stayed at home with his adopted daughter. When the mother and heirs returned home in the evening, it was already known that the girl had gone missing, and the family's head claimed to have solved the problem without providing any details, including arrest and investigation. Based on the information obtained, all members of the family decided to re-interview, and the police decided to search Rick's car, in which he allegedly drove his adopted daughter to school on the day she vanished. And it turned out that the car was sold almost immediately following the tragedy. The vehicle was located and a thorough inspection revealed old washed out traces of blood in the trunk. DNA analysis revealed that the blood belonged to Tialai, who had been murdered. After that, any remaining doubts were dispelled and the Thor Burns were taken into custody. 
They were questioned separately, with Trent being the first to speak. It turned out that he had duped Tiale into seducing him by telling her about his feelings and promising that they would always be together. She fell completely in love with him, believed him, and even boasted to her school friends that she was in a real relationship. However, when she became suspicious of the pregnancy, she realized that the foster father could literally kill her and began to ask her classmates to take her in, at least for a while. Rick fought the longest, but was put under pressure by evidence and testimony from his family members. He confessed to killing his foster daughter, claiming he was only trying to protect his family. He had strangled her severely and disfigured her body in the hopes that no one would ever identify him. Rick didn't consider the possibility of DNA testing when the head of the family was formally charged with first-degree murder. He collapsed and was rushed to the hospital with a heart attack. Their doctors concluded that he had caused the attack himself by taking a large dose of powerful drugs. They fought for his life for several days so that the perpetrator could face trial and receive a just punishment. The entire country followed each family member's trial and sentencing, as well as the investigation and trial, because the Tiale Palmer case became one of the most publicized and cruel in the last decade. Each member of the Thorburn family was found guilty, but many believe their sentences were too lenient. For example, Josh, the eldest son, was sentenced to just three months in prison for perjury and attempting to obstruct the investigation. The court considered his genuine remorse and the fact that he was a key witness against his father and younger brother during the trial. Julia Thorburn was sentenced to one and a half years in prison for perjury and harboring her husband and son. At trial, she admitted that she was terrified of her husband and believed he could murder her and her son. The youngest of the brothers was sentenced to four years in prison, which many children believe is too light a punishment for seducing Taya Lai. Perjury and Obstruction of the Investigation in fact, the young man served just over a year before being released early. The head of the family who treated Tylai the most brutally was sentenced to life in prison. He pleaded guilty to all counts and expressed deep regret for his actions. Rick repeatedly stated that he was motivated by the desire to protect his family, but he does not understand how he could commit such a crime. Following the final verdict, Tiali's birth mother gave an interview in which she stated that none of the punishments for her daughter's killers were harsh enough. However, the day of the verdict signals the end of her quest for justice. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On Saturday, June 28, 2014, Erin Corwin, 19, informed her husband Jonathan John Corwin that she planned to hike some trails in Joshua Tree National Park. Her mother, Laura Evelyn, was due to visit the following week, and Aaron expressed a desire to go on some walks together. Aaron and John had been married for over a year and had known each other since fifth grade when they met in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. When Aaron turned 16, John asked her parents and Bill for permission to date her, and they agreed. John appeared to be a good match for their daughter, with gentlemanly characteristics. The couple married in November 2012 and moved to California in September 2013. John lives at the 29 Palms Marine Base, where he served as a Marine. Two other young couples, Connor and Isley Malachi, live next door to John and Aaron, sharing a downstairs apartment with their son Brian, while Chris and Nicole Lee Lee lived next door with their daughter Liberty. Aaron and John had a difficult start to 2014 as Aaron miscarried. Seeking solace, she volunteered at the White Rock Horse Rescue Ranch, where she cared for horses and made friends. Erin discovered she was pregnant again in April 2014, which excited John on the morning of June 28. When Erin left early, John expected her to return later in the day. However, as the day went on without her, he contacted her best friend to inquire about her whereabouts, but she had no idea. Concerned. John reported Aaron missing to the police on the morning of June 29, claiming she had left around 6 or 7 a.m. on June 28 to explore some trails. He mentioned that she had expressed love before leaving, and he returned to sleep after seeing her off. Aaron has not communicated since then. When John informed Aaron's parents about her disappearance, their first concern was that she might be lost in the vast desert. Without provisions, you will face harsh conditions. Military troops joined the search, conducting a massive operation across 300 rugged acres of desert. 
The San Bernardino Sheriff Search and Rescue Team worked with Nancy's agents to navigate the treacherous terrain, which included over 1,000 abandoned mines. Questions arose about John's decision to wait 24 hours before reporting Aaron missing. He then underwent a polygraph test, which he passed, allowing the police to rule him out as a suspect. Aaron's car was discovered 20 to 30 miles east of the military base, parked quite far from the Joshua Tree National Park entrance. Authorities were perplexed as to why Aaron did not park closer if she intended to explore the nearby trails. Notably, shoe prints were discovered leading from the driver's side of Aaron's vehicle to a location where investigators suspected another car had been parked. The question arose, had Aaron gotten into another vehicle? According to John's information, Aaron intended to go alone that day and had not mentioned meeting anyone else. Lore, Aaron's mother, contacted one of her best friends, Jessica, who revealed that Aaron had planned a special date at Joshua Tree National Park on June 28th. Aaron was secretly having an extramarital affair, which shocked her. It seemed at odds with Aaron's apparent devotion to John, as she had written him love letters and poems. Jessica informed the authorities that Aaron intended to meet Chris Lee, a Marine living next to John, and that Aaron lived with his wife Nicole and their six-year-old daughter. When police approached Chris and asked about Aaron's whereabouts, he initially claimed he didn't know her well and that they had only exchanged brief greetings. Chris claims that on the day Aaron went missing, he was coyote hunting near Gold Crown Road and had no contact with her. The police then brought Chris to the station for further questioning. Following a series of questions, Chris admitted to having a close relationship with Aaron, acknowledging that they were romantically involved. However, he claimed that their physical interactions were limited to kissing and no sexual intercourse occurred. Despite his familiarity with Aaron, Chris insisted that he was unaware of her current location. Chris was released from police custody without being charged. The search for Aaron persisted. But, given the large number of mines in Joshua Tree National Park and its surroundings, hope faded. Aaron's remains were discovered on August 16th, nearly two months after she disappeared. A caver alerted by a strong gasoline odor investigated one of the mines and discovered Aaron's body within. A tire, a homemade torch, and a bottle of Sprite sat beside her. The autopsy determined that Aaron's death was a homicide, with strangulation as the cause. She was choked to death with a homemade garret, and her body was dropped 250 feet down the rows of the Peruman shaft while the garret remained around her neck. Police discovered a propane tank inside the mine, indicating an attempt to burn her body. Because of Aaron's advanced state of decomposition, it was impossible to say for certain whether she was pregnant. The garret found around Aaron's neck was made from two rebar handles and paracord. The autopsy revealed several skull fractures, one of which happened shortly before or during her death. In addition, fractures to her left collarbone and left rib were discovered shortly before or during her death. The remaining skull fractures were caused post-mortem, most likely during the process of dragging or throwing her into the mine. DNA testing on the items discovered alongside Aaron's body in the shaft produced significant results. Chris's DNA was discovered on the shirt tied around the torch, and the Sprite bottle, which still had the lid on, contained both Chris's and Aaron's DNA. Chris was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. With the added circumstance of lying in wait, Chris pleaded not guilty to the charges following his arrest. The prosecution claimed that Aaron and Chris were having an affair, and when Aaron discovered she was pregnant, she confided in Chris. According to police, Chris, unwilling to jeopardize his relationship with his wife, considered a drastic solution to the problem, murder Aaron. The prosecution claimed that Chris meticulously claimed that Chris meticulously planned the murder over several weeks, researching effective methods for disposing of a body. He had a plan in place. He allegedly enticed Aaron to the desert and killed her with a garret he had brought with him. They claimed that the murder was premeditated. During Chris's arrest, officers discovered two spools of paracord and a blue climbing rope in his car. The paracord matched the cord around Aaron's neck. Aaron had told her friend Jessica that Chris was the baby's father and that she loved him more than John. She even expressed a desire to move to Alaska, Chris's hometown, to be with him. The court heard that their affair became public in April 2014, when their neighbor Islington saw them kissing. Nicole informed John, who confronted Chris, explicitly stating that he did not want to see him near Aaron again. During the trial, 
Islington testified for the prosecution, stating that Chris frequently discussed murder, mentioning it more than I can count. She remembered him talking about hiding a body in the desert corner. Ling's husband also testified that Chris had discussed murder with him. Just a few weeks before Aaron disappeared, Chris allegedly told Connor that if you put a body in a fire with tires, it will disintegrate and that they would be unable to find anything. Another Marine, Andrew Johnson, testified about his conversation with Chris in June 2014. Chris reportedly inquired about nearby chloride plants, specifically how a body could be destroyed using chemicals found there. Chris also inquired about the presence of security cameras in those locations. Andrew stated that he did not find the conversation unusual at the time because his experiences in Afghanistan had desensitized him, and he knew Chris felt the same way. The court learned that a propane tank and a tire were discovered inside the mine shaft, next to Aaron's body. The prosecution informed the court that Chris borrowed a propane tank from a horse ranch, and a fellow Marine discovered one in Chris's car on the morning of June 28. When questioned, Chris allegedly told the Marine he planned to blow up a mine shaft. The jury was presented with compelling evidence about the DNA found on the shirt and Sprite bottle, as well as incriminating Google searches like how to dispose of a body. The prosecution urges the jury to consider these elements and convict Chris, claiming that the evidence strongly points to him as the sole person responsible for Aaron's death. They urge the jury to investigate Chris's actions, including previous conversations, research, and the weapons he brought to determine whether the murder was premeditated. In a significant turn, Chris may have recognized the weight of the evidence against him and initially pleaded not guilty. He later recanted during the trial and admitted to Aaron's murder. However, he claimed that the action was impulsive rather than planned. This admission complicated the trial, forcing the jury to consider the degree of premeditation in Chris's actions leading up to Aaron's tragic death. The defense presented its case by admitting Chris was responsible for Aaron's death. In contrast to his previous denials, Chris now admits to having a sexual relationship with Aaron. The defense told the jury that Chris, wanting to save his marriage, but unwilling to let go of Aaron, planned to meet her on June 28 to discuss their situation. According to Chris, the original plan was for Aaron and others to go hunting, but when the others were unable to attend, the meeting became an opportunity for a private conversation. Chris claimed that on that day, he planned to blow up a mine shaft with tires. In preparation, he brought gasoline and diesel fuel to the desert, as well as a propane tank. He described how he threw these materials into his mind, realizing he had used up all of the gasoline for God to apply to apply to the torch. When he realized he couldn't carry out the plant explosion, he also discarded the torch in his mind. This according to Chris, these items were discovered inside the mine shaft. The defense called only one witness, Chris, who claimed that Aaron occasionally babysat his daughter. According to Chris, during their time in the desert together, Aaron discussed their future as a family and expressed a desire to care for his daughter. Chris described an incident in which his wife Nicole expressed concern for their daughter's well-being, implying that Aaron may be engaging in inappropriate behavior. In response to these concerns, Chris claimed that he confronted Aaron while they were in the desert and asked her directly, Have you ever touched Liberty? Have you molested my daughter? According to Chris's testimony, Aaron's admission to touching his daughter elicited a strong emotional response. He described feeling an overwhelming surge of hatred and rage, as if someone had rammed a red-hot knife into his heart. During this intense emotional turmoil, Chris claimed to have picked up a garret from his car. I felt so much hatred and rage. I grabbed it, stood up and noticed she had turned around at some point. I couldn't think clearly. I just felt a lot of hatred, and I came up behind her, put it around her neck, and my training kicked in. Then I turned around and began pulling, but I couldn't pull hard enough because I was so angry. Chris went on to explain, I just continued choking her. I'm not sure how long it was. It could have been five minutes or 10 minutes. It seemed like forever, and I just kept choking her. After Aaron stopped moving, Chris admitted to using the garret to drag her body to the mine shaft's edge and push her inside. The defense asks the jury to find him, not guilty of first, degree murder based on his claim that he did not intend to kill Aaron and only killed her in the heat of the moment. The prosecution strongly contested Chris's defense, claiming that it was a fabrication. The emphasis emphasizes that no one had previously expressed concern about Aaron's behavior. 
The alleged abuse was not reported to police, and Chris and his wife did not seek medical attention for their daughter as a result of the alleged abuse. The prosecution claimed that Chris made up this story during the trial in order to get a lesser charge of involuntary manslaughter with the expectation of a shorter prison sentence due to the overwhelming evidence against him. The prosecutor pointed out that Chris only admitted his involvement in front of the jury, implying a calculated move for attention. The prosecutor addressed Chris directly, saying, you chose to do it in front of the jury. It's about you, you sought attention. Ultimately, the jury did not believe Chris's defense. They quickly returned a guilty verdict for first-degree murder with a special circumstance. Chris was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole after a 15-minute trial. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Beautiful, wealthy, famous and successful women can be deeply unhappy in their personal lives. The Turkish arabesque performer Belgian Cyril Miser, also known as Bergen, was tortured by her husband for many years. She is a well-known figure in Turkey and around the world. He beat her, disfigured her face with acid, and eventually shot her. Our heroine today is Edith Rosario Bermeo Cisneros, an Ecuadorian performer, television actress, music producer, and lingerie designer also known as Sharon La Hechiquera, or simply Sharon, through her own hard work, perseverance, and talent. She has risen to heights beyond imagination, becoming one of Ecuador's and Latin America's top stars. Karen wished for simple female happiness, family comfort, and a peaceful harbor to which she could return every evening and simply be herself. But the man she loved, her husband and the father of her child, saw in her only an endless source of funds for his trouble, free and carefree existence. This man was ultimately responsible for the death of the nation's favorite in 2015. However, despite widespread publicity, the final point in this high-profile case has yet to be resolved. Sharon lacks a biography from her early years. The future star was born on March 28, 1974, in Santiago de Guayaquil, a large metropolis. Located on the Gaias River in Ecuador's province, the girl's full name was given at birth. Sounds like Edith Rosario Bermeo Cisneros. She grew up in a simple, modest family with two other children. Soon after her daughter's birth, the entire family relocated to Duran, where the future queen of techno, Cumbia, spent her childhood and youth. Edith was a bright, active, and artistic girl from a young age. At home, she was affectionately known as Charo or Cherito, and this nickname later became part of her stage name. Edith grew up watching the popular American comedy television show B with another name, My Wife Bewitched Me. Her idol and object of imitation was the show's main star, cult actress Elizabeth Montgomery. Then the same girl changed her name to Charo, Enchantress, and aspired to replicate her favorite actress's success. She has always been interested in music and enjoys singing. She had a good musical ear and decent vocal data, but calling them outstanding was difficult. Nonetheless, the girl won over everyone with her natural charm, artistry, and ability to reincarnate. At the age of eight, she won the City Children's Festival by performing Foxing Taiko compositions in Los Angeles. By the time she graduated from high school, she had won numerous awards in local and regional music competitions. She aspired to be a famous singer and perform on stage, but her parents were skeptical. They believed that the heiress lacked the talent to become a star and that because their family had no connections in the entertainment industry, a career as a performer was not worth pursuing. Edith, following the advice of her family, decided to attend university, pursuing a more practical and down-to-earth career as a public relations specialist at the State University of Guayaquil's Faculty of Communication Sciences. Her dream of becoming a singer, however, remained unfulfilled. He believes that everything has a time and that she should wait a little before pursuing the most appropriate path to fame. While attending university, Edith worked as an assistant teacher and kindergarten teacher, a seller of sweets and maroca, a traditional Ecuadorian drink, and a dancer in the local creative team, performing as a warm-up act for visiting popular artists and musical groups. But all of this was just to save money. 
which he later used to record her debut music album, Braveheart, which was released in 1998. In 2005, the singer released her third studio album and received the prestigious award for being the first solo techno cumbia artist in the country to top the music charts. In 2010, she released her fourth album, Poco a Poco. Two years later, her fifth album was released, which unfortunately became the last in her life and career from the early 2000s until her untimely death in 2015. Sharon was the author, host and co-host of numerous entertainment programs and TV shows broadcast on TV channels in Ecuador and other Latin American countries. She has appeared in several television series and has worked as a public relations specialist for Canela TV. In addition to a successful career in music and television, he has decided to try her hand as a fashion designer, creating seductive lingerie from her own sketches. And in this case, she waited for success, and the brand she created quickly gained popularity among women across America. Sharon was not interested in doing whatever business. She was successful in every way, reaching new heights and receiving recognition. Personal life of the performer. Despite her dizzying success on stage, television, and in the fashion industry, one of Ecuador's most prominent stars had a less than idyllic personal life. She disliked discussing this topic with the press and avoided answering such questions from journalists at all costs. However, Sharon La Haxera was constantly in the crosshairs of numerous photo and video cameras, making hiding anything from prying eyes impossible. It is known that in the mid-1990s, the aspiring performer was romantically involved with Eduardo Gray, an entrepreneur and music producer. The couple had been officially engaged for several years, but the wedding did not take place. Although Edith gave birth to a daughter from her lover, whom she named Samantha, the daughter inherited her mother's entrepreneurial spirit and artistry, becoming a well-known performer and actress. Despite her best efforts and connections, she was unable to surpass her mother. Sharon began a new romance shortly after her breakup with Eduardo. This time, her chosen one was a little-known television operator, whom she met while working on a telenovelia. Their relationship grew quickly, and after a brief engagement, the couple held a modest wedding, attempting to conceal the event from others. However, the information quickly became public, and the marriage itself lasted only a short time. The performer preferred to remain silent on the reasons for his sudden divorce. Later on, the artists had romantic relationships with a well-known impresario named Pedro Francisco, a young ballet dancer who performed with her on stage, and some of her star colleagues. Unfortunately, none of these romances progressed to a serious level, and Sharon ended her relationship with her boyfriend for various reasons. The performer declined to comment on the events in her personal life. She raised a career, oriented daughter, but still hopes to find a worthy, loving man in her life. Relationship with Giovanni Lopez In 2009, the performer met Giovanni Lopez, a young man who was more than 10 years her junior. He was born in Ecuador but moved to the United States with his parents when he was a young child. The family settled in New York City, where Giovanni spent most of her childhood and adolescence. They first met during the singer's large tour in the United States. But at the time, their communication was limited to work, and Lopez assisted in the organization of Sharon's performance. Even so, these two have most likely developed some sympathy for one another. Furthermore, it turned out that the young man was a longtime fan of the Queen of Technocumbia, and he was thrilled to have the opportunity to work with her directly. A year later, Giovanni decided to return to his native Ecuador. He brought with him designs he had created for artists, including one for Sharon specifically. So began their collaboration, and almost immediately a stormy romance developed between them. At the start of this relationship, the performer was already 36 years old, while Giovanni was only 24. However, the 12-year age difference did not embarrass them, and the couple was unconcerned about what others would think of them or how the media would write about them. Almost immediately, the lovers moved in and decided to live together. However, it should be noted that the performer's parents and daughter treated her new chosen one with caution, and Giovanni immediately disliked it and they concluded that the young man's twisted romance with the star was solely for selfish reasons, and that he did not love her at all, but only wanted to use her. Sharon ignored the warnings of loved ones because he believed he had met the most important man in his life, with whom he would share many happy years. Soon after the couple married, they began to consider the birth of a common heir. However, 
They encountered a problem because the performer was unable to become pregnant. As a result, she decided to use in vitro fertilization, and in May 2012, the 38-year-old celebrity gave birth to a boy named Brian Giovanni Lopez. The abusive relationship Giovanni, they only tried to be a caring and loving man on whom you could rely on everything. However, as soon as the couple married and the performer became pregnant, the young husband's behavior began to change dramatically, and he literally transformed into a domestic tyrant. He no longer sought to earn money independently, and he was content with his position as an Alphonse. He willingly spent his wife's money on his own needs, entertainment, expensive clothes, and personal grooming. Lopez also began to abuse alcohol and appeared less and less frequently at home, preferring to spend time with friends and mistresses. To all of this, Giovanni began to openly insult his wife, pointing to her age and fading beauty. According to some reports, as a result of his offensive statements and remarks, Sharon decided to undergo a number of plastic surgeries in order to maintain her youth and resemble her husband. In particular, the performer enlarged her breasts and performed a number of cosmetic manipulations. However, all of her efforts were in vain and did not contribute to the restoration of family peace and harmony. The Queen of Techno Cumbia continued to work actively, starring in TV series, hosting entertainment shows, and preparing material for a new album. She tried to smile in public, claiming that she was finally content in her personal life. However, only people close to her knew about how things were really going in her family. In early 2014, when little Brian was not yet two years old, the artist made the first serious attempt to end the relationship with Giovanni, but he said that he would agree to give a divorce only if Sharon would give him half of his property and funds in her bank accounts so that he could continue to lead an idle and carefree lifestyle to which he was used. Sharon could not agree to these terms, so she began consulting with lawyers about how to end the marriage while keeping the property and full custody of their joint young son. By the end of the year, family life had become unbearable, but the couple continued to appear happy in public. One final family trip. On the eve of the new year 2015, the performer gave a number of festive concerts, and she also starred alongside her star colleagues in several dedicated Christmas and New Year's events. After that, exhausted by her work, the young woman decided to take a small vacation to the warm coast with her friends, husband and son to relax a little and try to gather her thoughts before deciding what she should do next. On the evening of January 3, 2015, the entire company decided to return. Because the journey was going to be long and they were driving, the friends decided to follow each other and stay in constant contact in case anyone needed assistance. They decided to pre-plan all of their stops along the way. Sharon had to drive the car at evening because her husband had consumed alcoholic beverages throughout the day. After a few hours, the company stopped at a gas station and decided to eat dinner in a roadside cafe. During the meal, the singer and her young husband got into a heated argument because Giovanni ordered another drink. Despite his earlier promise not to drink and drive, he allowed Sharon to rest and spend time with the child. The couple argued for about 30 minutes and couldn't agree on who would drive the car. Finally, their friends couldn't take it and asked if they could go on their way. The singer stated that she did not want to delay them due to family issues, so they could continue, and he and Giovanni would need to stay a little longer. The friends reluctantly agreed, and after another half hour, drove away, leaving the couple at a roadside cafe. They had no idea Sharon would die before they saw her again. Strange accident. On January 4, around half past 2 a.m., the friends received a phone call from an agitated Giovanni, who asked them to return because there had been an accident and Sharon might have died. His words were shocking because he did not provide specifics, making it impossible to determine what had occurred on the night road. By the time they returned, emergency services were already on the scene, attempting to assist the victim and reconstruct the sequence of events. According to Giovanni, at around 1, 15 a.m., on the highway to Del Spondilis, near the Ecuadorian province of Santa Elena, his wife got out of the car to comfort her crying son and change his diaper. At that point, another car smashed into her at high speed. Without stopping, this car sped away from the accident scene. The young woman was thrown a few dozen meters to the side of the road by the impact. When the ambulance arrives, she was still alive. She has been taken to the hospital. Despite the doctor's best efforts, Sharon died of massive injuries and internal bleeding. Giovanni was still drunk and confused during his testimony and his testimony, 
and his story sounded strange and illogical. As a result, the police decided to detain him until the morning so that they could question him thoroughly. When he had come to his senses, Lopez confirmed the words of friends that he and his wife argued all evening and admitted that, despite his wife's promises and prohibitions, he defiantly drank alcohol in order not to drive and piss off Sharon Giovanni's testimony. He did not see the license plate number of the car that hit his wife, wife. He didn't remember the mate and only mentioned that the car was white. There were no CTV cameras along that stretch of road. No witnesses could be found and the accident itself appeared suspicious because Sharon did not even turn to the side of the road before leaving the cabin and did not ensure her safety. Although any vehicle on a straight, deserted road can be seen and heard from afar even at night, the longer the police tried to correlate all of the facts with Lopez's story, the more it resembled a premeditated murder. Giovanni was confused about the timing and chronology of events and could not recall details. Most interestingly, he couldn't explain why their car was facing the opposite direction of the road they were on. Following another interrogation, the deceased singer's husband was arrested as the primary suspect in her death, the autopsy results, and Sharon's funeral. The autopsy revealed that the deceased woman's body had numerous injuries consistent with a traffic accident. However, experts discovered a clear and fairly deep mark on Sharon's chest that could have been caused by a seatbelt. This fact raised additional questions and suspicions. Samantha, who spent the New Year's holidays with her boyfriend, was stunned when she learned about the tragedy from singer Sonia Ramos, a close friend and colleague of her mother. She called her father, Eduardo Gray, and asked him to come to her as soon as possible so that they could go to Sharon's house together and start planning the funeral. After making all the necessary preparations, the celebrity's body was transported to the Coliseum Voltaire Paladins Polo in the province of Guayaquil. Thousands of Ecuadorian friends, colleagues, and fans gathered to say goodbye to one of the brightest stars. Furthermore, this sad event was covered in all of the country's leading publications, and it was even announced on television one morning. Samantha, overcome with grief, sobbed on her father's shoulder, surrounded by her grandmother, grandfather, uncle, and aunt. The deceased celebrity's family refused to comment on what had occurred. None of them directly accused Giovanni of what happened, but they all demonstrated their disapproval of him through an investigation and a surprising court decision. The case was among the most high profile in Ecuador's history. It received extensive media coverage and jeopardized the reputation of the country's judicial system. The initial verdict literally shocked the celebrity's relatives and fans, and the case's revision was so delayed that the final point in this matter has yet to be resolved. So the white car, which presumably hit the artist, was discovered a few days later. The car had characteristic damage, which experts have determined could have resulted from an accident. If you hit someone at high speed, the owner of the vehicle is a young woman named Tatiana Chavez, who has categorically denied any involvement in the accident. However, the prosecutor's office has opened criminal cases against Tatiana for negligent homicide and Giovanni Lopez for premeditated murder. His story sounded extremely unconvincing. He was confused and contradicted himself before recognizing the car and even claiming to have seen the driver, only to doubt his own words by referring to alcohol intoxication. In parallel, the deceased's daughter and parents issued a statement blaming the singer's husband for the incident. They believe he never loved Sharon and committed the murder to seize her money in custody of the child. Samantha stated that her mother had discussed the dissolution of their marriage with lawyers shortly before the tragedy. Samantha also stated that her younger brother, who was the only witness to the incident, cries all the time and repeats, Daddy is bad. However, they did not involve the child as a witness in order to spare the boy further psychological trauma. After a detailed reconstruction of the events of that evening, Tatiana was ruled out as a suspect. By comparing the times and locations where Tatiana had been seen before and after the accident, it was determined that she could not have been physically near the accident site at that time, and her car had been damaged in another accident. The other car was soon identified as the one that struck Sharon. Louis Carrillo, the owner and driver that night, was arrested. By that point, he had already replaced the broken headlight and repaired other body damage. However, experts were able to determine that at the scene of the accident, Shards of glass from his car were discovered. Lewis admitted to everything and stated that Sharon literally fell under the wheels of his car and he was so scared of what had happened that he simply drove away. 
Giovanni was convicted of manslaughter against his wife in June 2015. Experts determined that the woman's chest injury from the seatbelt was caused by her attempting to protect herself before her husband pushed her out of the car, directly under the wheels of another vehicle. However, Sharon's relatives and fans were taken aback by the court decision. Because her killer was only sentenced to three years in prison, he is seeking a retrial and appealing the new verdict. Such a lenient sentence sparked a media frenzy and prompted widespread protests across the country. People demanded just punishment for the murder of a celebrity and national favorite. Already in July of that year, the judges involved in the case were suspended and later dismissed. The new judicial staff overturned the previous verdict, citing a number of administrative and bureaucratic errors. All defense lawyers' attempts to challenge the reversal of the verdict were unsuccessful. Louis Carrillo was cleared of any responsibility for the singer's death, but he was charged with fleeing the scene and attempting to conceal evidence. But Giovanni Lopez was brought to every court session under heavy security to avoid attacks on him by Sharon fans. In October 2015, the singer's husband was found guilty of her death and sentenced to 26 years in prison. The court also considered Samantha's evidence of Giovanni's cruel treatment of her mother, as well as the fact that he blackmailed his wife by demanding a large sum of money in exchange for her consent to divorce. A few months later, two appeals were filed simultaneously. The prosecution demanded that the sentence be increased to the maximum of 35 years, while the lawyers argued that the new sentence was legal. However, both complaints were dismissed. In 2021, Lopez attempted to appeal the court's decision. In addition, he claimed that he was mistreated in prison and that his rights were violated severely. The prisoner even went on hunger strike to persuade the court to release him. He claimed that he was wrongfully convicted while the primary perpetrator of the tragedy, Luis Guerrero, remained free. Giovanni appealed again in 2023, this time with a new lawyer, in the hopes of securing his release. It is worth noting that in this difficult case, the judge's composition was changed once more due to the revealed abuse of power. As a result, Lopez's defense team hopes to not only challenge the verdict, but also seek compensation for the years he spent in prison. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. It was the 3rd of November, 2006. Justine Abshir, 27, was in the honeymoon period of her marriage as a newlywed. She had much to look forward to. Justine wanted to have children. Justine adored her husband of just five months, Eric Abshir, who had two children from a previous relationship. They met in 1999 while both working at Loa's home improvement store. Justine was a cashier and Eric was her manager. She was only 20 years old. He was 26 and informed her that he had two young daughters. Following Eric's military service in the Marines, they married, and he started his own hauling business driving a dump truck. Justine also found a suitable position as a kindergarten teacher at Emerald Hill Elementary in Culpeper, Va. Justine went to work on November 3, but her colleagues noticed something was wrong. They noticed her seemingly swollen eyes and assumed she was crying. Justine, on the other hand, assured them that her condition was the result of allergies. Later that day, while pursuing her master's degree at UVA, she ran into her classmates again. She arrived 30 minutes late and wore sunglasses inside. When the class ended at 7 p.m., Justine left immediately. Her co-workers had no idea that it would be the last time they saw her. A distressing 911 call was received at 1.57 a.m. from Taylorsville Road in Barbersville, Virginia, reporting a hit and run. When the police arrived, they found Eric in a state of hysteria, cradling his lifeless wife, Justine, in the middle of the road. Unfortunately, Justine had died as a result of a car accident. Eric told the police that Justine called him at 1, 19 a.m. to report a car breakdown and request assistance. She was approximately five miles from their home. Eric jumped on his motorcycle and rushed to the location she specified, only to find her lying on the road. Eric sat with Justine, covering her with his jacket, before setting out to find help. He approached several nearby houses and knocked on doors, hoping to find help. At 1, 57 a.m., one of the homeowners called 911. Eric later admitted to the police that he had his cell phone in his pocket, but he hadn't realized it at the time. 
while on paper. Initially, the scene appeared to be a hit and run case. That viewpoint shifted very quickly. The police investigation revealed a lack of typical evidence related to a hidden run on Taylorsville Road in Barbersville, Virginia. Despite her severe injuries, Justine and her clothing showed no broken glass, skid marks, tire marks, debris, or blood. This absence led authorities to suspect that her death was not the result of a random collision, but rather of a deliberate act. The situation becomes even more complicated. Despite Eric's claims of mechanical problems, the police discovered that Justine's car was in good working order with no defects. This inconsistency raised questions about the veracity of Eric's account. Justine was very close to her parents. Haiti and Stephen Swartz, as well as her sister, Lauren Swartz, and they were devastated when Eric's brother called to tell them that Justine had died. Their shock and devastation turned into confusion. They knew Justine well. She was afraid of the darkness. She was even described as afraid of her own shadow, so they couldn't understand why she would choose to drive alone at night. The perplexity grew when her body was discovered 600 feet away from her car, which contained her purse, coat, and keys. This raised questions about why she would leave these belongings and walk away from the vehicle, especially after calling Eric to come and pick her up. Only two days after Justine's memorial service, an important revelation occurred. Heidi Justine's mother entered a restaurant and burst into tears. Sensing Heidi's distress, a compassionate restaurant employee offered to help, prompting Heidi to tell the heartbreaking story of Justine, the kindergarten teacher who was killed by a car. To Heidi's surprise, the woman revealed an astonishing fact. Justine had not died in a hit and run. She had been murdered and her husband, Eric, was the primary suspect. It turned out that some people believe Eric was involved in Justine's death. When questioned by the police, Eric gave a detailed account of the evening claiming that everything was normal. According to him, Justine returned home after 7 p.m. and he arrived shortly thereafter. He mentioned being with Justine for a while before getting a call from Martha Jefferson Hospital, where his ailing mother was. The call brought the distressing news of his mother's deteriorating health. Eric told the police that he returned to the hospital and remained there until 11.30 p.m. He did not return home immediately. Instead, he went to their storage unit on Route 33 in Rockfordville and stored his motorcycle. Eric left his car in the storage unit, took out his motorcycle and went riding. He told the cops he wanted to clear his mind. According to Eric's account, he returned home around 12.30 a.m. when Justine was awake and ready to talk. However, an argument arose between them when Justine wanted to discuss his mother's health, which Eric was hesitant to discuss. He informed the cops that he felt the need for solitude. In response, Justine allegedly said, well, maybe I need to be alone too. According to Eric, Justine left and drove away in her 2002 Ford Mustang. Eric told the cops he was unconcerned because he expected Justine to return and was casually watching television. His next contact with Justine came at 1, 19 a.m., when she called him and was angry. She explained that her car had broken down and asked him to pick her up, specifying the exact location. He stated that it took him approximately 10-15 minutes to leave the house after receiving Justine's call, as he needed to put on his shoes, grab his jacket, keys, and helmet. Eric stated that he found her between 1. Eric stated that he found her between 1, 39A, 1, 44 a.m. The police found Eric's account suspicious, especially given the crime scene and Justine's injuries. This prompted them to conduct a thorough investigation into the events surrounding Justin's death. It will take four years, but the police will eventually have enough evidence to charge Eric. He was charged with first-degree murder of his wife. The prosecution claimed that Eric committed the murder with the intent to end his marriage and for financial gain. The court was informed that Justine had undergone a significant transformation in the months preceding the November incident. She stopped meeting with friends, ignored calls, and even turned down a friend's housewarming gift of flowers, citing Eric's ban on accepting gifts. The prosecution claimed Justine was killed somewhere else and then dumped on the road where she was discovered as part of Eric's hit and run scheme. Their argument was that this was done to secure a $1.05 million insurance payout. According to the prosecution, Justine's injuries contradicted the theory of a vehicular collision. She suffered 113 blunt trauma injuries, 
including several broken bones, lacerated organs, and 23 head wounds. Surprisingly, there was little blood at the scene. The prosecution presented testimony from two medical examiners that called into question the notion that Justine died as a result of being hit by a car while standing on the road. Instead, they claimed that she was brutally assaulted, strangled, and then run over after death. Dr. Todd Loka Civic, who conducted Justine's autopsy, testified that his findings were consistent with manual strangulation. He discovered deep tissue bruising in the neck muscles and hemorrhages in the eye and lip. He testified that justified that Justine had sustained numerous severe internal injuries. Some wounds did not bleed, indicating that they occurred after Justine's death. He reported finding less than half of the blood he expected in her chest and abdominal cavities. The second medical examiner pointed out that the average female body contains five liters of blood, but Justine had less than one litter. This inconsistency, according to the prosecution, contradicted the scarcity of blood found on the road, supporting their claim that she was killed somewhere else. A la Susan Crawford, Eric's high school girlfriend and mother of his two children, testified that less than two hours before he discovered Justine on the road, he inquired about their future together. They exchanged 43 calls that day, during which Eric expressed his feelings for Allison. In court, Allison stated that he asked if there was any hope for our relationship, revealing Eric's admission of regret for marrying Justine. Another witness testified for the prosecution. Cecil Roebuck stated that he was on Green County's side roads late that night looking for a school us. He explained to the court that he was unfamiliar with the roads and pulled his car into a driveway to turn around. Cecil claimed that a man approached him and informed him that his wife's car was nearly out of gas. He asked Cecil to follow him to a gas station, but before they arrived, the man pulled over and informed Cecil that his car had run out of gas. He asked Cecil for a lift back to his house, and he agreed. Cecil stated that he did not associate the incident with Justine's case until two years later when he saw a program about her death. He told the court that he thought the man was Eric and that he had helped him stage the hit and run, albeit unbeknownst to him at the time. The court was made aware of Eric's financial difficulties during the proceedings. Justine's father, Steve Swartz, testified in court and revealed that his daughter was the couple's primary credit holder. And at the time of her death, they owed $85,000. The insurance claims adjuster has testified about several policies with Eric as the beneficiary. Less than a fortnight after Justine's death, Eric filed an uninsured motorist claim that if approved would have awarded him $100,000 with the possibility of an additional $1.05 million if the commercial aspect was approved. Notably, Justine's name appeared on the insurance for one of the dumpster trucks in 2009. Eric filed for bankruptcy and received $330,000 to pay off his outstanding debts. This financial backdrop enriched the court's understanding of the case. During the trial, some evidence was presented in the absence of the jury, including allegations about an affair Eric allegedly had a month before his wedding and three days after Justine's death. Furthermore, it was suggested that he had explicit photos of a woman, but destroyed them to avoid negative perceptions. The prosecution claimed that Eric's cell phone records contradicted his claim of being at Martha Jefferson Hospital, claiming that he was actually at home during critical periods. This, according to the prosecution, gave him enough time to commit the crime. They told the jury that two periods late in the evening and into the following morning were particularly important, beginning at 10, 4 p.m., until 11.20, 3 p.m., until 11.23 p.m., and from 12, 8 a.m., when a call came in from Justine's phone at 1, 19 a.m., the cell phone records showed that he was at home, not in the hospital. The prosecution emphasized to the jury that Eric used his phone 157 times on the day of the incident, making his claim of only realizing it was in his pocket after discovering Justine's body highly implausible. Furthermore, the prosecution highlighted Eric's background as a Marine with key PR and first aid training claiming that despite this training, he made no attempt to assist Justine. The prosecution revealed a compelling and unsettling detail. Eric had a derogatory nickname for Justine, calling her thing. The defense maintained that Justine's death was the result of a hit-and-run accident. They maintained that Eric's alibi was credible, claiming that he was at Martha Jefferson Hospital until 11.30 p.m., visiting his mother, and then went to a storage unit to get his motorcycle. 
The defense argued that the prosecution's timeline did not allow Eric enough time to kill Justine and stage a hit and run in support of their claim of a happy marriage. The defense presented Eric's brother as a witness who had lived with the couple for some time. He testified to the genuine happiness in Eric and Justine's relationship, emphasizing his positive interactions with Justine to refute the prosecution's claim. The defense challenges the credibility of witness Cecil. They suspected he was motivated by a $50,000 reward for information offered by Justine's parents, as well as a desire to receive favorable treatment in relation to two felony fraud charges he was facing over a $10,000 debt. The defense sought to undermine Cecil's credibility as a witness, questioning his motives and potential bias. Despite the defense's efforts to challenge the case, including claims about the medical examiner's alleged failure to perform a specific procedure, the jury ultimately found Eric guilty of first-degree murder. The decision was made using the evidence presented at trial, which included the prosecution's arguments about the nature of Justine's injuries, the timeline of events, and Eric's actions. Eric was sentenced to life in prison after being found guilty of the charges. During Eric's sentencing hearing, the court heard moving victim impact statements, including one from Justine's sister, Lauren. Lauren stated that for the seven years preceding her death by Eric, I watched my sister's life deteriorate. She became quiet, withdrawn, poor, scared, and a victim of domestic violence, all of which I witnessed firsthand. In retrospect, I feel like I witnessed her death. Lauren's testimony at the sentencing hearing painted a distressing picture of Eric and Justine's relationship. She claimed that she saw Eric physically shove Justine before they married. Justine also confided in her about several other instances of abuse. Justine's family and friends noticed a shift in her personality in the months leading up to November 28th. Justine had always been kind, loving, and friendly, and while she retained those qualities, she stopped meeting with friends and colleagues for social occasions. She was withdrawn and silent, a shell of her former self. The testimony also revealed that Justine, driven by a sense of worthlessness, went to great lengths to please Eric. Even on their wedding day, there were signs of discord. Eric was distant, preferring to go out on his motorcycle alone. Justine missed several wedding-related activities, including lunch, and spent the second night alone in the hotel. Notably, Eric's violent past came to light during the hearing. He had previously been charged with malicious wounding and was under a protective order from the mother of his two children. Eric claimed that this was the result of a verbal disagreement that escalated into a physical altercation in which she attacked him and hit him in the face with a remote control. It was self-defense. He claimed to have grabbed her shirt and throat. Throughout the four years that police investigated the case, Justine's family fought tirelessly to ensure that justice was served. Her father, Steve Swartz, stated that in addition to wanting Justine's case resolved, he sincerely hopes that no one else is hurt before that occurs. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Today, we will examine a case that unfolded in Minnesota in 2013. Kira Steger, a 30-year-old store clerk at a clothing store in the Mall of America, was known for her dedication to her job. She had never missed a shift. So when she didn't show up for work on February 23, 2013, her co-workers grew concerned. They attempted to reach Kira, but received no response to calls or text messages. Consequently, they alerted the police that she was missing. Kira K. Steger was born on November 19, 1982, in Des Plaines, Illinois. She was the daughter of Marcy and Jay Steger, who lovingly described her as a lively, dedicated, and sweet daughter. Kira had been employed at the Mall of America, working at two stores, Wet Seal, and more recently, Delia's. Her co-workers were not just colleagues, she considered them family. Kira had a unique ability to recognize people's strengths, even when they didn't notice them themselves. She had ambitious plans and dreams for a bright and serene future. Tragically, all those dreams vanished in an instant when Kira mysteriously disappeared on Thursday, February 21st, 2013. On that day, she had a shift at work and her coworkers reported that she seemed in good spirits, planning to enjoy a nice dinner with her husband after her shift. Kira and Jeffrey Trevino had met three years prior, 
and had ignited a spark, leading to a romantic relationship and ultimately a wedding. Overall, they appeared to be a happy and stable married couple. Although they had occasional disagreements, these seemed minor and were kept within their private circle. Neither their relatives, friends, nor co-workers were aware of any serious issues. However, two days after Kira failed to come to work, on Saturday, February 23rd, her co-workers grew increasingly concerned as her behavior was atypical for her. She was known for her punctuality and strict adherence to her schedule. Unable to reach Kyra, her co-workers contacted Jeffrey, who had no knowledge of her whereabouts. Jeffrey explained that Kyra had left their home the previous morning and hadn't returned. He didn't find it particularly concerning since Kira had a history of occasionally disappearing for a day or two, staying at a friend's or relative's place unannounced. One possible cause for concern was the heavy snowfall that day, which could have resulted in difficulties on the road, such as her car getting stuck or her phone battery dying. Receiving no news from his wife, Jeffrey filed a missing persons report and contacted Kira's family. This mysterious disappearance shocked Kira's loved ones profoundly. Detectives immediately started working on Kira Steger's missing persons case upon receiving the report. Typically, investigations in such cases begin by questioning the spouse and searching the immediate vicinity. This case was no exception and detectives visited Jeffrey's residence to speak with him. Jeffrey told the detectives that on Thursday, he and Kira had spent time together after work, having dinner, playing bowling, and eventually leaving the mall. According to Jeffrey, they went straight home as Kira intended to watch a movie. Jeffrey also mentioned that his wife left their house the next morning, a Friday, around 8.30 a.m., as she had a work event that required her presence. He didn't find her absence unusual, given her history of occasional disappearances. Jeffrey, however, did admit to some relationship problems over the past few months. He considered these disagreements to be minor, typical of any family. When the detectives asked if Kira might have had a lover or been staying with someone else, Jeffrey denied this possibility. He claimed to trust his wife and love her deeply. The investigators gathered information about Kyra and her car, and they personally visited the Mall of America to verify Jeffrey's account. The mall, one of the largest in the world, is located in Bloomington, boasting 520 stores, theme parks, an oceanarium, movie theaters, a golf course, and more. Given its size, it had numerous security cameras. After reviewing the surveillance footage, detectives confirmed that Jeffrey's account held true. They observed that he met Kira after work, and they spent time together at the mall before heading to the parking lot and leaving. There were no signs of any arguments, and the evening seemed ordinary. However, the anxiety of not knowing Kira's whereabouts weighed heavily on her loved ones as each day passed without any news. Unable to bear the uncertainty, Kira's family traveled to Bloomington to assist with the investigation. They distributed flyers with her pictures in an effort to raise awareness and garner public help. While Kyra's family distributed flyers, investigators continued their efforts. During interviews with neighbors, officers noticed a surveillance camera at one neighbor's house, which partially captured the area around Kira and Jeffrey's home. They asked the homeowner to provide them with the camera footage in hopes of finding clues. Meanwhile, cell phone records provided a new lead. Kira had another man in her life besides Jeffrey, Ryan Went, who managed one of the stores she worked at. They had a significant and ongoing romantic relationship, as evidenced by frequent correspondence. Ryan was out of state at the time of Kira's disappearance, traveling towards Colorado. This raised questions for investigators. Was it a mere coincidence, or was there more to Ryan's sudden move? They had to find the answer, but they eventually cleared him of suspicion as the timing of their text messages indicated he was not involved in her disappearance. Examining the video footage from the neighbor's surveillance camera became crucial for investigators. The camera's rapid rotation made it challenging to observe anything carefully. Still, they managed to capture a few seconds of Kyra and Jeffrey's house. Jeffrey's account of their evening appeared to align with the footage. However, upon closer examination, they noticed Kira's car reversing into their yard shortly after 2 a.m. 
although the poor quality of the footage and the camera's constant motion made it hard to discern details. Nonetheless, the car soon left the property. Jeffrey explained that he drove to a gas station because Kira had asked him to fill up her car before her morning commute. Surveillance footage confirmed his trip to the gas station around 3.30 a.m. Surprisingly, after leaving the gas station, Jeffrey didn't return home but instead headed towards the highway. The neighbor's camera didn't capture his return, but this could have been due to the camera's constant rotation. Investigators considered the possibility that Jeffrey might have returned home later when the camera was facing another direction. Further analysis of the footage showed Kira's Chevrolet leaving at 9.21 a.m., but it was impossible to determine the driver. A missing persons report had been filed on Saturday, February 23rd. On Monday, February 25th, the police received a call about a suspicious vehicle near the shopping center where Kira worked. Security guards at the multi-story parking lots had noticed a car parked there for several days and called a tow truck. Upon closer inspection, the tow truck driver found red smudges on the trunk lid and reported it to the police. It turned out to be Kira's white Chevy, containing a few small bloodstains. Inside her purse, they discovered divorce court forms that appeared to have been downloaded from the internet. Additionally, a rolled up trunk mat found in the snow behind the car was stained with Kira's blood, confirmed through DNA testing. This grim discovery suggested that Kira was likely no longer alive. It devastated her family and friends, as her last hope of seeing her again had faded. Many questions remained unanswered. How had she died? Had she suffered? And who could have harbored such resentment as to take her life? The absence of Kyra's body made the situation even more difficult to bear for her loved ones. The detective's top priority became identifying the person who abandoned the vehicle in the parking lot. The car left the house at 9.21 a.m. and the mall's cameras captured it shortly after. Although there were no cameras in the parking lot where the car was found, one camera pointed towards the path leading to the car. This camera captured the arrival of the car, followed by the appearance of a hooded man. Given the cold weather, the hooded attire wasn't unusual. The man crossed the street, had a brief conversation with a taxi driver at a nearby stand, and then got into the cab. The police identified the taxi company based on the timing of the interaction and the license plate number. All the taxis in the parking lot were equipped with GPS tracking devices, allowing the police to determine that the hooded man's journey ended near Kira and Jeffrey's house. He paid cash and left the neighborhood, passing by the same camera that partially recorded the couple's home. Two minutes later, another hooded man entered the frame. Although the footage had low resolution, they noticed a white logo on his hoodie. As they continued watching, the hooded man entered the house where Kira and Jeffrey lived. Kira was still missing at this point, making it highly likely that the hooded man was Jeffrey. With a search warrant secured, law enforcement officers headed to the house. At first glance, it appeared to be an ordinary home. But upon closer inspection, forensic experts discovered dark red stains in the bedroom. Stains were found on the wall next to the bed, and approximately a hundred on the mattress. Luminol revealed more hidden bloodstains on the carpet that extended from the bedroom into other areas of the house. Forensic analysis confirmed that it was Kira's blood, strengthening the investigator's belief that she was no longer alive. The police also examined Jeffrey's car but found no blood or signs of a struggle. However, they did discover something interesting, a gas station receipt in Jeffrey's car, issued an hour and 40 minutes before Kira's car was discovered in the mall's parking lot. The receipt showed that Jeffrey had used his card to make a purchase at the gas station, followed by a cash withdrawal from an ATM. To gather more evidence, detectives reviewed the gas station's security footage, which showed Jeffrey filling his car with gas, going inside the station, and withdrawing cash from the ATM. The footage briefly revealed his face, as well as a logo on his jacket that resembled the logo on the man seen in the earlier surveillance footage. Based on this new information and the evidence found in the house, Jeffrey Trevino, 39 years old, was arrested. He was taken to the police station for questioning and became the prime and only suspect in the case. During questioning, 
Jeffrey immediately invoked his right to remain silent, seeking advice from his attorney. The police had enough evidence to charge him, but locating Kira's body was crucial to further cementing his guilt. Everyone believed Kira was no longer alive. As the police, Kira's family, and volunteers conducted extensive searches, they made a disturbing discovery in late March. Near Keller Lake, a few miles from Trevino's house, volunteers found a peculiar bag by the roadside and contacted the police. Inside the bag were a bloodied pillow, a shirt, and a bra, all linked to Kira through DNA analysis. Although divers searched the lake, they found no remains in the water. The area around the lake was also scoured multiple times using search dogs specifically trained to find bodies, yet their efforts yielded no results. After two and a half months on May 8, 2013, the St. Paul Police Department received a troubling call. A caller reported seeing what appeared to be a dead body in the Mississippi River. Police retrieved the body, and dental records confirmed it was Kyra Steger. Kira had suffered severe blunt force trauma to her forehead and a fractured index finger on her left hand. Due to the advanced state of decomposition, the exact cause of death could not be determined. With this new evidence, investigators sought to reconstruct the timeline of events leading to Kira's death and its aftermath. It was speculated that upon returning home and discovering Kira's romantic correspondence with someone else, Jeffrey grew increasingly angry. When Kira refused to show him the messages, he forcibly took her phone, resulting in a broken finger. As his rage intensified, he tragically took Kira's life and attempted to hide the evidence. Using Kira's car, he transported her body to the house, then later used the car to dispose of her remains in the river. He made a stop at a gas station and withdrew cash, knowing he would need to pay for a taxi after abandoning Kira's car at the mall. Returning home, Jeffrey attempted to create the impression that Kira had left on her own that morning and was fine. However, surveillance cameras foiled his plan. In October 2013, a jury convicted 39-year-old Jeffrey Trevino. His defense argued that the act was not premeditated and resulted from a heated and sudden argument sparked by the discovery of his wife's infidelity. Before sentencing, Kira's family members made statements in court. Her sister, Carrie Ann Steger, referred to Jeffrey as a calculated criminal and expressed that he deserved no mercy. Marcy, Kira's mother, pointed out that Jeffrey had shown her daughter no mercy and had discarded her like trash in a polluted river. Jay, Kira's father, emphasized that no punishment could ever compensate for the pain Jeffrey had caused their family. In November 2013, Jeffrey Trevino was sentenced to 27 and a half years in prison. He became eligible for parole in 2031. On May 28, 2008, a seemingly ordinary Wednesday, Moira Jones' life took an unexpected and tragic turn. Moira, a vibrant 40-year-old woman, went out on the town that evening with her boyfriend of four years, Paul Thompson. Moira chose Glasgow, Scotland, and the United Kingdom as her home. Her flat overlooks a lovely park in Glasgow South. In 2003, she left her previous life in London to work as an executive at Britvic. Glasgow quickly captured her heart, and she formed strong bonds with the city and its residents. Moira's fondness for Glasgow stemmed from the residents' warmth and friendliness, as well as their infectious sense of humor. The city, with its abundance of outdoor opportunities, proved to be an ideal place for someone who cherished the open air, trails, hills, glens, and beaches of Moira, providing her with numerous opportunities to explore and enjoy her love of the outdoors. Moira had intended to stay at Paul's house that fateful evening. She arrived with an overnight bag ready for a shared night. However, their argument changed her mind. Determined to sleep in her own flat, determined to sleep in her own flat, she set out for home, not realizing it would be a journey she would never complete. On the morning of May 29, 2008, a grim discovery was made in Glasgow's Queen's Park. A park ranger discovered a lifeless woman's body concealed behind a privet hedge. The tragic scene was nothing short of terrifying. The woman lay face down in the bushes, her lower body exposed wearing only a pair of socks. Her jacket and bra had been torn, and her trousers were discarded between her legs. 
Moira's name and personal information were discovered nearby, leading the police to her apartment. To their dismay, there was no sign of Moira at home. They were concerned that the lifeless body they discovered could be hers. The authorities took immediate action and contacted Moira's parents, Beatrice, Beatrice, Bea, and Hubert Hugh Jones, who lived in Weston, Staffordshire. The agonizing message they delivered was that they believed Moira's body had been discovered, but they couldn't be certain. They needed the bereaved parents to identify their daughter with heavy hearts and unfathomable grief. Beatrice Bia and Hubert Hugh Jones made the somber trip to Glasgow. Their worst fears were confirmed when they saw the lifeless body. It was Moira, their beloved daughter. The unimaginable had become a harsh and cruel reality. Moira not only died tragically, but she also suffered the most horrifying fate. She was raped and beaten to death. Moira's younger brother, Grant, who lives all the way in Perth, Australia, received heartbreaking news of his sister's tragic death. He boarded the next available flight back to the United Kingdom, driven by a desire to be with his family during this extremely difficult time. As the investigation into Moira Jones's murder continued, the police faced a perplexing challenge. They had positively identified Moira, but her assailant remained unknown, elusive and unidentified. DNA evidence found on the lawyer's body had definitively ruled out her boyfriend, Paul, as a suspect. Nonetheless, the DNA profile obtained from the crime scene did not match anyone in the United Kingdom's extensive database. In their search for answers, the police cast a wide net, investigating the activities of 22 registered sex offenders living in the area and conducting interviews. They also spoke with people who had committed crimes near the park and underage drinkers who were known to frequent the area. Unfortunately, None of these conversations resulted in significant progress in the case. However, the investigators were able to piece together a timeline of events and obtain crucial CTV footage showing a man in Moira's company. This unidentified man became the focus of the investigation and police were eager to find and question him. The investigation's turning point occurred during door-to-door, -door, to door inquiries. When the police spoke with a woman named Lucy Pechlova, her information would prove to be the key to unraveling the mystery surrounding Moira Jones' tragic death. Lucy's account to the police revealed the presence of a man named Marek Harkar, a six-foot-three-inch, old former Slovakian soldier. Lucy and Marek previously worked together in Liverpool in 2007. Marek arrived in Glasgow on May 18, 2008, when he needed a place to stay. Lucy offered him her bed on Queen's Drive. Marek's visit to Lucy's house, however, was not productive. Although he was supposed to be job hunting, he instead drank heavily and watched explicit videos. Marek left the bedside around 10 p.m. On May 28, allegedly drunk, and informed Lucy that he was going out to find a lady of easy virtue, Marek returned to the bedside around 3.15 a.m. According to Lucy, he looked different the next morning and appeared to be afraid of something. Surprisingly, Marek left the bedside on June 1, abandoning all of his belongings without warning. Later investigations revealed that Marek flew to the Zsirk Republic and then traveled by bus to Slovakia. Lucy handed over Marek's possessions to the police, who conducted DNA testing and discovered a crucial link to the crime, marking a significant breakthrough in the case. A Marek's black leather jacket was discovered to contain traces of Morris blood providing compelling evidence with significant implications for the ongoing investigation. Marek Harker's arrest and extradition to the United Kingdom marks a significant development in the Moiré Jones case. He faced a number of serious charges, including murder, rape, and robbery, and his trial began on March 12, 2009, in Glasgow. Throughout the proceedings, Marek maintained a not guilty plea to all charges. The court heard that Marek arrived in the United Kingdom in 2007, Morris had been in Glasgow for only 10 days when he was tragically murdered. The prosecution's case centered on Merrick as the perpetrator. They presented a compelling story, alleging that on the night of May 28, Moira was on her way home from her boyfriend's house. But Marek had completely different plans. He had been drinking heavily, including beer and vodka, and was overheard saying he was going out to find a woman. Moira returned to her flat, where she had originally planned to spend the night carrying a large black overnight bag and parking her car about 60 yards away near Queen's Park, according to the prosecution. It was approximately 11.30 p.m. The prosecution claimed that at this point, Marek approached Moira and forced her to walk along a path with him. 
CTV footage obtained from a passing first bus captured two people crossing Langside Road and walking along the perimeter of Queens Park, providing crucial evidence. The jury noticed a stark difference in height and stature between the two figures in the footage. Moira, who stood only five feet, four inches tall and weighed less than nine stone, appeared much smaller than the man accompanying her. The prosecution claimed that the towering figure was Marek, who, at six feet three inches and a kickboxing enthusiast, had a significant physical advantage over Mara. The prosecution also outlined the written Marek, allegedly forced Moirado to accompany a witness who reported seeing a man and a woman near a holly bush near the tennis courts, where six buttons from the wiretop and a cigarette buttock bearing Marek's DNA were found. Furthermore, CTV footage captured a man exiting the park near Queens Park Baptist Church on Balvicker Drive at 2.15a. The prosecution claimed that this individual was Merrick, who had been alone at the time. The prosecution's case painted a bleak and distressing picture of the events at Queens Park. According to their account, Mark Harker forced Moira into the park, assaulted her violently and sexually, and stole some of her belongings. The autopsy findings revealed the horrific extent of Moira's injuries and shed light on the harrowing attack she had to endure. Moira's autopsy results indicated that she did not die from her injuries before 2 a.m., implying that she may have survived her ordeal for about two and a half hours. Moira had sustained 65 distinct blunt force trauma injuries as a result of punches, kicks, and stomps, according to the examination. These injuries were the result of severe and sustained blunt force trauma. A forensic pathologist identified 65 external injuries, including a broken nose and two black eyes. Moira suffered brain damage, fractures to her right cheekbone and larynx, and bruised ribs. She had extensive bruising on her head and face, and one of her front teeth had been knocked out. Bruising spread to her chest, back legs, and buttocks. Dr. Black's compelling testimony, which revealed the tragic details surrounding Moira Jones' death, captivated the courtroom. Dr. Black, an expert witness, revealed that Moira's head and neck injuries were the primary factors contributing to her tragic death. In a chilling revelation, she suggested that small hemorrhages in Moira's eyes indicated a possible asphyxiation factor in her death. The presence of bruises on the backs of her hands and arms raised additional concerns, which Dr. Black described as common defensive injuries. Dr. Black's expert testimony also highlighted the distressing aspect of the case. There was no evidence of a weapon being used in the attack, Instead, she believed the injuries were caused by physical blows to the fists or feet. Moira speculated that the extensive bruising on her neck was caused by an arm, leg, or knee compressing more of his neck while she was on the ground. As Dr. Black described additional distressing findings, the courtroom atmosphere became increasingly somber. Moira's brain was bleeding between layers, and there was a moderate amount of blood in her windpipe, indicating the gruesome ordeal she had been through. It was later discovered that she had swallowed some of the blood during the attack. Dr. Black also revealed that Moira had consumed other items during the assault, including bark fragments, grassy fragments, plant cuticle fragments, and leaf skeleton fragments. The implications were chilling, implying that Moira had been forced to consume these items while alive. The final damning piece of evidence was the DNA discovery. A vaginal swab yielded a semen sample from the boy's body, and DNA found on more of his clothes and body matched Merrick's DNA, with the jury being told that there was a billion to one chance that it belonged to someone other than Merrick. The courtroom was packed with witnesses, each contributing their own piece to the chilling puzzle of Moira Jones' murder. Several residents near Queens Park reported hearing disturbing noises on the night of May 28. One woman who lives in a flat overlooking the park recalled a chilling incident in which a loud scream pierced the night only to be abruptly silenced. Other couples strolling through the park reported hearing Moira's obvious distress. Even a cab driver turned to his partner and said, if there was a murder, we just heard about it. It was a shocking revelation that, despite the busy street and the large number of people who heard a woman screaming and in distress, no one intervened or called the police, allowing the tragic events to unfold in silence. In addition, a neighbor who lived near the bedside where Merrick stayed provided compelling testimony he described how Mara approached him on the night of May 28th, frantically saying, I'm looking for a woman. In her closing statements, the prosecutor urged the jury to convict her based on the evidence presented. 
The prosecutor painted a chilling picture of the heinous murder witnessed by Moira Jones, pleading with the jury to base their decision on evidence, rather than the overwhelming emotional horror of the event. On the other side of the courtroom, the defense vehemently claimed that the police had charged the wrong man. They claimed that three other men were involved in the murder, despite Merrick's innocence, and that one of these men, Jason Mulvern, a convicted sex offender, was at Lucy's bedside during the crime. They pointed out similarities between his previous criminal acts and Moira's attack, emphasizing his lack of an alibi on the night Moira was killed. The defense also claimed that Jason confessed to the murder to his ex-girlfriend, who became so concerned that she reported it to the police. However, when Jason testified in court, he categorically denied any involvement in Moira's rape or death, contradicting the defense's allegations. The defense urged the jury to find Marek not guilty and to consider the possibility that another man was responsible for the murder. They also emphasized the importance of skepticism when evaluating the prosecution's DNA evidence, reminding the jury that scientists can only provide probabilities and that DNA should be viewed as one piece of evidence among many. Marek Harkar's fate now lay in the hands of the jury, which had the difficult task of determining the truth in this complex and chilling case. The trial lasted 20 days and kept the courtroom in suspense. However, the jury delivered its verdict quickly, finding Marek guilty of all charges in less than two hours. The judge imposed a harsh sentence, sentencing Marek to life in prison with a minimum of 25 years. In the aftermath of Moira's tragic murder, her family turned their grief into a noble cause. They founded the Moira Fund, a charity that helps families in the United Kingdom who have been bereaved by murder. The charity provides grants to cover a variety of expenses, including funeral costs and transportation to court, assisting those in need during their darkest hours. Moira's memory continues to provide comfort and support to others who have experienced similar tragedies. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. The Irene Cortez case, a tragic accident or a planned murder of a mother of a mother of many. A scorned woman is said to be capable of unpredictable and desperate acts, the most fearsome of which is cold and cruel revenge. But what about the scorned man? Many people believe that an offended man will either resort to physical violence, drown his sorrows in alcohol, or combine the two. Men, on the other hand, tend to hold fewer grudges and can be more inventive when it comes to vengeance. The case of Irene Cortez, a Spanish citizen who died mysteriously during a trip to Colombia, is complex and ambiguous. While her assailants were apprehended, convicted, and are currently serving lengthy sentences, the deceased woman's family claims the true perpetrator is still at large and portraying himself as a victim. Let us begin by delving into this complex story and determining whether a third party was involved or if the murder was unintentional. It's worth noting that each party is still attempting to prove their version of the truth. Who was Irene Cortez? Irene Cortez, born Lucas, was born in 1980 in the sunny city of Granada, Spain, which is the capital of the same province. She grew up in a wealthy family with a brother and sister. Her parents operated a small but profitable business. According to some reports, her father died young, but her mother, Maria Lucas, took over the business, expanded it, and made sure her children had everything they needed. Maria's older brother, Uncle Pedro Lucas, was also very helpful. Irene was the oldest of the three children. A beautiful and sociable girl, she enjoyed being the center of attention and was drawn to boys from a young age. She married shortly after finishing school and was already pregnant. She gave birth to her first child at the age of 17, and two years later, she had her second. Despite being a young mother, her mother and uncle provided her with significant support, allowing her to continue her education. Irene relocated to Malaga, a resort city, with her husband and two children in early 2000. She opened an entertainment venue, which quickly became popular and profitable. Originally a small disco bar, it grew into a full-fledged nightclub in Malaga. The couple had their third child, and life appeared prosperous and stable. At the age of 25, Irene's husband was arrested and sentenced to five years in prison for trafficking illegal substances. Tragically, he died in prison under mysterious circumstances. Irene was solely responsible for raising her children. 
Irene was determined to persevere after witnessing her mother raising three children on her own. She ran her business successfully, made good money, and had big plans for the future. Relationship with Farid Linus Ariza, Farid Alinus Ariza, Farid Alinus Ariza, a native of Barranquilla, Colombia, was born in 1976. He grew up in a large, impoverished family as the youngest of six siblings. His parents divorced in the early 1990s when he was still a teenager. His older siblings had become self-sufficient by then, so Farid remained with his mother. Farid moved to Spain with his elderly mother in 2001 at the age of 25 in search of a better life. They settled in Malaga and Farid worked any job he could to support himself and his mother. In 2005, he began working as a waiter at a nightclub owned by Irene. Irene immediately recognized Farid's dedication and dependability. She was also attracted to him, and Farid did his best to please her. Irene's husband was incarcerated at the time, and she had planned to file for divorce, but was unable to do so before his untimely death. Irene and Farid's employer-employee relationship quickly developed into romance. Farid was not put off by Irene's three children from previous relationships. Nor was Irene concerned about Farid's humble background as a waiter whose salary she paid. Within months of starting their relationship, the couple decided to live together. They moved into Irene's spacious apartment, and soon after, Irene became pregnant with Farid's child. They had two children together. It's unclear whether they were legally married, but Irene retained her first husband's surname, while Farid's children took the surname Alinus Ariza. Surname. Imprisonment and infidelity. In 2009, Irene's past appeared to repeat itself. Faride, like her first husband, was arrested for distributing illegal substances and sentenced to prison. Irene was once again left alone, but this time with five children. Farid was sentenced to three years, but served only one and a half, being released early due to good behavior and cooperation with the investigation. However, shortly after Farid's imprisonment, Irene found solace in the arms of another man and lived with him for a year and a half. Farid learned of her infidelity only after he was released. Understandably enraged, he threatened Irene and her lover and nearly assaulted the man, narrowly avoiding another legal scuffle. They eventually reached a peaceful resolution to the situation. Farid forgave Irene for the sake of their children, and they resumed their relationship as if the imprisonment and infidelity had never happened. Irene's relatives were always skeptical of Farid. Her mother and uncle disapproved of their relationship, believing Farid was only interested in Irene's money. Furthermore, Irene's older children from her first marriage rejected Farid, whereas the youngest, whom Farid had raised since the child was two, saw him as a father figure, a fateful trip to Colombia. Farid, Irene's husband, expressed a desire to return to Colombia due to his father's serious illness in early 2011. According to reports, Farid's estranged father has been diagnosed with advanced cancer and his sister in Barranquilla informed him of the dire situation. Irene, who had long wanted to visit Farid's homeland, agreed to accompany him. She was excited to meet Farid's father, whom she had never met before, as well as participate in the legendary Barranquilla Carnival, which takes place in late February. Furthermore, Irene, who had not taken a vacation in years, Due to her commitment to her job and raising her five children, saw this trip as an opportunity for a much-needed break. The couple planned a 10-day trip across the ocean, with Irene's mother and younger sister agreeing to look after her children during this time. Despite her mother Maria Lucas's attempts to dissuade her from the journey due to a bad omen, Irene ignored her fears. At the same time, the family was experiencing financial difficulties due to a seasonal downturn in their business. Despite this, Irene had personal savings of Earth 3000 in cash hidden at home. But on the eve of their trip, she discovered the money had mysteriously vanished, nearly derailing their plans. Irene quickly borrowed the money from her uncle and close friends. She also reserved their flight tickets in a hotel in the city center, thoroughly preparing for what would tragically be her final journey. Mysterious murder. On February 27th of 2011, the couple arrived in Colombia, the flight was uneventful, and they immediately checked into their hotel. Irene called home to reassure her mom. However, two days later, Faraday informed Irene's eldest son, 14, that his mother had died. Faride initially claimed an accident, 
but it was later discovered that Irene was murdered during a robbery at a Barranquilla entertainment venue. The case quickly became a major headline in Colombia. The story was that Irene, a Spanish tourist, was murdered by robbers who fled the scene, sparking a citywide police manhunt. However, the circumstances surrounding the robbery and murder appeared unusual and suspicious. The attackers did not appear to be attempting to steal anything. Instead, they shot Irene in the heart and fled quickly. Police and local media representatives arrived quickly, despite the fact that Fareed witnessed his partner shooting during an interview with journalists. He appeared calm, not like a grieving widower. The Spanish embassy in Bogota confirmed the murder and stated that Irene's remains would be repatriated following the necessary investigations. Investigators are still determining the exact events of the night of March 2nd. In the meantime, authorities are actively pursuing the perpetrators of this senseless crime. Surveillance footage. The case of Irene Cortez's mysterious death appeared to be gaining clarity. After reviewing surveillance footage from cameras installed at the murder scene on March 1st, Irene and her partner, Farid Alinas Ariza, had arranged to meet Farid's brother, sister, and their spouses. The six-person group attended the carnival, walked around town, and then went to a local bar for dinner and entertainment. As suggested by Farid, by 1 a.m., Irene Farid and his relatives were the only customers at the bar, according to surveillance footage. Around 2 a.m., two young men sitting away from the crowd entered the bar. They didn't order anything and didn't appear to be comfortable, which drew the bar manager's attention due to their suspicious behavior. Furthermore, their young appearance prompted the manager to inquire as to their legal age. The young men refused to show their IDs, and when asked to leave, one of them pulled out a gun and pointed it at the manager. His accomplice produced a knife, but quickly retreated out of the camera's view. The armed assailant pushed the manager aside and approached Irene's table, announcing the robbery and demanding mobile phones and cash. His knife-wielding partner reappeared, presumably to collect valuables, while the gunman continued to threaten the group. However, he did not have the opportunity to act, confronting Irene. The gunman instructed Fareed to stand for a pocket search. As Irene reached for her purse, the assailant lunged at her while holding the gun. As he grabbed the purse, he fired a shot that struck Irene directly in the chest. She collapsed on the floor as the assailants fled without taking anything. Fareed and his brother pursued them while his sister attempted to stop Irene's bleeding and his brother's wife requested emergency assistance. Unfortunately, the criminals were too quick to apprehend. The men returned to the bar and attempted to help Irene, but it was too late. Emergency personnel arrived quickly, but Irene died from her injuries en route to the hospital, leaving behind a perplexing case and a bereaved family. The manhunt for the perpetrators, arrest and trial. Following the robbery and homicide that claimed Irene Cortez's life, law enforcement deployed all available resources. The city was teeming with tourists for the carnival, so ensuring their safety was critical. A reward of $10 million, or approximately or 3500 was announced for information leading to the culprits. The first suspect, gunman Brian Dario, was apprehended the following day. He promptly implicated his accomplice, Juan Carlos. Juan, 18, surrendered to authorities, hoping for leniency. During interrogation, Dario claimed that dire financial straits, debts, and a sick child in need of costly treatment drove him to commit the crime which his relatives later confirmed. He insisted that Irene's shooting was unintentional, occurring while attempting to steal her purse. Juan Carlos claimed he was an unwitting participant. He claimed Brian did not reveal his plans, but rather requested backup in a job for which he claimed to have only a small knife for intimidation, not harm, and fled the scene when he realized Brian's intentions. But however, surveillance footage contradicted his claims revealing that he returned to Brian with both perpetrators in custody and their confessions. With prison sentences looming, the court found Dario guilty of robbery and homicide in aggravating circumstances and sentenced him to 23 years. Carlos was sentenced to 17 years for complicity in these crimes. Farid is accused and new details about the crime have emerged. The family of the deceased woman accused Farid of orchestrating his wife's murder from the start of the investigation. Irene's mother and uncle hired a detective to conduct an independent investigation, gathering additional materials and evidence to hold the man accountable and prove his role in the crime. 
starting with the previously mentioned disappearance of Year 3000 from Cortez hiding place. According to Maria Lucas, Farid was the only one who knew about the money and could have discreetly taken it. The woman told her daughter about this from the start, but she refused to listen. Now, she believed her son-in-law used the money to pay Dario to murder his wife. Another compelling argument was the man's father's fabricated illness, which he was eager to see. The elderly parent was not diagnosed with cancer, and he appeared to be in good health for his age. Fareed made up this story, which served as the main pretext for the trip to Colombia. Furthermore, it was Linus Arizo who initiated the visit to that fateful establishment. Furthermore, he insisted on continuing the feast late into the night, when all of the other visitors had left and their company was alone in the hall. Furthermore, the detective conducted a detailed analysis of the camera recordings, assessing what was going on and drawing his own conclusions. He noticed that the criminals behaved strangely. Juan was obviously terrified, and he most likely had no idea what was happening. While Brian approached, the company approached Farid and raised him without directly threatening him with a gun. It appeared that the men knew each other and acted together. Then Farid moved strangely behind Irene, who was sitting at the table and reached into her bag for her wallet. The criminal with the gun stared at the man, as if waiting for a signal. It's unclear whether he received any kind of sign when the victim and her husband returned to the camera after the shot. The man chased the killer, but the expert believes he intentionally let him escape. However, the latter statement may be considered controversial because Brian was armed and Ferry could reasonably fear for his life. The man's behavior was also called into question. After his chosen one was declared dead, he willingly gave interviews to the arriving correspondents, discussing the details of what happened while remaining composed and not appearing upset or depressed. Another important question is why, after the tragedy, Linus Ariza called her 14-year-old son rather than Irene's mother, uncle, or any other adult relative. According to Maria Lucas, he intended to personally inflict pain on the teenager, punishing him for failing to recognize the stepfather's authority and treating him disrespectfully. The woman's uncle was the first to give an interview to the press, openly discussing his suspicions and the findings of the investigation. Pedro Lucas was certain that Farad had planned the trip in advance, effectively luring Efrain into a trap. The money stolen from her was used to pay for the services of a hired killer, and after her death, he intended to establish guardianship over the children and take over his wife's business. Farid's mother did not stand silently by as her son was accused of a heinous crime. Instead, she openly defended her son. The woman claimed that her offspring adored Irene and her children and would never harm them. However, the parent inadvertently said that the chosen one did not have to cheat on Farid, which greatly offended his pride. In addition, an unpleasant detail emerged about Linus Ariza leaving Spain on fake documents because he was not permitted to leave the country after being released from prison on parole. The man denied this information, claiming that he left legally and Irene served as his guarantor. Funeral without the widower. Irene's body was returned to her native Spain 12 days after the tragedy occurred. The funeral was held with a closed casket because the remains had begun to decompose after such a long time. Hundreds attended the funeral. Family, friends, neighbors, and even those who didn't know Cortez, but had heard the moving story, wanted to send their condolences to the family. Farid was the only person who did not attend the farewell ceremony because he was afraid of retribution if he returned from Colombia. Farid claimed that his late wife's relatives had repeatedly threatened both him and his elderly mother. As a result, before flying back to Spain, he planned to appeal to the authorities to ensure his safety. He sought a protective order so that he could attend the funeral, but his request was denied and Linus Ariza decided not to take the risk. In response, Farid filed a court complaint against his deceased wife's relatives, alleging that they obstructed his return home. Maria and Pedro Lucas, on the other hand, denied his claims, stating that their primary concern was his return to Spain to face trial. Additional court proceedings, with new circumstances and accusations against Farid, Further investigation and court proceedings were launched. Dario and Carlos, who were already serving their sentences in a Colombian prison, were questioned about their relationship with Alina Zariza and a possible premeditated conspiracy. However, Brian categorically rejected this assumption. He insisted that the murder was an accident caused by a failed robbery attempt. 
He claimed he had never met Farid before, let alone hired him as a hitman for his wife. The accusations appeared to be grasping at straws, with no conclusive evidence of premeditation or a contract killing, only assumptions and interpretations of the events on the recording. Dario also admitted to being under the influence of alcohol and prohibited substances that evening, which explains his poor recollection of the events. Carlos insisted that his friend had not included him in his plans and that everything that happened in the bar was as shocking to him as it was to those they assaulted. Juan appeared to be telling the truth, but Brian's statement about who fired the fatal shot raised some doubts. Consider this. He failed to commit the robbery, was imprisoned, and his sick child received the necessary expensive treatment. Brain claimed that when kind-hearted people discovered his motivation, they helped him. However, the Lucas family's lawyers attempted to show that the year 3000 stolen from Irene, which Farid paid for her murder, was spent on treatment. Brain allegedly agreed to sacrifice himself and go to prison to save his child while secretly passing the money to his wife. This version, however, was never verified. Return to Spain. Alinas Ariza only decided to return to Spain after obtaining a court order guaranteeing his safety. A few months had passed since the tragedy and the media frenzy had subsided. When he returned, Linus Ariza claimed to have brought investigation materials that proved his innocence in his wife's murder. He stated that his main reason for returning was to care for the children he shared with Irene, who had been cared for by the deceased's relatives while he was away. Six months later, Farid decided to give a major interview in which he revealed that he had lost almost everything. He was unemployed and his passport had been revoked, preventing him from leaving the country. To make matters worse, his friends abandoned him and his late wife's mother and uncle forbade him from seeing his children. Linus Ariza confronted Maria and Pedro Lucas in court several times. He claimed they threatened him while trying to prove his involvement in Irene's murder. However, neither side could back up their claims. Finally, the children remained in the care of their grandmother and uncle, and the widower was unable to claim any of his late wife's belongings. Share your opinion with us in the comments, and subscribe to the channel for more. On the fateful day of May 31, 2007, Alan Bailey's heart was filled with unease after seeing his daughter, Kate Beagley, brimming with excitement as she prepared for a night out. Little did he know that this ordinary evening would turn into a terrifying mystery. Their last encounter occurred on May 30. Kate's excitement about her plans became contagious around 6.30 p.m. Alan smiled as he left her, unaware that it would be his last time seeing her. But on May 31, as the day progressed without Kate's presence, concern began to grow. Kate was a dedicated and driven woman who was 32 years old at the time. She had a degree in sports administration and had spent a decade climbing the ranks at British Gas, demonstrating her dedication and ambition. Her strong work ethic and vibrant personality made her a popular figure at her workplace. What set Kate apart was her unwavering bond with her loved ones. She was the type of person who stayed in touch, providing a reassuring presence in the lives of her friends and family. When she did not show up for appointments or work on May 31, her father became concerned. Alan felt uneasy about his daughter's character. It had been less than 24 hours since they had last seen each other, but something felt off. Kate's absence was out of character, and the silence in her Walton on Thames apartment spoke louder than words. Unable to ignore his instincts, Alan took the step that no parent wants to take. He reported his daughter missing to the authorities, setting off a chain of events that would eventually solve the mystery surrounding Kate's sudden disappearance. The story takes a chilling turn when Kate's friends reveal crucial information to the police. They told the police that on that fateful night of May 30, she agreed to a first date with a man she had met a few weeks before. This man was Carl Taylor, a 27-year-old fitness trainer. Kate Carl's paths crossed in central London on May 18. When they met at a club, Carl approached her with charm and charisma, and Kate gave him her contact information. In the days that followed, they exchanged text messages and eventually agreed on a date of May 30. Kate was open with her friends about her plans, including her upcoming date with Carl. They were going to meet at the Roebuck Bar, which had a beautiful view of the Thames. The night went as planned, and Kate texted several of her friends throughout their date. 
But as the evening progressed, those messages would be her last known communication. After that, silence enveloped her and her whereabouts remained a haunting mystery. The police naturally questioned Carl Taylor about Kate's disappearance. Initially, he claimed ignorance of her whereabouts or what had happened following their date. However, his account quickly began to shift and fluctuate. He claimed that Kate had dropped him off at Twickenham after their date. However, his story kept changing, and he remained uncooperative, refusing to answer some questions, leading to his arrest on suspicion of kidnapping. As the investigation progressed, Carl Taylor eventually dashed any remaining hope that Kate was still alive. He admitted to a heinous crime, stabbing Kate to death while they were sitting on a bench on Richmond Hill. He then revealed that he had taken her lifeless body to a nature reserve in Hertfordshire, where it was partially concealed near a car park. Following his confession, Carl led the police to the grim location where he had disposed of Kate's and their bodies among the nettles. They discovered a tragic truth. Despite his confessions to police, Carl Taylor shockingly entered a not guilty plea when charged with murder, setting the stage for a tumultuous legal battle and a search for justice in a case. In court, the prosecution presented a compelling case against Carl Taylor, alleging that he went on a date with Kate Beagley with the sinister intent to murder her and steal her car. The narrative presented to the court unfolded as follows. On the night of May 30, their date began as scheduled. They drove to a picture, perfect spot on Richmond Hill with stunning views of the Thames, and entered the Roebuck Bar. They went there to buy drinks and spend some time. They then moved outside to a bench, as is customary in the scenic area, where people often gather to admire the breathtaking views. The court heard this while they were inside Roebuck Bar. Kate didn't seem to be interested in Carl. The court heard critical testimony from a woman named Maureen Rong Khan, who was present at the bar that evening. Maureen stated that as soon as they sat down, the girl had her head down, texting on her mobile phone. There was no conversation, only he spoke to her. She continued texting. She was still texting as they left. The prosecution claimed that once they were outside and away from potential witnesses, Kara launched a vicious, frenzied attack on Kate, which resulted in her tragic death. Carl, according to the court, came prepared for this heinous act, having stolen scissors and a carving knife from a friend's house prior to the date. Surprisingly, he had kept the knife hidden up his sleeve while in Kate's company at the bar, an unsettling detail that would later become a critical component of the case. The prosecutor informed the court that Carl gave the police varying accounts of what happened that night. In one of these accounts, Carl admitted to stabbing Kate during an argument and saying the chilling words, All I want is your car. He then revealed that she pushed me away. She grabbed me, so I stabbed her in the throat. I constantly hurt her neck because she was aiming for my face. The gruesome reality of the situation became clear when the court learned that Kate had 30, one stab wounds on her face and neck. Further disturbing revelations gripped the courtroom as it was revealed that Carl Taylor brutally stabbed Kate to death before placing her lifeless body in the trunk of her own car and driving through London streets. As he drove, he had a phone conversation with his girlfriend, Lauren. Sean Luck, Lauren had no idea where he had been or what had happened. The jury was presented with compelling evidence, including CT footage that captured Carl's calculated actions at 12.20 on May 31. The footage showed Carl driving Kate's car into a garage and then refueling the vehicle. Surprisingly, he interacted with other drivers on the forecourt, appearing relaxed and unconcerned. Despite the grisly secret hidden in the car's trunk, Carl removed Kate's clothing and attempted to meticulously wash away any potential DNA traces from her body using bottles of mineral water found in her car. In a chilling display of detachment, he disposed of Kate's lifeless body among the nettles in the woods. Carl returned home and shockingly displayed Kate's stolen car to friends and family, flaunting it. He also sold Kate's phone to an acquaintance and generously distributed Marks and Spencer gift cards found in Kate's car's glove box to friends. During the subsequent investigation, police were able to locate Kate's car and recover the knife used as the murder weapon. They also recovered Kate's clothing and personal belongings, which added to the evidence of a cold-blooded crime. The courtroom drama surrounding Kate Beagley's tragic death took an unexpected turn when the defense presented a vastly different view of the case. Despite Carl Taylor's conflicting statements to the police, the defense claimed he was not responsible for Kate's death. 
Instead, they claimed Kate killed herself because of her alleged dark and cold side. In an unexpected twist, Carl testified at the trial that Kate committed suicide by intentionally moving her head onto his knife. He claimed that just before this tragic incident, Kate confided in him about her problems. Carl admitted to bringing the knife that night because he was feeling suicidal. According to his account, when the knife fell from his sleeve, Kate grabbed it and started prodding herself in the neck. Under cross-examination by the prosecutor, Carl was asked to describe and demonstrate how Kate could have inflicted 31 injuries on herself. He hesitated and declined to give a detailed account, citing emotional distress. However, the judge in the case reminded him of his responsibility as a witness to answer the questions posed. The judge insisted Carl show the jury how Kate met her tragic death, saying, you are not gonna boss us around. You are not there to dictate terms. You are there to show how she lost her life. To demonstrate the events, the prosecutor created a makeshift paper knife about six inches long and asked Carl to reenact the scene. Carl cautiously prided himself in the neck with the paper knife, recounting how he had discovered Kate had died. He described breaking down in tears and lying on the grass, staring at the sky. The prosecution argued that Carl's claim that Kate remained standing while inflicting these wounds was implausible. Among the 31 injuries she'd sustained, some had severed her carotid artery and jugular vein, making it extremely unlikely that she would have remained on her feet. The prosecutor also questioned Carl about his background as a fitness instructor with martial arts training, asking why he didn't intervene to assist Kate. Carl's response was simple. It was an awkward situation. The jury deliberated for only two hours before reaching a guilty verdict. They found Carl Taylor's latest account of events that night unconvincing, and he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years behind bars. Alan Beagley's moving words following Carl's life sentence revealed the deep pain and sorrow that his family has experienced. On Wednesday, May 30, 2007, I left my only daughter, Kate, looking forward to an evening out. She was brutally murdered by the man she had gone to meet, and we never saw her again. Since then, our lives have been turned upside down. Kate was a loving, thoughtful daughter, sister, and friend who cared about us all just as much as we did her. She was a lot of fun to be around, and everyone who knew her will miss her greatly. She had a gung-ho attitude toward life and lived it to the full. We cherish and are grateful. We cherish and are grateful for all of the memories of our wonderful time together. Kate's family and friends have been devastated by her tragic and unexpected death, and I speak for everyone when I say that our lives will never be the same again. Our family has been devastated, and life without Kate feels empty and meaningless. The worst episode of our lives has now been resolved through the judicial system. However, we must now rebuild our lives around the void left by Kate's tragic death, recalling the positive impact she had on all of us. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Nolan Buchanan, 16, remembers Monday, September 14, 2015, as the best day of his life. The day before, he had spent Sunday with his girlfriend, doing traditional morning math with her family followed by a social gathering with friends and a wonderfully romantic evening. When the teenager awoke on Monday morning next to his favorite girl, he felt like a free, successful, and influential businessman with the entire world in front of him. After all, he now owned Buchanan Construction. The young man was about to inherit cars, a house, land, and monetary assets, and he planned to manage the family business on his own, and certainly better than his father, who had brought the company to bankruptcy. It appears that what could go wrong? The El Dorado County Sheriff's Office arrested Nolan Keith Buchanan on October 1, 2015, at Bonita High School in Bonita High School in Bonita, California. Nolan was held at the Juvenile Treatment Center JATS in South Lake Tahoe until June 13, 2018, when an El Dorado County jury of seven men and five women found Buchanan guilty of three charges. The jury took only two hours to reach a decision. The young man was sentenced to 150 years in prison, with the possibility of parole starting in the 25th year. This is how his attempt to take over the family business failed. Nolan was praised by neighbors and classmates as a model student. As far as I know, he was a good kid, but as a high school student, Campbell Ruxton would later say in an interview, he was always concerned about school. 
He appeared to be very kind, and he was even surprised he was arrested. But what exactly happened in the Buchanan family? Let's go over this horrific case in detail. Molly first met Adam when she applied for a position as an office manager at his firm. By the time they met, Adam was already divorced and raising his son Nolan from a previous marriage by himself. The cheerful, sociable, and cheerful blonde immediately caught the attention of the company's owner. The interest was mutual. Molly fell in love, began a romance that evolved into a serious relationship, and moved to Adam. Molly wished for a loving, friendly family and worked hard to foster a positive relationship with her stepson. She soon became pregnant. Gavin was born. People who knew the Buchanans said they were a close-knit family of four. The family's head, who owned a construction company, made enough money to live comfortably. The family also purchased vacation property in El Dorado County, California. A small cabin sat on 19 acres in Greenwood with no electricity, water, sewer, or gas. Adam, who worked in construction, took an active role in remodeling the house, and the family began visiting their office on September 13, 2015. At 10 a.m., members of the Garden Valley Fire Department responded to a wildfire in Greenwood Township, western El Dorado County, on Highway 193 between Cool and Georgetown. Upon arrival, they discovered that the fire had destroyed 10 acres of the property. A cabin on the property was still smoldering, but had burned down. The fire department personnel discovered charred remains among the assets. The fire scene remained intact. At 11 a.m., firefighters called the El Dorado County Sheriff's Office. Nobody had realized what was going on. Firefighters were almost certain that the wildfire killed a pet trapped inside the house. The arriving coroner faced a daunting task. The remains of the house were still smoldering, and there was no way to examine the inside of the house without waiting for the flame to die down and the temperature to drop slightly. As the coroner examined the house, he detected the sweet odor of burnt flesh and discovered a human skull and a burned chest. It appeared that the tragedy had taken someone's life. The officer requested backup, and officers from the sheriff's office arrived to conduct a thorough investigation of the scene. The conclusion was obvious. The small, secluded, and remote cabin was not the owner's primary residence. It was more likely a country cabin where people came to vacation. A Dodge truck and trailer were discovered on the property next to the cabin. It was possible to run the license plates and determine who owned the car. The owner may have been a victim of the wildfire. It didn't take long to discover that the vehicle and trailer belonged to Buchanan Construction, which is owned by Adam Buchanan Construction, which is owned by Adam Buchanan. The man in question lived in Bonita, California, 160 miles from the accident scene and about three hours away. This information confirmed the police's assumption that the house was simply a country retreat for those who wanted to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city. It remains to be seen whether Mr. Buchanan or someone else was inside. The name of the company's owner provided the detective with their first clue, prompting them to begin their investigation. The Bonita police officers were tasked with checking to ensure that all of Buchanan's family members were safe and at home. They went to the correct address and soon arrived in the Buchanan's driveway, where they noticed a white Ford pickup truck and a knock on the door. Adam's 16-year-old son from his first marriage has come out. He greeted the uniformed officers with surprise and inquired as to why they had come to him. To avoid frightening the family, the officer decided to first determine who was present in the house. Perhaps the company car was taken by someone from the company rather than the owner. Nolan Buchanan stated that his father Adam had gone away for the weekend to his country estate 160 miles away with Molly and their eight-year-old son Gavin, and that they were expected back in the evening. According to him, his father had left him to care for the house. Investigators did not have enough evidence to believe the remains in the cabin belonged to the Buchanans, but the information they received and the discovery of the remains led them to believe they belonged to two people. By the evening of September 13, it was sufficient to report the family missing in the El Dorado County fire. The following day, September 14, El Dorado County police went to Nolan's house to speak with him further and determine who had died in the fire. Howard and Susan Buchanan, Adam's parents, met with the officers. They stated that their son, the owner of the burned-out cabin, performs his own home repairs and thus travels there frequently. The parents were extremely concerned because they had been unable to contact their son or daughter-in-law until now. The officers learned from the story that the house is powered by generators, 
However, there was no electricity at the time of the tragedy. There were gas cylinders inside this Cave 2 series, so the fire could have been accidental or intentional. By September 15, the fire had subsided, allowing investigators to collect evidence, including debris from a nearby fire pit. According to Denton James Peterson of the El Dorado County Sheriff's Office, new remains were discovered, which changed the course of the investigation. Police discovered a piece of skull with a bullet hole. At that point, we all realized there had been a homicide. According to the sheriff, the fire was not an accident. The remains were collected and sent for forensic de-analysis. In the first set of remains, the bullet was lodged in the victim's thigh. The skull with the bullet hole based on its eyes belonged to a child. The version of a fatal accident dropped on its own. Murder became the dominant narrative. No one doubted that the fire was intended to destroy the evidence of the crime. It remained to determine under what circumstances the crime had occurred. Was this a botched burglary? Or did the family deliberately end their lives? But who committed the crime and why? Could it be related to Buchanan Construction, where Adam Buchanan was president and chief operating officer, and someone held a grudge against him because of a working relationship? Initially, investigators focused solely on the latter theory. They also investigated Molly's life to see if she had any enemies capable of the crime. When those lines of inquiry stalled, officers turned their attention to issues in Molly and Adam's marriage. There were plenty of them. Investigators discovered that Molly and Adam's relationship deteriorated over time, and at the time of the crime, they had been sleeping separately for quite some time. Molly's diary was discovered, in which she described abuse from Adam. Witnesses interviewed reported rough treatment and abuse. They claim Adam was rude not only to Molly, but also to the children. Molly's mother, Susie Flankers, admitted to investigators that there were times when she was afraid they'd kill each other during an argument. Molly did not end her relationship with Adam, but would occasionally take her son and leave to go to her parents' house, returning a few days later until their next fight. It also turned out that the couple enjoyed hunting in the area surrounding their country house. Since everyone was armed, the investigators assumed that during another argument, one of the spouses grabbed a gun and shot, and when he realized what he had done, he committed suicide. However, there was an inconsistency. If the tragedy occurred as a result of a conflict between husband and wife, the instrument of crime must have been near the remains of one of them, which it was not. Investigators speculated that the weapon may have been damaged in the fire and did not appear as obvious as anticipated. Over the course of five days, the forensic team members took turns removing assets from the house. The search was conducted with surgical precision, but the results were not as expected. There were no weapons found in the house. By this time, the forensic examination data had arrived. The DNA found in the bodies belonged to Adam Buchanan, Molly McAfee, and their eight-year-old son. All three victims had suffered gunshot wounds prior to the fire and the angle of the bullet wounds ruled out the possibility that someone committed suicide. The lack of firearms indicated that there was another person in the house. A fourth person was found to have shot the Buchanans, and the investigation had to restart. Police had no choice but to turn to the deceased 16-year-old son. Nolan told officers that the family left in an old Dodge truck. According to the son, his father chose to use the company vehicle over his personal Ford, which was parked in the driveway because he had loaded the truck and trailer with rocks to decorate the area near his country cabin. Police discovered this truck near the burn structure. When asked why Nolan did not take a vacation with his relatives, as in the first interview, the young man stated that he was responsible for the house and garden while his father and stepmother were away. Nolan also stated that they had a neighbor growing forbidden grass on the Buchanan property, which caused his father to have frequent disagreements with his neighbor demanding that he stop planting the grass and threatening to call the police. When discussing the family business, Nolan stated that things were not going well. The company was downsizing and the number of employees was reduced to five. According to his father, the number of deaths associated with the business was rapidly increasing. So now the investigation had a wealth of useful information and the detectives had a suspect, a neighbor, which was especially important given that violent crime in that violent crime in that area was frequently associated with illegal herb cultivation. Detectives believed that the threat of going to the police could have resulted in the murder of Buchanan and his family. The problem was that no one knew which neighbor they were talking about. Investigators canvassed the neighborhood, interviewing all of the homeowners in succession. The tactic was successful. 
they discovered a man who confirmed the story of a fight with Adam over growing a forbidden crop. However, he stated that the conflict had been resolved following a heated discussion. The neighbor had an alibi, and another version proved to be untenable. What remained to be addressed was the financial crisis that had affected the family's business. On September 18, police officers went to Adam's company and interviewed the employees. Nolan's words were correct. The company was in a sorry state. It was threatened with bankruptcy because the debt exceeded $30,000. As a result, several employees were fired. It turned out that some of the former employees were extremely dissatisfied with the reduction and thus could have been involved in the crime. And that's where the investigators got lucky. Over the weekend, the local high school organized a community cleanup day with students clearing debris from a business park less than a mile from Adams Construction Company. It was present on September 19. A small purse containing a wallet and identification cards belonging to Molly McAfee and Adam Buchanan was discovered under one of the bushes. A .22 caliber rifle was lying nearby. Detectives rushed to the scene of the discovery. The county sheriff's office made a new assumption. The perpetrator used the found rifle to murder the Buchanan family and then stole their documents from the crime scene to cover his tracks. The discovery was significant because it indicated that someone had traveled all the way to Greenwood to murder the family and then returned to Bonita, dispose of the bag and murder weapon. It appeared to be a Bonita resident. The evidence found near the Buchanan construction site strengthened the theory that the boss was murdered by one of the disgruntled employees. Detectives placed the firearm in the bag of documents for examination and requested a warrant to search the company's records and premises. The investigators got lucky again. During the search, they gained access to a video surveillance camera located on the firm's premises. By happy coincidence, the camera's lens was pointed at the center of the parking lot rather than the company's territory. Following this discovery, the case was only days away from being solved. Because it was already known that the family had left town on Friday, investigators examined Friday's footage and were surprised to discover that Adam had attached a trailer loaded with rocks to a Ford F-150. It was not a Dodge truck, as Nolan had told them. Detectives discovered that the young man had deliberately manipulated the investigation. If the white Ford towed the rock trailer to the cabin, it must have been driven back and parked in the Buchanan family's driveway. Investigators interviewed Nolan to keep him safe while gathering as much information as possible. Nolan recounted his weekend, where he went, and who he saw. But this time, they asked him what movie they had seen at the cinema, how he had paid for his mall shopping, and how he had paid for dessert on a date. Nolan, who had no idea, responded with his father's credit card number. The officers then applied for a warrant to search Buchanan's Bonita home, vehicles, and financial records. The Ford automobile remained parked in the driveway. It was thoroughly inspected, and they discovered reddish soil stuck to the wheels. This is similar to what happens in Greenwood. If the Ford had been used for a trip last weekend or earlier, traces of soil might have remained, but they would not have been as visible. Unfortunately, the fire destroyed the wheel tread marks near the country house. However, the dirt buildup indicated that the car had most likely been in Greenwood recently. Detectives tracked the bank card payments and discovered that Adam Buchanan used his credit card on Friday, September 11. He stopped at Taco Bell on his way to Greenwood. Nolan, on the other hand, claimed he stayed at home, did not accompany his parents, and had the credit card in his possession. Detectives went to the diner to check the security cameras. They saw exactly what they were expecting. A white Ford instead of a truck. When detectives searched the Ford, they discovered a Taco Bell receipt dated September 11 that included not three, but four beverages. Four drink cups were also identified in evidence collected at the fire scene, so Nolan was inside the car. The next credit card transaction occurred on Saturday, September 12, at the Valencia Club Bar in Penryn, about 30 minutes from the cabin. Adam's parents had previously informed detectives about the bar. They stated that their son and daughter-in-law frequently visit after the cabin has been renovated. Security cameras recorded when the couple left the bar, and traffic cameras on the highway assisted in tracking the couple's route. On the day of the fire, a Ford F-150 drove toward the Buchanan cabin around 2.30 a.m., then reversed direction at 3.30 a.m. In the first instance, the camera captured Adam and Molly in the vehicle, while in the second, it only captured Nolan. Several hours later, on Sunday morning, September 13th, Adam's credit card was used to pay at three of Benitez's locations, Starbucks, McDonald's, and a gas station. 
the bank confirmed to investigators that you can only have one bank card, which contradicted Nolan's claims. By this time, the forensic results had been returned. Nolan's fingerprints were found on the gun. He was arrested while in the middle of a high school class. Nolan Buchanan has pleaded not guilty to the charges against him. He attempted to distort the story by claiming that his father shot the family, after which he pointed a rifle at him and, in self-defense, took away the weapon. After accidentally shooting his father, Nolan claimed it was self-defense, blaming the fire and subsequent lie on panic and extreme fear. That's why he used gasoline to set fire to the house, making it appear as if nothing had happened. The defense repeatedly focused the jury's attention on Adam's abuse of his own son and other family members. The medical examiner questioned the verdict because the bullet wound mark on a piece of Gavin's skull corresponded to a shot fired at nearly a 90 degree angle. Nolan, on the other hand, claimed that his and his brother's beds were next to each other and that the noise and screaming had woken them up simultaneously. Nolan claims to have seen someone enter the bedroom and shoot Gavin just as he awoke. The shooter then pointed the rifle at Nolan, who miraculously pushed the attacker away. Under this scenario, the shot would have been fired at about a 45-degree angle, which contradicted forensic findings. The prosecution concluded that Nolan shot his brother when they were alone in the house while their parents were at a bar. After waiting for his father and stepmother to return, Nolan shot them as well. According to where the bodies were discovered, Adam was killed first, followed by Molly Nolan, who took the rifle. His parents burned their papers, doused the bodies in gasoline, and set fire to the house. Then he went home, met his girlfriend, and spent the day with her, establishing an alibi for himself. On July 13, 2018, a jury convicted Nolan of three counts of first-degree murder. As a result, he was sentenced to 150 years in prison, with the option of parole after 25 years. Judge Kingsbury, the sentence announcement reflected on verbal and physical abuse. Nolan testified that he massacred his brother because he did not want him to experience the same horror or be forced to live with what his father had already done to him. However, as he did so, he also listed facts about the premeditation of the crime and subsequent arson, the creation of alibis, and Nolan's plans to run the family business, which he had discussed with family members. The judge cited Nolan's failure to follow rules and deviant behavior as observed by staff at the South Lake Tahoe Juvenile Treatment Center, where he went after being arrested, everyone has the ability to change. Judge Kingsbury told Nolan, I hope he will do everything in his power to do so, if you behave properly. According to the Senate bill and Supreme Court rulings, you will be eligible for parole after 25 years in prison. You decide whether or not to take that chance. Nolan continues to insist that he is innocent, if he is ever released on parole, he will be required to pay significant compensation to the victims. The payout amount is currently unknown. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. Where is the line that cannot be crossed again? How does an ordinary woman go from being a loving wife and mother to a cruel murderer capable of dividing a country into two opposing groups? And how did her name become a hot topic among locals and make newspaper headlines for years? Roxana Valdez could respond to this question. Murderers do not stand out in a crowd, are unrecognizable at dinner, and may even live under the same roof without revealing their true identity. They are indistinguishable from those who have never crossed the line. Thus. No one could have predicted what Roxana did on the spring evening of April 5, 2014. And when they found out, they couldn't believe it. But let us start at the beginning. Roxanne died, and little is known about her. Despite the efforts of numerous Chilean reporters who competed to tell her story, they were unable to find much information about her. Her criminal record provided little information beyond the fact that she was born in 1957 in a small village in Chile's Punta Arenas province. That was it. Perhaps the lack of information was due to journalistic ethics, as the locals, known for their fiery tempers and unique customs, may have retaliated against Roxana and his relatives for her crime, potentially turning their lives into a living hell. Valdez married a man whose name, for unknown reasons, is either unknown to the press or not disclosed. She had a son with him, but it's clear that her marriage was not the dream every girl hopes for, as the couple split up in 2011. As a single mother, 
in a small village with few jobs. Roxana faced significant challenges. In such communities, the primary occupation was growing and selling fruits and vegetables, and even local educational institutions emphasized agriculture. Roxana found work at the Don Gregorio boarding school, where students were trained to become agricultural technicians. She worked as a night supervisor at the school, ensuring that students slept and did not engage in disruptive activities. Her responsibilities did not include the actual care of the children. Roxana's son also attended this boarding school because she worked in the fields during the day and was unable to give him the attention he required. Claudio Munoz Ramirez, who worked at the same boarding school as Roxana, was the head of grounds maintenance. His duties often required him to work at night, which is how he met Roxana. Despite being 14 years younger than her, they had a lot to talk about. Roxana would spend entire nights discussing school issues and her own failed marriage to Claudio. They also shared similar experiences in their personal lives. Claudio had two daughters that he adored, but he felt disconnected from their mother and considered divorce several times. However, he stayed in the marriage because of a promise he made to her late father. Claudio appears to have forgotten his promise and began spending his free time with Roxana away from his family. Finally, he made a decisive move. He did not explain himself to his wife. Claudio gathered his belongings and left the house. He clearly went to Roxana, who gladly accepted him into her life. Their relationship developed quickly and effectively. Roxana invited a man she barely knew into her home, with whom she had only shared nighttime conversations. She seemed to overlook the fact that there were children nearby who required constant attention amid these enjoyable and heartfelt conversations. Roxana failed to notice his true personality. He was actually quite temperamental and sometimes even cruel. However, it was probably too early to say who was more cruel of the two. Claudio's first serious outburst of aggression occurred inside the boarding school. On a scheduled community cleanup day, students were given different areas to clean up. Brooms, buckets, dustpans, and rags were distributed to ensure a thorough cleaning. As is often the case, some students protested and refused to protest it and refused to participate. Claudio, who was in charge of cleanliness, but had no teaching experience, became enraged by these students and threatened to beat anyone who refused to participate in the absence of teachers at night. It is unclear whether he would have carried out this threat, but the students eventually began cleaning and later complained to the principal about Claudio's threats of physical violence. The principal was displeased and requested Claudio's voluntary resignation. It's worth noting that the Don Gregorio boarding school was practically the only place in the area that provided stable and reasonably paid employment. Claudio spent some time looking for work, fields and fruit, but it became clear that his efforts had been in vain. He and Roxana decided to seek a better life elsewhere, leaving her son at the boarding school to complete his education. They thought it was too risky to go on this adventure with him. To avoid relying on employers after being burned once, the couple decided to start their own small business, a fruit kiosk, and relocated to a favorable location, the commune of Molina, a few hours' drive from Chile's capital. This region is well known for its vineyards, which produce renowned wine brands that are exported around the world. Roxana and Claudio bought a kiosk near their new home, found suppliers for vegetables and fruits, and began their small family business. Claudio oversaw the purchase and transportation of products from suppliers to the kiosk. While Roxana was in charge of sales throughout the day, hiring an employee was not feasible due to the additional costs. Furthermore, they feared that an employee would fail to closely monitor the perishable goods, resulting in additional losses. Claudia was visibly upset and even angry when he learned that Roxana was expecting their first child together. Perhaps it was a moment for serious thought. But Roxana, perhaps blinded by her new relationship and their thriving business, did not oppose her husband's viewpoint. She agreed that once the child was born, they would quickly turn it over to her relatives for upbringing. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there was no child to give away. Cloudy's behavior has dramatically changed since then. He frequently yelled at his wife and occasionally resorted to physical violence. Neighbors from nearby houses, irritated by their noisy new neighbors, frequently called the Chilean police, the Carabineros, to intervene and settle domestic disputes. When the Carabineros arrived in response to a call, they saw Roxana in tears and nearly half-naked running out of the house, followed by Claudio, 
Roxana confessed to the officers that she had been the victim of systematic domestic violence, which had resulted in a miscarriage. She even required psychological assistance following the incident. However, as time passed, the grievances faded and the troubled couple resumed their normal lives together. Following the incident, Claudio should have faced criminal charges, but a compassionate Roxana decided to give him another chance after obtaining a promise that it would be a one-time occurrence. Claudio promised never to repeat such behavior. His previous actions with his ex-wife, however, suggested that his words may not be taken seriously. Unfortunately, history repeats itself. Claudio temporarily stopped physically abusing Roxana, but he developed the habit of leaving the house at night to binge drink in local bars. He spent a significant portion of their family budget not only on alcohol but also on local women of questionable character. Roxana tolerated her husband's behavior, believing that Claudio would calm down once they had a child together. In a sense, she was correct. After Roxana gave birth to a healthy child in 2013, Claudio stopped carousing and fully immersed himself in their business, which needed to expand. They purchased another kiosk in the surrounding area, as well as a vehicle for product transportation. Roxana also invested in firearms for protection because they lived and worked in dangerous areas. The family's wealth rose dramatically, but only on paper. Claudio reverted to his old ways, squandering money on drinking and committing domestic violence against Roxana. In her testimony, Roxanne described the escalating abuse in her relationship with Claudio. Claudia's drinking was infrequent at first, but it quickly became more frequent. He would return home and accuse Roxana of imagined infidelities, resulting in physical and sexual abuse. Despite her pregnancy, Claudia's actions appeared deliberate, culminating in a miscarriage in August 2012 that sent Roxana into a deep depression. Claudio went out to a local bar one night and did not return home until the following morning, as is his usual routine. Roxana was used to his behavior but still worried about him. Claudio had stolen 5 million Chilean pesos, approximately $6,000, from Roxana's sale of her mother's house to spend on alcohol and brothels. This betrayal shocked Roxana because the money was for their joint business and was hidden in their daughter's room. Claudio eventually returned home late that evening. Roxana confronted him over the missing money. Claudio, uninterested in discussing the matter, hit her and admitted to squandering all of the money. This was the final straw for Roxana. Without saying anything, she went into their bedroom, retrieved a revolver meant for protection against local criminals, and shot Claudio in the chest. He died instantly, stunned by her drastic action. Roxana, equally shocked by her own actions, attempted to stop the bleeding from the fatal gunshot wound, but it was too late. The close, range shot with a .38 caliber bullet was fatal. Roxanne's desperate act was a tragic culmination of ongoing domestic turmoil. Roxanne's testimony reveals her deep regret and awareness of the immorality of her actions. She admits that when she reached for the revolver, her intention was not to intimidate Claudio, but to kill him. She recalls Claudio abusing and assaulting her numerous times, as well as her failure to report him to authorities or retract her complaint due to fear. She dreaded being alone even before they had a child together. After shooting Claudio, Roxana's immediate concern was the potential impact on their daughter, particularly if Roxana was imprisoned and the child was placed in an institution. That night, Roxana determined that the best way to handle the situation was to dispose of the body and report Claudio missing. He was aware that the police knew about his frequent disappearances during drinking binges. Disposing of the body was a difficult task for Roxana, a delicate woman who decided to remove it piece by piece. She began by severing the limbs and head with kitchen knives designed for cutting meat. This process required five knives because they kept doubling. Then she boiled the dismembered parts in the largest pots she had, all while playing with her young daughter, who was completely unaware of her mother's actions and her father's fate. Roxanne's calculated approach to disposing of the body while maintaining a sense of normalcy for her daughter exemplifies the complexities and desperation of her situation. The day following cooking and cooling of the body parts, Roxana organized them into plastic containers by hand, leg, head, and torso. The containers were then placed in garbage bags. She loaded the bags into her car and drove to St. Lucia, where she scattered them on a vacant lot. Before leaving, she thoroughly cleaned her home with bleach. Despite finding a suitable location, she lacked the courage to dispose of the bags from her car once she arrived in St. Lucia. Roxana's testimony revealed her internal conflict. 
It's strange that I had the courage to commit such a heinous crime and dismember a human body like it was a piglet, but I couldn't bring myself to get rid of the evidence. I was nervous the entire drive, fearing that police would stop and search my car at any turn. This fear caused panic, despite the fact that I had a backup plan in place, which involved my daughter pretending to rush her to the hospital if she was stopped. I even considered pinching her to make her cry more loudly. Unable to discard the remains, Roxana returned home with them and hid the bags in the garage. She cleaned the interior of her car with bleach again and went to see Claudia's relatives, claiming that he had stolen a large sum of money and hadn't been home in days. They simply shrugged in response. She then went to see her mother and brother. Her mother was extremely concerned about Roxanne's behavior. She was not eating, had a glassy-eyed expression, and kept asking the same questions. The only question she promptly answered was about Claudio's absence, stating that he had gone to buy goods for their store, but was delayed due to a flat tire. Returning home, alone with her thoughts and the hidden evidence, Roxana broke down and called her brother for assistance. When he arrived, she confessed all and showed him the containers. Her brother was understandably shocked. Roxana called her brother to vent and share the nightmare years she had with Claudio, but most importantly, she needed his assistance in disposing of the containers containing the body. However, her brother refused, fearing police involvement and being charged as an accomplice. He urged her to confess to the Caribou Narrows, with Chilean police insisting he would do it if she refused. She was disappointed but realized she had no other option. Roxana complied. That night, Roxana went to the 4th police station and announced her intention to make a significant statement. Officers who knew her assumed she wanted to report her troublesome husband. However, they were taken aback by her confession. Roxana was immediately arrested. The news quickly spread throughout the area, attracting a large number of journalists to the station. They waited eagerly to photograph Roxana as she lay down, hoping to capture a few images, and if they were lucky, ask her some questions in front of the officers. As the journalists waited, Roxana was eventually brought out handcuffed and in distress, she stated, I'm afraid he'll kill me one day before being led into a police car. The case appeared straightforward. Roxana had confessed, provided evidence, and voluntarily surrendered. However, Prosecutor Monica Balesteros requested a more thorough investigation. She was skeptical of Roxanne's easy confession and requested an extended arrest to conduct a forensic examination. Balesteros wants to prove that Claudio was still alive during the dismemberment, which would significantly increase Roxana's sentence. The judge authorized a 60-day detention for further investigation. Meanwhile, Roxanne's attorney, Carolina Gutierrez, claimed that Roxana acted out of extreme emotional distress, which was likely exacerbated by postpartum depression and chronic domestic abuse. She highlighted Roxanne's cooperation and voluntary confession as mitigating factors. However, the prosecution's theory that Claudio was alive during dismemberment crumbled when forensic results revealed that Claudio died from a gunshot wound to the chest. The bullet from the .38 caliber revolver ruptured the heart and damaged vital organs, disproving the prosecution's initial hypothesis. Given the developments, the aggravating circumstances were dismissed. Another lawyer, Juan Pablo Cardenas, who sought to make a name for himself in this high-profile case, stated that the firearm used in the murder was legally registered. He also mentioned that Roxanne's first report of domestic violence to the police was filed only 20 days after the couple began living together. Following a medical examination, psychologist Rodrigo Valenzuela presented documents to the court indicating that Roxana was severely mentally unstable at the time of the crime. This meant she wasn't fully aware of her actions, and her emotional instability was linked to the deaths of two children one in August 2012, and the other only three weeks before the crime. Furthermore, a forensic examination requested by the prosecutor revealed that Claudio had a high blood alcohol level of 3 grams per liter at the time of his death on April 17, 2015. Following a year of various examinations, investigations, and evidence gathering, Roxanne's trial began. The media frequently sensationalizes tragedies and dubbed the case the Molina Cooks case, alluding to Roxanne's dismemberment and boiling of her former husband. Some unscrupulous journalists, seeking to draw attention to their publications, even made up stories that Roxana had eaten a portion of the remains, despite the fact that this was purely a product of their imaginations. 
Roxana refused to make any statements during the trial, citing her awareness of the media portrayal and her deep distress over it. The prosecutors attempted to persuade the judge that Roxana committed a serious crime under Chilean law and patricide standards. However, they were unable to prove that the murder was premeditated. The defense attorney argued that his client acted in self-defense, protecting herself from a brute who had brutally mistreated her for years. The court hearing lasted several weeks, and the entire Chilean population followed the case closely. Prosecutor Monica sought a 15-year prison sentence for the accused. However, after carefully listening to the defense and the jury's opinions, the judge sentenced Roxana to six years in a lenient correctional facility. Claudia's relatives, who had already protested when they heard the prosecutor's request for only 15 years, were utterly disappointed by the final court decision. They attempted to deny any family violence and claimed that Claudio, as a businessman and financially independent, could not have stolen $6,000 from Roxana. They also claimed that Claudio had admitted to them that Roxana frequently took out the revolver from the closet and told her husband that she would kill him someday. In an interview with the press, Claudio's sister attempted to blame Chile as a state, claiming that there is no justice and that the judicial system is completely corrupt. Given that such brutal criminals receive such short sentences, equivalent to minor robberies, even Gazelle Claudio, his first wife, defended her ex-husband, assuring everyone that there could not have been any violence on Claudio's part. She had lived with him for years, and he had never dared to touch her. Meanwhile, Roxana frequently instigates arguments out of jealousy and possessiveness. Regarding Roxanne's subsequent imprisonment, she served only two-thirds of her sentence in the colony before being transferred to a semi-open education center in Tulsa due to good behavior. Roxana was able to communicate with her daughter and was eventually released early. The press, of course, became interested in this case again, and the public was outraged that the cook from Molina was released so early. However, there were those who, while considering Roxana a murderer, justified her actions by viewing her as a victim in the overall situation. The case is still being debated in the country today. Overall, this story highlights the serious consequences that can occur if domestic violence is not addressed early on. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more. On a fateful November morning, a chilling and mysterious crime took place in the quiet suburbs. An apartment complex was on fire, and a 911 call would set off a terrifying chain of events. Today was a tragic day. Nobody suspected that this fire was anything more than an unfortunate accident. It concealed a sinister story of murder, betrayal, and meticulously planned cruelty. The tragic events of November 28, 2014, in Fort Worth, Texas, provide a chilling picture of a heinous crime. Ashley Ann Harris, a 31-year-old apartment complex resident, was the target of a brutal and deliberate attack. The sequence of events on that fateful day raised disturbing questions about the motivation behind this heinous act. The incident began with a 911 call from a concerned resident of the same apartment complex. They reported a fire in one of the units, which prompted emergency personnel to rush to the scene. They had no idea that this would escalate into a murder investigation. Ashley and Harris were the tenants of the apartment that caught fire. At first, no one could tell whether Ashley was inside the burning apartment or not. Firefighters bravely battled the blaze and eventually brought it under control. Only after the fire was extinguished did the horrifying truth become apparent. Ashley Harris had been inside her apartment the entire time, and her body led police to believe that the fire was not an accident. Ashley's lifeless body was covered in a pool of blood, indicating that she had been brutally beaten. Her hands and ankles were bound with duct tape, leaving her defenseless. The signs of violence did not end there. Her body was covered in burn marks, and she had gone through the agony of strangulation. To make matters even worse, there were knife wounds in the throat. As investigators dug deeper into the case, it became clear that this was no ordinary tragic accident or random act of violence. It was a meticulously planned and horrifically carried out murder. The evidence indicated that someone intentionally set fire to the apartment after committing this heinous crime. The perpetrator had poured rubbing alcohol throughout Ashley's apartment, including her bed, in an attempt to erase any evidence of their actions. The fire, however, had failed to conceal the gruesome truth. 
One perplexing aspect of this case was the apparent lack of any motivation. Ashley's keys were the only thing missing from her apartment, leaving investigators perplexed. What could motivate someone to commit such a heinous and merciless attack on an innocent woman? The investigation into Ashley and Harrison murders would undoubtedly be difficult and heartbreaking, as law enforcement sought answers, justice, and closure for her bereaved family members. The police went on a search for answers. Their journey started with interviews with Ashley's neighbors. Among them was Stephen Lee, a man who lived in the next apartment. He described a peculiar sighting at around 6.30 a.m. The fateful morning. While having a cigarette on his balcony, he noticed an unfamiliar car parked nearby. The vehicle in question was a sleek black Infiniti Gay 35, a rarity in their quiet neighborhood. This observation would prove to be a critical clue in the ongoing mystery. However, Stephen Lee's account was not the only piece of the puzzle. Another neighbor, Patrick Sweet, lived directly below Ashley's apartment. He made a chilling revelation to the police. At around 7.30 a.m., Patrick was startled out of his morning routine by a blood-curdling scream from above. Alarmed and disturbed, he heard a series of unsettling noises, including what appeared to be a heavy thud and frantic gasping breaths. Fear gripped him, but the blaring alarm of his carbon monoxide detector jolted him into action. He realized there was a fire going on, so he called 911 right away to solve the mystery surrounding Ashley's death. The police meticulously tracked her movements on the day in question. Ashley worked as an assistant manager at an American Eagle store inside the Hulan Mall. Their investigation revealed that on Thanksgiving Day, she dined with her close friend Alexis Torres and a group of acquaintances in one of their complex's apartments. Ashley left for work after finishing his meal. The Black Friday sales frenzy made for a long and demanding night. During Ashley's work shift, Alexis graciously took on the responsibility of caring for his beloved dog, Nala Ashley. Ashley returned home in the early hours of the morning. Around 3.15 a.m., Alexis paid a brief visit before leaving after 4 a.m. It was at this point that the timeline became crucial to the investigation. Ashley's untimely death was believed to have occurred between 4.15 a.m. and 7.30 a.m. Given the urgency of the situation, authorities were eager to find and speak with the owner of the mysterious Black Infinity D35. I hope to shed light on what occurred during those fateful hours. The search for answers had only just begun, and the peace of the small towns was at stake. When the police learned about the Black Infinity Gutty 35, they decided to question Alexis Ashley's friend, who claimed she didn't know who owned the vehicle. However, a tip from Ashley's boss, Christopher Chris Gravy, piqued their curiosity. He told the cops he knew someone who drove such a car, a woman named Carter Carol Carol Cervantes. Carter had previously worked at the same American Eagle store as Ashley, but was let go in August. With this lead in hand, the police began surveillance on Carter's home, their patients paid off the following Saturday at 8 a.m. When they saw Carter leave her apartment and get into her Infinite 35, accompanied by a man. The man then drove her to Hewlin Mall, where he dropped her off at the entrance before parking. The police approached him for questioning and discovered that he was Clarence David Mallory Carter's boyfriend and a former employee of the same American Eagle store. Clarence was arrested after failing to produce his driver's license upon request. Officers at the police station noticed unusual details about him. He was wearing a brand new ski mask with no visible wear, and the plastic price tag fastener was still attached. Furthermore, there appeared to be a recent injury to his lower lip, which was visibly swollen. Despite their arrest, Clarence and Carter were not found inside the mall. Despite being seen entering, she was later located at her apartment complex, where she appeared to be doing laundry. Taken in for questioning, she initially claimed not to have left the apartment complex that day. Surveillance footage, however, contradicted her statement by clearly showing her leaving the mall and heading home. The police suspected that she had seen them talking to Clarence in the mall parking lot and then decided to walk the two miles home. Notably, they found superficial scratches on her arms. As the pieces of this puzzling story fell into place, the police faced the daunting task of determining whether Carter and Clarence were involved in Ashley's tragic death. And if so, determining the motive for the tragic events that had occurred, the ongoing investigation into Ashley's tragic death took a chilling turn as new evidence surfaced, painting a disturbing picture of the events leading up to the crime. The discovery of Ashley's missing keys 
was a watershed moment in the investigation as it was revealed that these keys also provided access to the American Eagle store where she worked. This revelation led the police to believe that Carter and Clarence had planned to kill Ashley because they knew her keys could open the store's safe. Their sinister plan appeared to involve stealing tens or thousands of dollars, most likely from Black Friday sales. On a fateful Saturday morning, they carried out their plan with Ashley's keys. However, when they arrived at the store, they discovered an unexpected obstacle. The locks had already been changed. The wording of the robbery attempt, as well as the search of Carter and Clarence's apartment, turned up additional incriminating evidence. They discovered a plastic tub filled with bungee cords and a rope. A kitchen drawer contained a lock, a TAS airbox, and discarded duct tape strands. They also discovered a damaged deadbolt lock on other locks, which appeared to have been used for practice. Each is labeled as a lock-picking practice lock with the Black Infinity D35. A vehicle central to the investigation also harbored sinister secrets. Inside the car, police discovered a plastic bag hidden within a black trash bag, as well as a sharpening stone, most likely used for a knife, a 9mm cartridge, a cell phone, a walkie, talkie, and a buck knife with a sheath. Notably, they discovered a toboggan with a hole cut in it, an unopened tarp, and a kitchen knife. Perhaps most concerning was the discovery of a loaded Glock 19 with a bullet in the chamber concealed beneath the driver's seat. These compelling pieces of evidence painted a troubling picture of Carter and Clarence's roles in Ashley's murder. Both individuals were charged with capital murder, and the state chose not to pursue the death penalty, instead seeking life imprisonment without the possibility of parole for both defendants. Despite the overwhelming evidence against them, Carter and Clarence maintained their pleas of not guilty, setting the stage for a tense legal battle that would determine their fate. The legal proceedings in the cases of Carter Cervantes and David Mallory were conducted separately, but the prosecution presented a largely consistent narrative for each defendant. However, since Carter's case was heard first, the emphasis was on establishing her as the alleged mastermind behind the crime. In the eyes of the prosecution, Carter and Clarence had multiple reasons for wanting to harm Ashley. For starters, they assumed the pair wanted Ashley's keys, which would grant them access to the store safe and the large sum of money they assumed was inside, especially after the lucrative Black Friday sales. Furthermore, the prosecution claimed that Carter and Clarence sought vengeance on Ashley. They blamed her for their job terminations, adding to the personal animosity in the situation. The court proceedings delved into the backgrounds of the parties involved. In June 2014, Ashley had been appointed to manage the store temporarily while Chris was on medical leave. Her supervisor, Carter, and the store's assistant manager had all played important roles in the operation. Significantly, she had also hired her boyfriend to work with her at the same establishment. On August 24, 2014, a sum of $18,000 mysteriously vanished from the safe at the American Eagle store. Carter became suspicious when Ashley, who was in charge of locking up the store that night, discovered that the back door had been left unlocked. Clarence was identified as the person who accessed the safe and stole the money, according to surveillance footage. This discovery sparked a series of events that would eventually lead to a tragic outcome. Chris Ashley's supervisor found out after the theft that Carter had hired Clarence. Surprisingly, Clarence had previous experience with the American Eagle brand, having worked at an Amarillo location. However, his record in the American Eagle system was marked as non-rehirable, indicating that he should not be employed at any of the brand's locations. Chris made a startling discovery. Carter had manipulated the clearance personnel file by changing his social security number and name in the system to avoid detection and red flags. This revelation indicated a disturbing level of collusion between Carter and Clarence. As tensions rose, it became clear that Carter and Clarence had planned to kidnap Ashley and take her keys. Their cell phones held incriminating evidence, including photos of Ashley's apartment, apartment door, and vehicle. Furthermore, police found latitude and longitude coordinates on their cell phones. Detective Sedillo's testimony added to the chilling story. He revealed that one of the clearance text messages contained coordinates that, when entered into Google Earth, led to a location near Looters, Texas. Detective Sedillo made a chilling discovery at this location a six-foot-long, two-and-a-half-foot-wide, three-foot-deep hole. The prosecution claimed that the initial plan was to kidnap Ashley, threaten her with a pistol, and then kill her in a different location. 
However, their intentions changed when Ashley refused to allow them into her apartment, resulting in her tragic death on the premises. More unsettling evidence emerged. When police searched clearances in Cadillac, they discovered two shovels, a box of plastic sheeting, and a box of craftsman sockets, indicating a sinister and premeditated intent. These revelations painted a disturbing picture of a well-planned crime, with Carter and Clarence allegedly motivated by both financial gain and vengeance. The prosecution called witnesses to shed more light on the tragic events leading up to Ashley's death. One such witness was Jeff Kaiser, Ashley is close neighbor and friend. Jeff described the terrifying morning when he was jolted awake by the blaring sound of fire alarms. When he realized Ashley's apartment was in danger and saw her car still parked outside, he sprang into action. He rushed upstairs without hesitation and bravely kicked down Ashley's apartment door. When Jeff entered, he was met with a scene of chaos. The apartment was filled with smoke and water poured from the sprinkler system, creating a dangerous and disorienting environment. Despite the perilous conditions, Jeff attempted to crawl toward the kitchen to reach Ashley. However, the thick smoke quickly overwhelmed him, forcing him to retreat for some fresh air. Undeterred, he made two more valiant attempts, but the smoke was too dense to navigate. Fortunately, firefighters had arrived on the scene to take over the rescue efforts, and an arson investigator provided crucial information about the cause of the fire. He testified that he identified several points of origin for the fire, including the bed, Ashley's body, and the closet. A particularly disturbing discovery was that the smoke detector had been purposefully removed and was hidden beneath the mattress. These findings suggested a sinister and deliberate act aimed at concealing the fire and complicating Ashley's chances of survival. The courtroom drama continues with a string of compelling events and testimonies. The prosecution presented surveillance footage from the front of the American Eagle store which showed a mysterious figure attempting to manipulate the gate lock around 2 a.m. On November 29, the person's face was concealed, but the prosecution claimed it was Carter. It was clear they were attempting to unlock and raise the gate, but their efforts were futile because the locks had been changed. This suggested that Carter's intentions were related to the store or the crime. The court heard that Carter and Clarence returned to the mall at 8 a.m. On the same day, they were unknowingly under police surveillance, this raised questions about their actions and intentions, especially given their previous unsuccessful attempt to enter the store. Clarence was arrested in the mall's parking lot and during his interaction with police. He claimed Carter had entered the mall to get some documents. However, when the police searched the mall, Carter was nowhere to be found. She was eventually found at her apartment complex, raising questions about her whereabouts and movements. Dr. Richard Fries, a deputy medical examiner with the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office provided crucial information about Ashley's injuries. The autopsy revealed a harrowing picture of her physical injuries. Ashley suffered numerous injuries, including lacerations to her scalp, cheeks, and the left side of her face. Her right side was marked by a patterned bruise, and there were other bruises between her eyes and around her left eye. She had scrapes and laceration marks on her lip, as well as a chin scrape, Perhaps most disturbingly, there was a star-shaped laceration with a bruise behind her left ear, which the medical examiner determined was caused by a pistol blow. The testimony painted a bleak picture of Ashley's ordeal, implying that she had been brutally beaten. Ashley sustained several injuries, including a knife wound to her neck, as well as bruises and abrasions on her neck, chest, and right arm. Dr. Fries, a witness in the case, testified that Ashley's facial injuries were caused by multiple blows. He also mentioned the presence of Paddock A and Ashley as eyes, implying asphyxia or strangulation. He concluded that Ashley died from asphyxiation and blunt force trauma to the head and neck, ruling her death a homicide. The courtroom drama surrounding Carter's trial was both captivating and heartbreaking. Her defense strategy was based on the claim that she had no role in Ashley's tragic death. In a courageous move, she took the stand to testify in her own defense revealing the layers of fear and manipulation that had shrouded her life. Carter's testimony painted a disturbing picture of her relationship with Clarence, describing him as controlling and menacing. She revealed that he had chilling control over her daily life, even dictating when she could eat and drink. The courtroom hung on her every word as she admitted to attempting to rob the American Eagle store, but she insisted that the crime was coerced by clearances and menacing threats. She described a terrifying moment in which he brandished a gun and ordered her to commit the theft.
to add to her anguish. He claimed that there was a lurking danger outside her parents' house, threatening their lives if she refused to steal the money. Carter's story became darker when she described a horrific incident in which she claimed to have been raped by two unknown men. Clarence, she claimed, allowed these assailants into her apartment and she was subjected to unspeakable brutality. Carter maintained her innocence on the night Ashley was murdered. She testified that she was in her bed, sound asleep, and had no knowledge of Clarence's whereabouts at the time. She vehemently denied any involvement in Ashley's death and insisted that she had no role in the tragic event. Despite Carter's compelling testimony, the jury remained skeptical in a remarkably swift decision. They arrived at a guilty verdict after only two hours. Carter was sentenced to life without parole. The case did not end there. Clarence will appear in court, maintaining his innocence in Ashley's murder. His claims, however, were met with similar silence. The jury, clearly unconvinced by his claims, found him guilty as charged. Like Carter, he was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Share your opinion with us in the comments and subscribe to the channel for more.